He is a perfect man, and he hath faith in God, he will not perish. Jacob pursued by Eliphaz and Esau. When Jacob went away to go to Haran, Esau called his son Eliphaz, and secretly spoke unto him, saying, Now hasten, take thy sword in thy hand and pursue Jacob, and pass before him in the road, and lurk for him and slay him with thy sword in one of the mountains, and take all belonging unto him, and come back. And Eliphaz was dexterous and expert with the bow, as his father had taught him, and he was a noted hunter in the field and a valiant man. And Eliphaz did as his father had commanded him. And Eliphaz was at that time thirteen years old, and he arose and went and took ten of his mother's brothers with him, and pursued Jacob. And he followed Jacob closely, and when he overtook him, he lay in ambush for him on the borders of the land of Canaan, opposite to the city of Shechem. And Jacob saw Eliphaz and his men pursuing after him, and Jacob stood in the place in which he was going in order to know what it was, for he did not understand their purpose. Eliphaz drew his sword and went on advancing, he and his men, toward Jacob, and Jacob said unto them, Wherefore have you come hither, and why do you pursue with your swords? Eliphaz came near to Jacob, and answered as follows, Thus did my father command me, and now therefore I will not deviate from the orders which my father gave me. And when Jacob saw that Esau had impressed his command urgently upon Eliphaz, he approached and supplicated Eliphaz and his men, saying, Behold, all that I have, and that which my father and mother gave unto me, that take unto thee and go from me, and do not slay me, and may this thing that thou wilt do with me be accounted unto thee as righteousness. And the Lord caused Jacob to find favor in the sight of Eliphaz and his men, and they hearkened to the voice of Jacob, and they did not put him to death, but took all his belongings, together with the silver and gold that he had brought with him from Beersheba. They left him nothing. When Eliphaz and his men returned to Esau, and told him all that had happened to them with Jacob, he was wroth with his son Eliphaz and with his men, because they had not put Jacob to death. And they answered, and said unto Esau, Because Jacob supplicated us in this matter, not to slay him, our pity was moved toward him, and we took all belonging to him, and we came back. Esau then took all the silver and gold which Eliphaz had taken from Jacob, and he put them by in his house. Nevertheless Esau did not give up the hope of intercepting Jacob on his flight and slaying him. He pursued him, and with his men occupied the road along which he had to journey to Haran. There a great miracle happened to Jacob. When he observed what Esau's intention was, he turned off toward the Jordan River, and, with eyes directed to God, he cleft the waters with his wanderer's staff, and succeeded in crossing to the other side. But Esau was not to be deterred. He kept up the pursuit, and reached the hot springs at Bars before his brother, who had to pass by there. Jacob, not knowing that Esau was on the watch for him, decided to bathe in the spring, saying, I have neither bread nor other things needful, so I will at least warm my body in the waters of the well. While he was in the bath, Esau occupied every exit, and Jacob would surely have perished in the hot water, if the Lord had not caused a miracle to come to pass. A new opening formed of itself, and through it Jacob escaped. Thus were fulfilled the words, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt, for Jacob was saved from the waters of the Jordan and from the fire of the hot spring. At the same time with Jacob, a rider, leaving his horse and his clothes on the shore, had stepped into the river to cool off, but he was overwhelmed by the waves, and he met his death. Jacob put on the dead man's clothes, mounted his horse, and went off. It was a lucky chance, for Eliphaz had stripped him of everything, even his clothes, and the miracle of the river had happened only that he might not be forced to appear naked among men. Though Jacob was robbed of all his possessions, his courage did not fail him. He said, Should I lose hope in my Creator? I set my eyes upon the merits of my fathers. For the sake of them the Lord will give me his aid. And God said, Jacob, thou puttest thy trust in the merits of thy fathers, therefore I will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Yea, still more. While a keeper watcheth only by day as a rule, and sleepeth by night, I will guard thee day and night, for, behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord will keep thee from all evil, from Esau as well as Laban. He will keep thy soul, that the angel of death do thee no hurt. He will keep thy going out and thy coming in, he will support thee now thou art leaving Canaan, and when thou returnest to Canaan. Jacob was reluctant to leave the Holy Land before he received direct permission from God. My parents, he reflected, bade me go forth and sojourn outside of the land, but who knows whether it be the will of God that I do as they say, and beget children outside of the Holy Land. Accordingly, he betook himself to Beersheba. There, where the Lord had given permission to Isaac to depart from Canaan and go to Philistia, he would learn the will of the Lord concerning himself. He did not follow the example of his father and grandfather and take refuge with Abimelech, because he feared the king might force also him into a covenant, and make it impossible for his descendants of many generations to take possession of the Philistine land. Nor could he stay at home, because of his fear that Esau might wrest the birthright and the blessing from him, and to that he would not and could not agree. He was as little disposed to take up the combat with Esau, for he knew the truth of the maxim. He who courts danger will be overcome by it. He who avoids danger will overcome it. Both Abraham and Isaac had lived according to this rule. His grandfather had fled from Nimrod, and his father had gone away from the Philistines. Joseph. The favorite son. Jacob was not exempt from the lot that falls to the share of all the pious. Whenever they expect to enjoy life in tranquility, Satan hinders them. He appears before God and says, Is it not enough that the future world is set apart for the pious? What right have they to enjoy this world, besides? After the many hardships and conflicts that had beset the path of Jacob, he thought he would be at rest at last, and then came the loss of Joseph and inflicted the keenest suffering. Verily, few and evil had been the days of the years of Jacob's pilgrimage, for the time spent outside of the Holy Land had seemed joyless to him. Only the portion of his life passed in the land of his fathers, during which he was occupied with making proselytes, in accordance with the example set him by Abraham and Isaac, did he consider worthwhile having lived, and this happy time was of short duration when Joseph was snatched away, but eight years had elapsed since his return to his father's house. And yet it was only for the sake of Joseph that Jacob had been willing to undergo all the troubles and the adversity connected with his sojourn in the house of Laban. Indeed, Jacob's blessing in having his quiver full of children was due to the merits of Joseph, and likewise the dividing of the Red Sea and of the Jordan for the Israelites was the reward for his son's piety. For among the sons of Jacob Joseph was the one that resembled his father most closely in appearance, and, also, he was the one to whom Jacob transmitted the instruction and knowledge he had received from his teachers Shem and Eber the whole course of the son's life is but a repetition of the father's. As the mother of Jacob remained childless for a long time after her marriage, so also the mother of Joseph. As Rebekah had undergone severe suffering in giving birth to Jacob, so Rachel in giving birth to Joseph. As Jacob's mother bore two sons, so also Joseph's mother. Like Jacob, Joseph was born circumcised. As the father was a shepherd, so the son. As the father served for the sake of a woman, so the son served under a woman. Like the father, the son appropriated his older brother's birthright. The father was hated by his brother, and the son was hated by his brethren. The father was the favorite son as compared with his brother, so was the son as compared with his brethren. Both the father and the son lived in the land of the stranger. The father became a servant to a master, also the son. The master whom the father served was blessed by God, so was the master whom the son served. The father and the son were both accompanied by angels, and both married their wives outside of the Holy Land. The father and the son were both blessed with wealth. Great things were announced to the father in a dream, so also to the son. As the father went to Egypt and put an end to famine, so the son. As the father exacted the promise from his sons to bury him in the Holy Land, so also the son. The father died in Egypt, there died also the son. The body of the father was embalmed, also the body of the son. As the father's remains were carried to the holy land for interment, so also the remains of the son. 
Jacob the father provided for the sustenance of his son Joseph during a period of 17 years, so Joseph the son provided for his father Jacob during a period of 17 years. Until he was 17 years old, Joseph frequented the Bet HaMidrash, and he became so learned that he could impart to his brethren the Halakot he had heard from his father, and in this way he may be regarded as their teacher. He did not stop at formal instruction, he also tried to give them good counsel, and he became the favorite of the sons of the handmaids, who would kiss and embrace him. In spite of his scholarship there was something boyish about Joseph. He painted his eyes, dressed his hair carefully, and walked with a mincing step. These foibles of youth were not so deplorable as his habit of bringing evil reports of his brethren to his father. He accused them of treating the beasts under their care with cruelty, he said that they ate flesh torn from a living animal, and he charged them with casting their eyes upon the daughters of the Canaanites, and giving contemptuous treatment to the sons of the handmaids Bilhah and Zilpah, whom they called slaves. For these groundless accusations Joseph had to pay dearly. He was himself sold as a slave, because he had charged his brethren with having called the sons of the handmaids slaves, and Potiphar's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, because he threw the suspicion upon his brethren that they had cast their eyes upon the Canaanitish women. And how little it was true that they were guilty of cruelty to animals, appears from the fact that at the very time when they were contemplating their crime against Joseph, they yet observed all the rules and prescriptions of the ritual in slaughtering the kid of the goats with the blood of which they besmeared his coat of many colors. Joseph hated by his brethren. Joseph's talibearing against his brethren made them hate him. Among all of them Gad was particularly wrathful, and for good reason. Gad was a very brave man, and when a beast of prey attacked the herd, over which he kept guard at night, he would seize it by one of its legs and whirl it around until it was stunned, and then he would fling it away to a distance of two stadia, and kill it thus. Once Jacob sent Joseph to tend the flock, but he remained away only thirty days, for he was a delicate lad and fell sick with the heat, and he hastened back to his father. On his return he told Jacob that the sons of the handmaids were in the habit of slaughtering the choice cattle of the herd and eating it, without obtaining permission from Judah and Reuben. But his report was not accurate. What he had seen was Gad slaughtering one lamb, which he had snatched from the very jaws of a bear, and he killed it because it could not be kept alive after its fright. Joseph's account sounded as though the sons of the handmaids were habitually inconsiderate and careless in wasting their father's substance. To the resentment of the brethren was added their envy of Joseph, because their father loved him more than all of them. Joseph's beauty of person was equal to that of his mother Rachel and Jacob had but to look at him to be consoled for the death of his beloved wife. Reason enough for distinguishing him among his children. As a token of his great love for him, Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors, so light and delicate that it could be crushed and concealed in the closed palm of one hand. The Hebrew name of the garment, Passim, conveys the story of the sale of Joseph. The first letter, P.E., stands for Potiphar, his Egyptian master. Sam extends for Sahram, the merchantman that bought Joseph from the company of Ishmaelites to whom his brethren had sold him. Yod stands for these same Ishmaelites. And Mem, for the Midianites that obtained him from the merchantman, and then disposed of him to Potiphar. But Passim has yet another meaning, clefts. His brethren knew that the Red Sea would be cleft in twain in days to come for Joseph's sake, and they were jealous of the glory to be conferred upon him. Although they were filled with hatred of him, it must be said in their favor that they were not of a sullen, spiteful nature. They did not hide their feelings, they proclaimed their enmity openly. Once Joseph dreamed a dream, and he could not refrain from telling it to his brethren. He spoke, and said, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. Behold, you gathered fruit, and so did I. Your fruit rotted, but mine remained sound. Your seed will set up dumb images of idols, but they will vanish at the appearance of my descendant, the Messiah of Joseph. You will keep the truth as to my fate from the knowledge of my father, but I will stand fast as a reward for the self-denial of my mother, and you will prostrate yourselves five times before me. The brethren refused at first to listen to the dream, but when Joseph urged them again and again, they gave heed to him, and they said, 
Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? God put an interpretation into their mouths that was to be verified in the posterity of Joseph. Jeroboam and Jehu, two kings, and Joshua and Gideon, two judges, had been among his descendants, corresponding to the double and emphatic expressions used by his brethren in interpreting the dream. Then Joseph dreamed another dream, how the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed down before him, and Jacob, to whom he told at first, was rejoiced over it, for he understood its meaning properly. He knew that he himself was designated by the sun, the name by which God had called him when he lodged overnight on the holy site of the temple. He had heard God say to the angels at that time, The sun has come. The moon stood for Joseph's mother, and the stars for his brethren, for the righteous are as the stars. Jacob was so convinced of the truth of the dream that he was encouraged to believe that he would live to see the resurrection of the dead, for Rachel was dead, and her return to earth was clearly indicated by the dream. He went astray there, for not Joseph's own mother was referred to, but his foster mother Bilhah who had raised him. Jacob wrote the dream in a book, recording all the circumstances, the day, the hour, and the place, for the Holy Spirit cautioned him, Take heed, these things will surely come to pass. But when Joseph repeated his dream to his brethren, in the presence of his father, Jacob rebuked him, saying, I am thy brethren, that has some sense, but I am thy mother, that is inconceivable, for thy mother is dead. These words of Jacob called forth a reproof from God. He said, Thus thy descendants will in time to come seek to enter Jeremiah in delivering his prophecies. Jacob may be excused, he had spoken in this way only in order to avert the envy and hate of his brethren from Joseph, but they envied and hated him because they knew that the interpretation put upon the dream by Jacob would be realized. Joseph cast into the pit. Once the brethren of Joseph led their father's flocks to the pastures of Shechem, and they intended to take their ease and pleasure there they stayed away a long time, and no tidings of them were heard. Jacob began to be anxious about the fate of his sons. He feared that a war had broken out between them and the people of Shechem, and he resolved to send Joseph to them and have him bring word again, whether it was well with his brethren. Jacob desired to know also about the flocks for it is a duty to concern oneself about the welfare of anything from which one derives profit. Though he knew that the hatred of his brethren might bring on unpleasant adventures, yet Joseph, in filial reverence, declared himself ready to go on his father's errand. Later, whenever Jacob remembered his dear son's willing spirit, the recollection stabbed him to the heart. He would say to himself, Thou didst know the hatred of thy brethren, and yet thou didst say, Here am I. Jacob dismissed Joseph, with the injunction that he journey only by daylight, saying furthermore, Go now, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flock, and send me word and unconscious prophecy. He did not say that he expected to see Joseph again, but only to have word from him. Since the covenant of the pieces, God had resolved, on account of Abraham's doubting question, that Jacob and his family should go down into Egypt to dwell there. The preference shown to Joseph by his father, and the envy it aroused, leading finally to the sale of Joseph and his establishment in Egypt, were but disguised means created by God, instead of executing his counsel directly by carrying Jacob down into Egypt as a captive. Joseph reached Shechem, where he expected to find his brethren. Shechem was always a place of ill omen for Jacob and his seed, their Dinah was dishonored. There the ten tribes of Israel rebelled against the house of David while Rehoboam ruled in Jerusalem, and there Jeroboam was installed as king. Not finding his brethren in the herd in Shechem, Joseph continued his journey in the direction of the next posturing place, not far from Shechem, but he lost his way in the wilderness. Gabriel in human shape appeared before him, and asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he answered, I seek my brethren. Whereto the angel replied, Thy brethren have given up the divine qualities of love and mercy. Through a prophetic revelation they learned that the Hivites were preparing to make war upon them, and therefore they departed hence to go to Dothan. And they had to leave this place for other reasons, too. I heard, while I was still standing behind the curtain that veils the divine throne, that this day the Egyptian bondage would begin, 
and thou wouldst be the first to be subjected to it. Then Gabriel led Joseph to Dothan. When his brethren saw him afar off, they conspired against him, to slay him. Their first plan was to set dogs on him. Simon then spoke to Levi, Behold, the master of dreams cometh with a new dream, he whose descendant Jeroboam will introduce the worship of Baal. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, that we may see what will become of his dreams. But God spoke, Ye say, We shall see what will become of his dreams, and I say likewise, We shall see, and the future shall show whose word will stand, yours or mine. Simon and Gaz set about slaying Joseph, and he fell upon his face, and entreated them, Have mercy with me, my brethren, have pity on the heart of my father Jacob. Lay not your hands upon me, to spill innocent blood, for I have done no evil unto you. But if I have done evil unto you, then chastise me with a chastisement, but your hands lay not upon me, for the sake of our father Jacob. These words touched Zebulun, and he began to lament and weep. And the wailing of Joseph rose up together with his brothers, and when Simon and Gad raised their hands against him to execute their evil design, Joseph took refuge behind Zebulun, and supplicated his other brethren to have mercy upon him. Then Reuben rose, and he said, Brethren, let us not slay him, but let us cast him into one of the dry pits, which our fathers dug without finding water. That was due to the providence of God. He had hindered the water from rising in them in order that Joseph's rescue might be accomplished, and the pits remained dry until Joseph was safe in the hands of the Ishmaelites. Reuben had several reasons for interceding on behalf of Joseph. He knew that he as the oldest of the brethren would be held responsible by their father, if any evil befell him. Besides, Reuben was grateful to Joseph for having reckoned him among the eleven sons of Jacob and narrating his dream of the sun, moon, and stars. Since his disrespectful bearing toward Jacob, he had not thought himself worthy of being considered one of his sons. First Reuben tried to restrain his brethren from their purpose, and he addressed them in words full of love and compassion. But when he saw that neither words nor entreaties would change their intention, he begged them, saying, My brethren, at least hearken unto me in respect of this, that ye be not so wicked and cruel as to slay him. Lay no hand upon your brother shed no blood, cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and let him perish thus. Then Reuben went away from his brethren, and he hid in the mountains, so that he might be able to hasten back in a favorable moment and draw Joseph forth from the pit and restore him to his father. He hoped his reward would be pardoned for the transgression he had committed against Jacob. His good intention was frustrated, yet Reuben was rewarded by God, for God gives a recompense not only for good deeds, but for good intentions as well. As he was the first of the brethren of Joseph to make an attempt to save him, so the city of Bezer in the tribe of Reuben was the first of the cities of refuge appointed to safeguard the life of the innocent that seek help. Furthermore God spake to Reuben, saying, As thou wast the first to endeavor to restore a child unto his father, so Hosea, one of thy descendants, shall be the first to endeavor to lead Israel back to his heavenly father. The brethren accepted Reuben's proposition, and Simon seized Joseph, and cast him into a pit swarming with snakes and scorpions, beside which was another unused pit, filled with offal. As though this were not enough torture, Simon bade his brethren fling great stones at Joseph. In his later dealings with his brother Simon, Joseph showed all the forgiving charitableness of his nature. When Simon was held in durance in Egypt as a hostage, Joseph, so far from bearing him a grudge, ordered crammed poultry to be set before him at all his meals. Not satisfied with exposing Joseph to the snakes and scorpions, his brethren had stripped him bare before they flung him into the pit. They took off his coat of many colors, his upper garment, his breeches, and his shirt. However, the reptiles could do him no harm. God heard his cry of distress, and kept them in hiding in the clefts and the holes and they could not come near him. From the depths of the pit Joseph appealed to his brethren, saying, O my brethren, what have I done unto you, and what is my transgression? Why are you not afraid before God on account of your treatment of me? Am I not flesh of your flesh, and bone of your bone? Jacob your father, is he not also my father? Why do you act thus toward me? 
and how will you be able to lift up your countenance before Jacob? O Judah, Reuben, Simon, Levi, my brethren, deliver me, I pray you, from the dark place into which you have cast me. Though I committed a trespass against you, yet are ye children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were compassionate with the orphan, gave food to the hungry, and clothed the naked. How, then, can ye withhold your pity from your own brother, your own flesh and bone? And though I sin against you, yet you will hearken unto my petition for the sake of my father. Oh that my father knew what my brethren are doing unto me, and what they spake unto me. To avoid hearing Joseph's weeping and cries of distress, his brethren passed on from the pit, and stood at a bowshot's distance. The only one among them that manifested pity was Zebulun. For two days and two nights no food passed his lips on account of his grief over the fate of Joseph, who had to spend three days and three nights in the pit before he was sold. During this period Zebulun was charged by his brethren to keep watch at the pit. He was chosen to stand guard because he took no part in the meals. Part of the time Judah also refrained from eating with the rest, and took turns at watching, because he feared Simon and Gad might jump down into the pit and put an end to Joseph's life. While Joseph was languishing thus, his brethren determined to kill him. They would finish their meal first, they said, and then they would fetch him forth and slay him. When they had done eating, they attempted to say grace, but Judah remonstrated with them, We are about to take the life of a human being, and yet would bless God? That is not a blessing, that is contemning the Lord. What profit is it if we slay our brother? Rather will the punishment of God descend upon us. I have good counsel to give you. Yonder passeth by a traveling company of Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. The Ishmaelites will take him with them upon their journeyings, and he will be lost among the peoples of the earth. Let us follow the custom of former days, for Canaan, too, the son of Ham, was made a slave for his evil deeds, and so will we do with our brother Joseph. The sale. While the brethren of Joseph were deliberating upon his fate, seven Midianitish merchantmen passed near the pit in which he lay. They noticed that many birds were circling above it, whence they assumed that there must be water therein, and, being thirsty, they made a halt in order to refresh themselves. When they came close, they heard Joseph screaming and wailing, and they looked down into the pit and saw a youth of beautiful figure and comely appearance. They called to him, saying, who art thou? Who brought thee hither, and who cast thee into this pit in the wilderness? They all joined together and dragged him up, and took him along with them when they continued on their journey. They had to pass his brethren, who called out to the Midianites, Why have you done such a thing, to steal our slave and carry him away with you? We threw the lad into the pit, because he was disobedient. Now, then, return our slave to us. The Midianites replied, what, this lad, you say, is your slave, your servant? More likely is it that you all are slaves unto him, for in beauty of form, in pleasant looks, and fair appearance, he excelleth you all. Why, then, will you speak lies unto us? We will not give ear unto your words, nor believe you, for we found the lad in the wilderness, in a pit, and we took him out, and we will carry him away with us on our journey. But the sons of Jacob insisted, Restore our slave to us, lest you meet death at the edge of the sword. Unaffrighted, the Midianites drew their weapons, and, amid war whoops, they prepared to enter into a combat with the sons of Jacob. Then Simon rose up, and with bared sword he sprang upon the Midianites, at the same time uttering a cry that made the earth reverberate. The Midianites fell down in great consternation, and he said, I am Simon, the son of the Hebrew Jacob who destroyed the city of Shechem alone and unaided, and together with my brethren I destroyed the cities of the Amorites. God do so and more also, if it be not true that all the Midianites, your brethren, united with all the Canaanite kings to fight with me, cannot hold out against me. Now restore the boy you took from us, else will I give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. The Midianites were greatly afraid of Simon, and, terrified and abashed, they spake to the sons of Jacob with little courage, said ye not that ye cast this lad into the pit because he was of a rebellious spirit? 
What, now, will ye do with an insubordinate slave? Rather sell him to us, we are ready to pay any price you desire. This speech was part of the purpose of God. He had put it into the heart of the Midianites to insist upon possessing Joseph, that he might not remain with his brethren, and be slain by them. The brethren assented, and Joseph was sold as a slave while they sat over the meal. God spake, saying, Over a meal did ye sell your brother, and thus shall Aesur sell your descendants to Haman over a meal, and because ye have sold Joseph to be a slave, therefore shall ye say year after year, Slaves were we unto Pharaoh in Egypt. The price paid for Joseph by the Midianites was twenty pieces of silver, enough for a pair of shoes for each of his brethren. Thus they sold the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes. For so handsome a youth as Joseph the sum paid was too low by far, but his appearance had been greatly changed by the horrible anguish he bad endured in the pit with the snakes and the scorpions. He had lost his ruddy complexion, and he looked sallow and sickly, and the Midianites were justified in paying a small sum for him. The merchantman had come upon Joseph naked in the pit, for his brethren had stripped him of all his clothes. That he might not appear before men in an unseemly condition, God sent Gabriel down to him, and the angel enlarged the amulet banging from Joseph's neck until it was a garment that covered him entirely. Joseph's brethren were looking after him as he departed with the Midianites, and when they saw him with clothes upon him, they cried after them, Give us his raiment. We sold him naked, without clothes. His owners refused to yield to their demand, but they agreed to reimburse the brethren with four pairs of shoes, and Joseph kept his garment, the same in which he was arrayed when he arrived in Egypt and was sold to Potiphar, the same in which he was locked up in prison and appeared before Pharaoh, and the same he wore when he was ruler over Egypt. As an atonement for the twenty pieces of silver taken by his brethren in exchange for Joseph, God commanded that every firstborn son shall be redeemed by the priest with an equal amount, and, also, every Israelite must pay annually to the sanctuary as much as fell to each of the brethren as his share of the price. The brethren of Joseph bought shoes for the money, for they said, We will not eat it, because it is the price for the blood of our brother, but we will tread upon him, for that he spake he would have dominion over us, and we will see what will become of his dreams. And for this reason the ordinance has been commanded, that he who refuseth to raise up a name in Israel unto his brother that hath died without having a son, shall have his shoe loosed from off his foot, and his face shall be spat upon. Joseph's brethren refused to do ought to preserve his life, and therefore the Lord loosed their shoes from off their feet, for, when they went down to Egypt, the slaves of Joseph took their shoes off their feet as they entered the gates, and they prostrated themselves before Joseph as before a pharaoh, and, as they lay prostrate, they were spat upon, and put to shame before the Egyptians. The Midianites pursued their journey to Gilead, but they soon regretted the purchase they had made. They feared that Joseph had been stolen in the land of the Hebrews, though sold to them as a slave, and if his kinsmen should find him with them, Death would be inflicted upon them for the abduction of a free man. The high-handed manner of the sons of Jacob confirmed their suspicion that they might be capable of man theft. Their wicked deed would explain, too, why they had accepted so small a sum in exchange for Joseph. While discussing these points, they saw, coming their way, the traveling company of Ishmaelites that had been observed earlier by the sons of Jacob, and they determined to dispose of Joseph to them that they might at least not lose the price they had paid, and might escape the danger at the same time of being made captives for the crime of kidnapping a man. And the Ishmaelites bought Joseph from the Midianites, and they paid the same price as his former owners had given for him. Joseph's Three Masters As a rule the only merchandise with which the Ishmaelites loaded their camels was pitch and the skins of beasts. By a providential dispensation they carried bags of perfumery this time, instead of their usual ill-smelling freight, that sweet fragrance might be wafted to Joseph on his journey to Egypt. These aromatic substances were well suited to Joseph, whose body emitted a pleasant smell, so agreeable and pervasive that the road along which he traveled was redolent thereof, and on his arrival in Egypt the perfume from his body spread over the whole land, and the royal princesses, following the sweet scent to trace its source, reached the place in which Joseph was. 
Even after his death the same fragrance was spread abroad by his bones, enabling Moses to distinguish Joseph's remains from all others, and keep the oath of the children of Israel, to inter them in the Holy Land. When Joseph learned that the Ishmaelites were carrying him to Egypt, he began to weep bitterly at the thought of being removed so far from Canaan and from his father. One of the Ishmaelites noticed Joseph's weeping and crying, and thinking that he found riding uncomfortable, he lifted him from the back of the camel, and permitted him to walk on foot. But Joseph continued to weep and sob, crying incessantly, O oh father, father! Another one of the caravan, tired of his lamentations, beat him, causing only the more tears and wails, until the youth, exhausted by his grief, was unable to move on. Now all the Ishmaelites in the company dealt out blows to him. They treated him with relentless cruelty, and tried to silence him by threats. God saw Joseph's distress, and he sent darkness and terror upon the Ishmaelites, and their hands grew rigid when they raised them to inflict a blow. Astonished, they asked themselves why God did thus unto them upon the road. They did not know that it was for the sake of Joseph. The journey was continued until they came to Ephrath, the place of Rachel's sepulchre. Joseph hastened to his mother's grave, and throwing himself across it, he groaned and cried, saying, O mother, mother, that didst bear me, arise, come forth and see how thy son hath been sold into slavery, with none to take pity upon him. Arise, see thy son, and weep with me over my misfortune, and observe the heartlessness of my brethren. Awake, O mother, rouse thyself from thy sleep, rise up and prepare for the conflict with my brethren, who stripped me even of my shirt, and sold me as a slave to merchantmen, who in turn sold me to others, and without mercy they tore me away from my father. Arise, accuse my brethren before God, and see whom he will justify in the judgment and whom he will find guilty. Arise, O mother, awake from thy sleep, see how my father is with me in his soul and in the spirit, and comfort him and ease his heavy heart. Joseph wept and cried upon the grave of his mother, until, weary from grief, he lay immovable as a stone. Then he heard a voice heavy with tears speak to him from the depths, saying, My son Joseph, my son, I heard thy complaints and thy groans, I saw thy tears and I knew thy misery, my son. I am grieved for thy sake, and thy affliction is added to the burden of my affliction. But, my son Joseph, put thy trust in God, and wait upon him. Fear not, for the Lord is with thee, and he will deliver thee from all evil. Go down into Egypt with thy masters, my son. Fear not, for the Lord is with thee, O my son. Listen much more like unto it did the voice utter and then it was silent. Joseph listened in great amazement at first, and then he broke out in renewed tears. Angered thereby, one of the Ishmaelites drove him from his mother's grave with kicks and curses. Then Joseph entreated his masters to take him back to his father, who would give them great riches as a reward. But they said, Why, thou art a slave? How canst thou know where thy father is? If thou hadst had a free man as father, thou wouldst not have been sold twice for a petty sum. And then their fury against him increased, they beat him and maltreated him, and he wept bitter tears. Now God looked upon the distress of Joseph, and he sent darkness to enshroud the land once more. A storm raged, the lightning flashed, and from the thunderbolts the whole earth trembled, and the Ishmaelites lost their way in their terror. The beasts and the camels stood still, and, beat them as their drivers would. They refused to budge from the spot, but crouched down upon the ground. Then the Ishmaelites spake to one another, and said, Why hath God brought this upon us? What are our sins, what our trespasses, that such things befall us? One of them said to the others, Peradventure this hath come upon us by reason of the sin which we have committed against this slave. Let us beg him earnestly to grant us forgiveness, and if then God will take pity, and let these storms pass away from us, we shall know that we suffered harm on account of the injury we inflicted upon the slave. The Ishmaelites did according to these words, and they said unto Joseph, We have sinned against God and against thee. Pray to thy God, and entreat him to take this death plague from us, for we acknowledge that we have sinned against him. Joseph fulfilled their wish, and God hearkened to his petition, and the storm was assuaged. 
all around became calm, the beasts arose from their recumbent position, and the caravan could proceed upon its way. Now the Ishmaelites saw plainly that all their trouble had come upon them for the sake of Joseph, and they spoke one to another, saying, We know now that all this evil hath happened to us on account of this poor fellow, and wherefore should we bring death upon ourselves by our own doings? Let us take counsel together, what is to be done with the slave? One of them advised that Joseph's wish be fulfilled, and he be taken back to his father. Then they would be sure of receiving the money they had paid out for him. This plan was rejected, because they had accomplished a great part of their journey, and they were not inclined to retrace their steps. They therefore resolved upon carrying Joseph to Egypt and selling him there. They would rid themselves of him in this way, and also receive a great price for him. They continued their journey as far as the borders of Egypt, and there they met four men, descendants of Meden, the son of Abraham, and to these they sold Joseph for five shekels. The two companies, the Ishmaelites and the Medanites, arrived in Egypt upon the same day. The latter, hearing that Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, was seeking a good slave, repaired to him at once, to try to dispose of Joseph to him. Potiphar was willing to pay as much as four hundred pieces of silver, for, high as the price was, it did not seem too great for a slave that pleased him as much as Joseph. However, he made a condition. He said to the Medanites, I will pay you the price demanded, but you must bring me the person that sold the slave to you, that I may be in a position to find out all about him, for the youth seems to me to be neither a slave nor the son of a slave. He appears to be of noble blood. I must convince myself that he was not stolen. The Medanites brought the Ishmaelites to Potiphar, and they testified that Joseph was a slave, that they had owned him, and had sold him to the Medanites. Potiphar rested satisfied with this report, paid the price asked for Joseph, and the Medanites and the Ishmaelites went their way. Joseph's coat brought to his father. No sooner was the sale of Joseph an accomplished fact than the sons of Jacob repented of their deed. They even hastened after the Midianites to ransom Joseph, but their efforts to overtake them were vain, and they had to accept the inevitable. Meantime Reuben had rejoined his brethren. He had been so deeply absorbed in penances, in praying and studying the Torah, in expiation of his sin against his father, that he had not been able to remain with his brethren and tend the flocks, and thus it happened that he was not on the spot when Joseph was sold. His first errand was to go to the pit, in the hope of finding Joseph there. In that case he would have carried him off and restored him to his father clandestinely, without the knowledge of his brethren. He stood at the opening and called again and again, Joseph, Joseph. As he received no answer, he concluded that Joseph had perished, either by reason of terror or as the result of a snake bite, and he descended into the pit, only to find that he was not there, either living or dead. He mounted to the top again, and rent his clothes, and cried out, The lad is not there, and what answer shall I give to my father, if he be dead? Then Reuben returned unto his brethren, and told them that Joseph bad vanished from the pit, whereat he was deeply grieved, because he, being the oldest of the sons, was responsible to their father Jacob. The brethren made a clean breast of what they had done with Joseph, and they related to him how they had tried to make good their evil deed, and how their efforts had been vain. Now there remained nothing to do but invent a plausible explanation for their brother's disappearance to give to Jacob. First of all, however, they took an oath not to betray to his father or any human being what they bad actually done with Joseph. He who violated the oath would be put to the sword by the rest. Then they took counsel together about what to say to Jacob. It was Issachar's advice to tear Joseph's coat of many colors and dip it in the blood of a little kid of the goats, to make Jacob believe that his son had been torn by a wild beast. The reason he suggested a kid was because its blood looks like human blood. In expiation of this act of deception, it was ordained that a kid be used as an atonement sacrifice when the tabernacle was dedicated. Simon opposed the suggestion. He did not want to relinquish Joseph's coat, and he threatened to hew down anyone that should attempt to wrest it from him by force. The reason for his vehemence was that he was very much enraged against his brethren for not having slain Joseph. But they threatened him in turn, saying, 
If thou wilt not give up the coat, we shall say that thou didst execute the evil deed thyself. At that Simon surrendered it, and Naphtali brought it to Jacob, handing it to him with the words, When we were driving our herds homeward, we found this garment covered with blood and dust on the highway, a little beyond Shechem. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. Jacob recognized Joseph's coat, and, overwhelmed by grief, he fell prostrate, and long lay on the ground motionless, like a stone. Then he arose, and set up a loud cry, and wept, saying, It is my son's coat. In great haste Jacob dispatched a slave to his sons, to bid them come to him, that he might learn more about what had happened. In the evening they all came, their garments rent, and dust strewn upon their heads. When they confirmed all that Naphtali had told him, Jacob broke out in mourning and lamentation, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. I sent him to you to see whether it was well with you, and well with the flock. He went to do my errand, and while I thought him to be with you, the misfortune befell. There too the sons of Jacob made reply, He came to us not at all. Since we left thee, we have not set eyes on him. After these words, Jacob could doubt no longer that Joseph had been torn by wild beasts, and he mourned for his son, saying, O oh my son Joseph, my son, I sent thee to inquire after the welfare of thy brethren, and now thou art torn by wild beasts. It is my fault that this evil chance hath come upon thee. I am distressed for thee, my son, I am sorely distressed. How sweet was thy life to me, and how bitter is thy death! Would God I had died for thee, O Joseph, my son, for now I am distressed on thy account. O my son Joseph, where art thou, and where is thy soul? Arise, arise from thy place, and look upon my grief for thee. Come and count the tears that roll down my cheeks, and bring the tale of them before God, that his wrath be turned away from me. O Joseph, my son, how painful and appalling was thy death! None hath died a death like thine since the world doth stand. I know well that it came to pass by reason of my sins. O oh, that thou wouldst return and see the bitter sorrow thy misfortune hath brought upon me! But it is true, it was not I that created thee, and formed thee. I gave thee neither spirit nor soul, but God created thee. He formed thy bones, covered them with flesh, breathed the breath of life into thy nostrils, and then gave thee unto me. And God who gave thee unto me, he hath taken thee from me, and from him hath this dispensation come upon me. What the Lord doeth is well done. In these words and many others like them Jacob mourned and bewailed his son, until he fell to the ground prostrate and immovable. When the sons of Jacob saw the vehemence of their father's grief, they repented of their deed, and wept bitterly. Especially Judah was grief-stricken. He laid his father's head upon his knees and wiped his tears away as they flowed from his eyes, while he himself broke out in violent weeping. The sons of Jacob and their wives all sought to comfort their father. They arranged a great memorial service, and they wept and mourned over Joseph's death and over their father's sorrow. But Jacob refused to be comforted. The tidings of his son's death caused the loss of two members of Jacob's family. Bilhah and Dinah could not survive their grief. Bilhah passed away the very day whereon the report reached Jacob, and Dinah died soon after, and so he had three losses to mourn in one month. He received the tidings of Joseph's death in the seventh month, Tishri, and on the tenth day of the month, and therefore the children of Israel are bidden to weep and afflict their souls on this day. Furthermore, on this day the sin offering of atonement shall be a kid of the goats, because the sons of Jacob transgressed with a kid in the blood of which they dipped Joseph's coat, and thus they brought sorrow upon Jacob. When he had recovered somewhat from the stunning blow which the tidings of his favorite son's death had dealt him, Jacob rose up from the ground and addressed his sons, tears streaming down his cheeks all the while. Up, he said, take your swords and your bows, go out on the field, and make search, perhaps you will find the body of my son, and you will bring it to me, so that I may bury it. Keep a lookout. 2. For beasts of prey, and catch the first you meet. Seize it and bring it to me. It may be that God will have pity upon my sorrow, 
and put the beast between your hands that hath torn my child in pieces, and I will take my revenge upon it. The sons of Jacob set out on the morrow to do the bidding of their father, while he remained at home and wept and lamented for Joseph. In the wilderness they found a wolf, which they caught and brought to Jacob alive, saying, Here is the first wild beast we encountered, and we have brought it to thee. But of thy son's corpse we saw not a trace. Jacob seized the wolf, and, amid loud weeping, he addressed these words to him, Why didst thou devour my son Joseph? without any fear of the God of the earth, and without taking any thought of the grief thou wouldst bring down upon me. Thou didst devour my son without reason, he was guilty of no manner of transgression, and thou didst roll the responsibility for his death upon me. But God avengeth him that is persecuted. To grant consolation to Jacob, God opened the mouth of the beast, and he spake, As the Lord liveth, who hath created me, and as thy soul liveth, my Lord. I have not seen thy son, and I did not rent him in pieces. From a land afar off I came to seek mine own son, who suffered a like fate with thine. He hath disappeared, and I know not whether he be dead or alive, and therefore I came hither ten days ago to find him. This day, while I was searching for him, thy sons met me, and they seized me, and, adding more grief to my grief over my lost son, they brought me hither to thee. This is my story. And now, O son of man, I am in thy hands, thou canst dispose of me this day as seemeth well in thy sight, but I swear unto thee by the God that bath created me, I have not seen thy son, nor have I torn him in pieces, never hath the flesh of man come into my mouth. Astonished at the speech of the wolf, Jacob let him go, unhindered, whithersoever he would, but he mourned his son Joseph as before. It is a law of nature that however much one may grieve over the death of a dear one, at the end of a year consolation finds its way to the heart of the mourner. But the disappearance of a living man can never be wiped out of one's memory. Therefore the fact that he was inconsolable made Jacob suspect that Joseph was alive, and he did not give entire credence to the report of his sons. His vague suspicion was strengthened by something that happened to him. He went up into the mountains hewed twelve stones out of the quarry, and wrote the names of his sons thereon, their constellations, and the months corresponding to the constellations, a stone for a son, thus, Reuben, Ram, Nizan, and so for each of his twelve sons. Then he addressed the stones and bade them bow down before the one mark with Reuben's name, constellation, and month, and they did not move. He gave the same order regarding the stone mark for Simon, and again the stones stood still. And so he did respecting all his sons, until he reached the stone for Joseph. When he spoke concerning this one, I command you to fall down before Joseph, they all prostrated themselves. He tried the same test with other things, with trees and sheaves, and always the result was the same, and Jacob could not but feel that his suspicion was true, Joseph was alive. There was a reason why God did not reveal the real fate of Joseph to Jacob. When his brethren sold Joseph, their fear that the report of their iniquity might reach the ears of Jacob led them to pronounce the ban upon any that should betray the truth without the consent of all the others. Judah advanced the objection that a ban is invalid unless it is decreed in the presence of ten persons, and there were but nine of them, for Reuben and Benjamin were not there when the sale of Joseph was concluded. To evade the difficulty, the brothers counted God as the tenth person and therefore God felt bound to refrain from revealing the true state of things to Jacob. He had regard, as it were, for the ban pronounced by the brethren of Joseph. And as God kept the truth a secret from Jacob, Isaac did not feel justified in acquainting him with his grandson's fate, which was well known to him, for he was a prophet. Whenever he was in the company of Jacob, he mourned with him, but as soon as he quitted him, he left off from manifesting grief because he knew that Joseph lived. Jacob was thus the only one among Joseph's closest kinsmen that remained in ignorance of his son's real fortunes, and he was the one of them all that had the greatest reason for regretting his death. He spoke, The covenant that God made with me regarding the twelve tribes is null and void now. I did strive in vain to establish the twelve tribes, seeing that now the death of Joseph hath destroyed the covenant. All the works of God were made to correspond to the number of the tribes, twelve are the signs of the zodiac, twelve the months, twelve hours half the day, twelve the night, 
and twelve stones are set in Aaron's breastplate, and now that Joseph hath departed, the covenant of the tribes is set at naught. He could not replace the lost son by entering into a new marriage, for he had made the promise to his father-in-law to take none beside his daughters to wife, and this promise, as he interpreted it, held good after the death of Laban's daughters as well as while they were alive. Beside grief over his loss and regret at the breaking of the covenant of the tribes, Jacob had still another reason for mourning the death of Joseph. God had said to Jacob, If none of thy sons dies during thy lifetime, thou must look upon it as a token that thou wilt not be put in Gehenna after thy death. Thinking Joseph to be dead, Jacob had his own fate to bewail, too, for he now believed that he was doomed to Gehenna. His mourning lasted all of twenty-two years corresponding to the number of the years he had dwelt apart from his parents, and had not fulfilled the duty of a son toward them. In this morning Jacob put sackcloth upon his loins, and therein be became a model for the kings and princes in Israel, for David, Ahab, Joram, and Mordecai did likewise when a great misfortune befell the nation. The Sons of Jacob Significant Names Jacob raised all his sons in the fear of God and taught them the ways of a pious life, using severity when there was need to make his lessons impressive. He reaped the fruits of his labor, for all his sons were godly men of stainless character. The ancestors of the twelve tribes resembled their fathers in piety, and their acts were no less significant than those of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like these three, they deserve to be called the fathers of Israel. God made a covenant with them as he had made with the three patriarchs and to this covenant their descendants owe their preservation. The very names of the tribes point to the redemption of Israel. Reuben is so called, because God sees the affliction of his people. Simon, because he hears its groaning. Levi, he joins himself unto his people when Israel suffers. Judah, Israel will thank God for its deliverance. Issachar, it will be rewarded for its suffering with a recompense. Zebulun, God will have a dwelling place in Israel. Benjamin, he swore by his right hand to succor his people. Dan, he will judge the nation that subjugates Israel. Naphtali, he bestowed the Torah upon Israel, and she drops sweetness like the honeycomb. Gad, the Lord gave manna unto Israel, and it was like coriander seed. Asher, all nations will call Israel happy. And Joseph, because God will add a second redemption of Israel to the first, redemption from the wicked kingdom at the end is from Egypt in former times. Not only the names of Jacob's sons are significant, but the names of their sons as well. Thus the names of the sons of Issachar express the activities of the tribe known for its learning above all the others. The oldest was called Tola, Urm. As the silk worm is distinguished for its mouth, with which it spins, so also the men of the tribe of Issachar for the wise words of their mouth. The second is Pa, matter plant. As this plant colors all things, so the tribe of Issachar colors the whole world with its teachings. The third is Jashub, the returning one, for through the teachings of Issachar Israel will be turned back to its heavenly father. And Shimron, the fourth, is the observing one, to indicate that the tribe of Issachar observes the Torah. The names of the sons of Gad likewise interpret the history of the tribe. During Israel's sojourn in Egypt, it had strayed from the right path, but when Aaron appeared as prophet and monitor, and called unto the Israelites to cast away the abominations of their eyes and forsake the idols of Egypt, they hearkened unto his words. Hence the double name Osni and Esben borne by one of the sons of Gad, for this tribe hearkened to the word of God, and fulfilled his will. The grandsons of Asher bear the names Heber and Malchal, because they were the associates of kings, and their inheritance yielded royal dainties. Partly the history of the tribe of Benjamin can be read in the names of its chiefs. It consisted originally of ten divisions, descended from Benjamin's ten sons, but five of them perished in Egypt on account of their ungodly ways, from which no admonition availed to turn them aside. Of the five families remaining, two. The descendants of Bala and those of Ashbel, had always been God-fearing. The others, the Hiramites, the Shephuphamites, and the Huphamites, repented of their sins, and in accordance with the change in their conduct had been the change in their names. Ehi had become a Hiram, because the breach with the Exalted One was healed. 
Mapira was called Shephuffam, because they afflicted themselves in their penance. And Huffam was turned into Huffam, to indicate that they had cleansed themselves from sin. As a reward for their piety, the family springing from Bela was permitted to have two subdivisions, the Ardites and the Namites. Their names point them out as men that know well how the fear of God is to be manifested, whose deeds are exceedingly lovely. Naphtali was another tribe of steadfast piety, and the names of his sons testify there too, Jazeel, because the tribesmen raised a partition wall between God and the idols, in Asmuk as they trusted in God and contemned the idols. Guni, because God was their protection. And Jezer and Shilam designate the Naphtalites as men devoted to God with all their hearts. Reuben's Testament Two years after the death of Joseph, Reuben fell sick. Feeling that his end was nigh, he called together his sons, his grandsons, and his brethren, to give them his last admonitions from out of the fullness of his experience. He spake, Hear, my brethren, and do ye, my children, give ear unto Reuben your father in the commands that I enjoin upon you. And, behold, I adjure you this day by the God of heaven that ye walk not in the follies of youth and the fornications to which I was addicted and wherewith I devil the bed of my father Jacob. For I tell you now that for seven months the Lord afflicted my loins with a terrible plague, and if my father Jacob had not interceded for me, the Lord had swept me away. I was twenty years of age when I did what was evil before the Lord, and for seven months I was sick unto death. Then I did penance for seven years in the innermost depths of my soul. Wine and strong drink I drink not, the flesh of animals passed not my lips, dainties I tasted not, because I mourn over my sins, for they were great. He admonished those gathered around him to beware of the seven tempter spirits, which are the spirit of fornication, gluttony, strife, love of admiration, arrogance, falsehood, and injustice. He cautioned them especially against unchastity, saying, Pay no heed to the glances of a woman, and remain not alone with a married woman and do not occupy yourselves with the affairs of women. Had I not seen Bilhobed in a secluded spot, I had not fallen into the great sin I committed, for after my thoughts had once grasped the nakedness of woman, I could not sleep until I had accomplished the abominable deed. For when our father Jacob went to his father Isaac, while we sojourned in Eder, not far from Ephrath, which is Bethlehem, Bilha was drunken with wine, and she lay asleep, uncovered, in her bedchamber. And I entered in and saw her nakedness and committed the sin, and I went out again, leaving her asleep. But an angel of God revealed my impious act to my father Jacob at once. He came back and mourned over me, and never again did he approach Bilhah. Unto the very last day of his life, I had not the assurance to look my father in the face or to speak to my brethren regarding my disgrace, and even now my conscience tortures me on account of my sin. Nevertheless my father spake words of comfort to me, and prayed to God in my behalf, that the wrath of the Lord might depart from me, as he showed me. Reuben admonished his children impressively to join themselves to Levi, because he will know the law of the Lord, he said, and he will give ordinances for judgment, and bring sacrifices for all Israel, until the consummation of the times, as the anointed high priest of whom the Lord spake. After announcing his last will to his sons, Reuben departed this life at the age of 125 years. His body was laid in a coffin until his sons bore it away from Egypt, and carried it up to Hebron, where they buried it in the double cave. Simon's Admonition Against Envy As Reuben confessed his sin upon his deathbed, and warned his children and his family to be on their guard against unchastity, the vice that had brought about his fall, so Simon, when he was about to die, assembled his sons around him and confessed the sin he had committed. He had been guilty of boundless envy of Joseph, and he spoke, I was the second son begotten by my father Jacob, and my mother Leah called me Simon, because the Lord had heard her prayer. I waxed strong, and shrank from no manner of deed, and I was afraid of naught, for my heart was hard, and my liver unyielding, and my bowels without mercy. And in the days of my youth I was jealous of Joseph. For our father loved him more than all the rest of us, and I resolved to kill him. For the prince of temptation sent the spirit of jealousy to take possession of me, and it blinded me so that I did not consider Joseph to be my brother, and I spared not even my father Jacob. 
but as God and the God of his father sent his angel and saved him out of my hands. When I went to Shechem to fetch ointment for the herds, and Reuben was in Dothan, where all our supplies and stores were kept, our brother Judah sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. On his return, when he heard what had happened, Reuben was very sad, for he had been desirous of saving Joseph and bringing him back to our father. But as for me, my wrath was unkindled against Judah, that he had let him escape alive. My anger abode with me all of five months. But the Lord restrained me from using the power of my hands, for my right hand withered for the length of seven days. Then I knew that what had happened was for the sake of Joseph. I repented and prayed to God to restore my hand and withhold me henceforth from all sorts of defilement, envy, and folly. For two years I gave myself up to fasting and the fear of God, for I perceived that redemption from jealousy could come only through the fear of God. My father, seeing me downcast, asked to know the cause of my sadness, and I replied that I was suffering with my liver, but in truth I was mourning more than all my brethren, seeing that I had been the cause of Joseph's sale. And when we went down into Egypt, and Joseph bound me as a spy, I was not grieved, for I knew in my heart that my suffering was just retribution. But Joseph was good, the Spirit of God dwelt within him. Compassionate and merciful as he was, he bore me no resentment for my evil deeds toward him, but he loved me with the same love he showed the others. He paid due honor to us all, and gave us gold, and cattle, and produce. And now, my dear children, do ye love one another, each one his brother, with a clean heart, and remove the spirit of jealousy from the midst of you. Like Reuben, so also Simon assured his sons to beware of unchastity, for this vice is the mother of all evil. It separates man from God, and abandons him to bearer. These were the closing words of his exhortation, in the writings of Enoch I saw that your sons would be corrupted through unchastity, and they would maltreat the sons of Levi with the sword but they will not be able to do aught against Levi, for the war he will wage is the war of the Lord, and he will vanquish all your armies. As a small remnant you will be scattered among Levi and Judah, and none among you will rise to be a judge or a king of our people, as, my father Jacob prophesied in his blessing. Having completed his admonitions to his sons, Simon passed away and was gathered to his fathers, at the age of 120 years. His sons placed him in a coffin made of imperishable wood, so that they might carry his bones to Hebron, as they did, in secret, during the war between the Egyptians and the Canaanites. Thus did all the tribes during the war. They took the remains each of its founder from Egypt to Hebron. Only the bones of Joseph remained in Egypt until the Israelites went out of the land, for the Egyptians guarded them in their royal treasure chambers. Their magicians had warned them that whenever Joseph's bones should be removed from Egypt, a great darkness would envelop the whole land, and it would be a dire misfortune for the Egyptians, for none would be able to recognize his neighbor even with the light of a lamp. The Ascension of Levi When it was disclosed to Levi that he was about to die, he gathered all his children around him, to tell them the story of his life, and he also prophesied unto them what they would do, and what would happen to them until the judgment day. He spoke, when we were posturing the flocks in Abel Mehola, the spirit of understanding of the Lord came upon me, and I saw all mankind, how they corrupt their ways, and that injustice builds up walls for herself, and impiety sits enthroned upon the towers. And I fell to grieving over the generations of men, and I prayed to the Lord to save me. Sleep enshrouded me, and I beheld a tall mountain, and lo! The heavens opened, and an angel of God addressed me, and said, Levi, enter. I entered the first heaven, and I saw a great sea hanging there, and farther on I saw a second heaven, brighter and more resplendent than the first. I said to the angel, Why is this so? And the angel said to me, Marvel not at this, for thou shalt see another heaven, brilliant beyond compare, and when thou hast ascended thither, thou shalt stand near the Lord, and thou shalt be his minister, and declare his mysteries to men and of the Lord's portion shall be thy life, and he shall be thy field and vineyard and fruits and gold and silver. Then the angel explained the uses of the different heavens to me, and all that happens in each, and he proclaimed the judgment day. He opened the gates of the third heaven, where I beheld the holy temple, 
and God seated upon the throne of glory. The Lord spake to me, Levi, upon thee have I bestowed the blessing of the priesthood, until I come and dwell in the midst of Israel. Then the angel carried me back to earth, and gave me a shield and a sword, saying, Execute vengeance upon Shechem for Dinah, and I will be with thee, for the Lord hath sent me. I asked the angel what his name was, and he replied, I am the angel that intercedes for the people of Israel, that it may not be destroyed utterly, for every evil spirit attacks it. When I awoke, I betook myself to my father, and on the way, near Gebel, I found a brass shield, such as I had seen in my dream. Then I advised my father and my brother Reuben to bid the sons of Hammer circumcise themselves, for I was quivering with rage on account of the abominable deed they had done. I slew Shechem first of all, and then Simon slew Hammer, and all my other brothers came out and destroyed the whole city. Our father took this in ill part, and in his blessing he remembered our conduct. Although we did a wrong thing in acting thus against his wishes, yet I recognized it to be the judgment of God upon the people of Shechem on account of their sins, and I said to my father, Be not wroth, my lord, for God will exterminate the Canaanites through this, and he will give the land to thee and to thy seed after thee. Henceforth Shechem will be called the city of imbeciles, for as a fool is mocked at, so have we made a mockery of them. When we journeyed to Bethlehem, and had been abiding there for seventy days, another vision was vouchsafed me, like unto the former. I saw seven men clad in white, and they spake to me, saying, Rise up, and array thyself in the priestly garments, set the crown of righteousness upon thy head, and put on the ephod of understanding, and the robe of truth, and the mitri plate of faith, and the mitri of dignity, and the shoulder pieces of prophecy. And each of the men brought a garment unto me and invested me therewith, and spake, Henceforth be the priest of the Lord, thou and thy seed unto eternity. And ye shall eat all that is lovely to look upon, and the table of the Lord thy descendants will appropriate for themselves, and from them will come high priests, judges, and scholars, for all that is holy will be guarded by their mouth. Two days after I was visited by this dream, Judah and I repaired to our grandfather Isaac who blessed me in accordance with the words I had heard. Jacob also had a vision, and he saw, too, that I was appointed to be the priest of God, and through me he set apart a tenth of his possessions unto the Lord. And when we established ourselves in Hebron, the residence of Isaac, our grandfather taught me the law of the priesthood, and admonished me to hold myself aloof from unchastity. At the age of twenty-eight years I took Milcah to wife, and she bore me a son, and I named him Gershom, because we were strangers in the land. But I perceived he would not be in the first ranks of men. My second son was born unto me in my thirty-fifth year, and he saw the light of the world at sunrise, and I beheld him in a vision standing among the proud of the assembly, and therefore I gave him the name Kohath. The third son my wife bore me in the fortieth year of my life, and I called his name Merari, because bitter had been her travail in bearing him. My daughter Jochebed kept was born in Egypt, when I was sixty-three years old, and I called her thus because I was known honorably among my brethren in those days. And in my ninety-fourth year, Amram took Jochebed to wife, he that was born on the same day with her. Thereupon Levi admonished his children to walk in the ways of the Lord, and fear him with all their heart, and he told them what he had learned from the writings of Enoch, that his descendants would sin against the Lord in times to come and they would suffer the divine punishment for their transgression, and then God would raise up a new priest, unto whom all the words of the Lord would be revealed. His last words were, And now, my children, ye have heard all I have to say. Choose, now, light or darkness, the law of the Lord or the works of Belial. And his sons made answer, Before the Lord we will walk according to his law. Then Levi spake, The Lord is witness and the angels are witnesses, I am witness and ye are witnesses, concerning the word of your mouth. And his sons replied, We are witnesses. Thus Levi ceased to admonish his sons. He stretched out his feet, and was gathered unto his fathers, at the age of one hundred and thirty-seven years, a greater age than any of his brethren attained. Judah warns against greed and unchastity. The last words addressed by Judah to his sons were the following, I was the fourth son begotten by my father and my mother called me Judah, saying, 
I thank the Lord that he hath given me a fourth son. I was zealous in my youth and obedient to my father in all things. When I grew up to manhood, he blessed me, saying, Thou wilt be king, and wilt prosper in all thy ways. The Lord granted me his grace in whatever I undertook, in the field and in the house. I could speed as swiftly as the hind, and overtake it, and prepare a dish of it for my father. A deer I could catch on the run, and all the animals of the valley. A wild mare I could outstrip, hold it, and bridle it. A lion I slew, and snatched a kid from its jaws. A bear I caught by the paw, and flung it adown the cliff, and it lay beneath crushed. I could keep pace with the wild boar, and overtake it, and as I ran I seized it, and tore it to pieces. A leopard sprang at my dog in Hebron, and I grasped its tail, and hurled it away from me, and its body burst on the coast at Gaza. A wild steer I found grazing in the field. I took it by its horns, swung it round and round until it was stunned, and then I cast it to the ground and killed it. Judah continued and told his children of his heroism in the wars that the sons of Jacob had waged with the kings of Canaan and with Esau and his family. In all these conflicts he bore a distinguished part, beyond the achievements of the others. His father Jacob was free from all anxiety when Judah was with his brethren in their combats, because he had had a vision showing him an angel of strength standing at the side of Judah on all his ways. Judah did not conceal his shortcomings, either. He confessed how drunkenness and passion had betrayed him first into marriage with a Canaanitish woman, and then into improper relations with his daughter-in-law Tamar. He said to his children, Do not walk after the desire of your hearts, and vaunt not the valiant deeds of your youth. This, too, is evil in the eyes of the Lord. For while I boasted that the face of a beautiful woman had never allured me in the wars, and reviled my brother Reuben for his transgression with Bilhah, the spirit of passion and unchastity gained possession of me, and I took Bathsheba to wife, and trespassed with Tamar, though she was the affianced of my son. First I said to Bathsheba's father, I will take counsel with my father Jacob, to know whether I should marry thy daughter, but he was a king, and he showed me an untold heap of gold accredited to his daughter, and he adorned her with the magnificence of women, in gold and pearls, and he bade her pour the wine at the meal. The wine turned my eyes awry, and passion darkened my heart. In mad love for her, I violated the command of the Lord and the will of my father, and I took her to wife. The Lord gave me a recompense according to the counsel of my heart, for I had no joy in the sons she bore me. And now, my children, I pray you, do not intoxicate yourselves with wine, for wine twists the understanding away from the truth, and confuses the sight of the eyes. Wine led me astray so that I felt no shame before the throngs of people in the city, and I turned aside and went into Tamar in the presence of them, and committed a great sin. And though a man be a king, if he leads an unchaste life, he loses his kingship. I gave Tamar my staff, which is the stay of my tribe, and my girdle cord, which is power, and my signet diadem, which is the glory of my kingdom. I did penance for all this, and unto old age I drank no wine, and ate no flesh and knew no sort of pleasure. Wine causes the secret things of God and man to be revealed unto the stranger. Thus did I disclose the commands of the Lord and the mysteries of my father Jacob to the Canaanite woman Bathsheba, though God had forbidden me to betray them. I also enjoin you not to love gold, and not to look upon the beauty of women, for through money and through beauty I was led astray to Bathsheba the Canaanite. I know that my stock will fall into misery through these two things, for even the wise men among my sons will be changed by them, and the consequence will be that the kingdom of Judah will be diminished, the domain that the Lord gave me is a reward for my obedient conduct toward my father, for never did I speak in contradiction of him, but I did all things according to his words. And Isaac, my father's father, blessed me with the blessing that I should be ruler in Israel, and I know that the kingdom will arise from me. In the books of Enoch the just I read all the evil that ye will do in the latter days. Only beware, my children, of unchastity and greed, for love of gold leads to idolatry, causing men to call them gods that are none, and dethroning the reason of man. On account of gold I lost my children, and had I not mortified my flesh, and humbled my soul, 
and had not my father Jacob offered up prayers for me, I had died childless. But the God of my fathers, the merciful and gracious one, saw that I had acted unwittingly, for the ruler of deception had blinded me, and I was ignorant, being flesh and blood, and corrupt through sins, and in the moment when I considered myself invincible, I recognized my weakness. Then Judah revealed to his sons, in clear, brief words, the whole history of Israel until the advent of the Messiah, and his final speech was, My children, observe the whole law of the Lord. In it is hope for all that keep his ways. I die this day at the age of 119 years before your eyes. None shall bury me in a costly garment, nor shall ye cut my body to embalm it, but ye shall carry me to Hebron. Having spoken these words, Judah sank into death. Issachar's Singleness of Heart When Issachar felt his end approach, he summoned his sons, and he said to them, Hearken, my children, unto your father Issachar, and listen to the words of him that is beloved of the Lord. I was born unto Jacob as his fifth son, as a reward for the dudame. Reuben brought the dudame from the field. They were fragrant apples, which grew in the land of Haran upon an eminence below a gully. Rachel met Reuben, and she took the dudame away from him. The lad wept, and his cries brought his mother Leah to his side, and she addressed Rachel thus, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken away my husband? And wouldst thou take away my son's dudame also? And Rachel says, See, Jacob shall be thine tonight for thy son's due dame. But Leah insisted, Jacob is mine, and I am the wife of his youth, whereupon Rachel, be not boastful and overweening. To me he was betrothed first, and for my sake he served our father fourteen years. Thou art not his wife, thou wast taken to him by cunning instead of me, for our father deceived me, and put me out of the way the night of thy nuptials so that Jacob could not see me. Nevertheless, give me the dudame, and thou mayest have Jacob for a night. Then Leah bore me, and I was called Issachar, on account of the reward Rachel had given to my mother. At that time an angel of the Lord appeared to Jacob, and he spoke, Rachel will bear only two sons, for she rejected the espousal of her husband, and chose continence. But Leah bore six sons, for the Lord knew that she desired to be with her husband, not because she was prompted by the evil inclination, but for the sake of children. Rachel's prayer also was fulfilled, on account of the dudame, for although she desired to eat of the apples, she did not touch them, but put them in the house of the Lord, and gave them to the priest of the Most High that was in those days. When I grew up, my children, I walked in the integrity of my heart, and I became a husbandman, cultivating the land for my father and my brethren, and I gathered the fruit from the fields in their due time. My father blessed me, because he saw that I walked in singleness of heart. I was not married to a wife until I was thirty years old, for the hard work I did consumed my strength, and I had no desire unto woman, but, overwhelmed by fatigue, I would sink into sleep. My father was well pleased at all times with my rectitude. If my work was crowned with good results, I brought the first fruits of my labor to the priest of the Lord, the next harvest went to my father, and then I thought of myself. The Lord doubled the possessions in my hand, and Jacob knew that God aided me for the sake of my singleness of heart, for in my sincerity I gave of the produce of the land to the poor and the needy. And now hearken unto me, my children, and walk in singleness of heart, for upon it resteth the favor of the Lord at all times. The simple man longeth not for gold, he doth not defraud his neighbor, he hath no desire for meats and dainties of many kinds, he careth not for sumptuous dress, he hoppeth not for long life, he waiteth only upon the will of God. The spirits of deception have no power over him, for he looketh not upon the beauty of woman, lest he defile his understanding with corruption. Jealousy cometh not unto his thoughts, envy doth not sear his soul an insatiable greed doth not make him look abroad for rich gain. Now, then, my children, observe the law of the Lord, attain to simplicity, and walk in singleness of heart, without meddling with the affairs of others. Love the Lord and love your neighbors, have pity upon the poor and the feeble, bow your backs to till the ground, occupy yourselves with work upon the land, and bring gifts unto the Lord in gratitude. For the Lord hath blessed you with the best of the fruits of the field, 
as he hath blessed all the saints from Abel down to our day. No, my children, that in the latter time your sons will abandon the paths of probity, and will be ruled by greed. They will forsake rectitude and practice craft, they will depart from the commands of the Lord and follow after Belial. they will give up husbandry and pursue their evil plans, they will be scattered among the heathen and serve their enemies. Tell this unto your children, so that, if they sin, they may repent speedily, and return to the Lord, for he is merciful, and he will take them out to bring them back unto their land. I am 122 years old, and I can discern no sin in myself. Save my wife, I have known no woman. I was guilty of no unchastity through the lifting up of eyes. I drank no wine, that I might not be led astray, I did not covet what belonged to my neighbor, guile had no place in my heart, lies did not pass my lips. I sighed along with all that were heavy laden, and to the poor I gave my bread. I loved the Lord with all my might, and mankind I also loved. Do ye likewise, my children, and all the spirits of Belial will flee from you, no deed done by the wicked will have power over you, and ye will vanquish all the wild beasts, for ye have with you the Lord of heaven. And Issachar bade his children carry him up to Hebron, and bury him there by his fathers in the cave, and he stretched out his feet, and fell into the sleep of eternity, full of years, healthy of limb, and in the possession of all his faculties. Zebulun exhorts unto compassion. When Zebulun attained the age of 114 years, which was two years after the death of Joseph, he called his sons together, and admonished them, in these words, to lead a life of piety, I am Zebulun, a precious gift for my parents, for when I was born, my father became very rich, by means of the street rods, in herds of sheep and herds of cattle. I am conscious of no sin in me, and I remember no wrong done by me unless it be the unwitting sin committed against Joseph, in that I did not, out of consideration for my brethren, disclose to my father what had happened to his favorite son, though in secret I mourned exceedingly. I feared my brethren, because they had agreed that he who betrayed the secret should be slain with the sword. When they planned to kill Joseph, I besought them amid tears not to sin thus. And now, my children, hearken unto me. I exhort you to observe the commands of the Lord, and have mercy upon your neighbors, and act compassionately, not only toward men, but also toward dumb brutes. For on account of my mercifulness the Lord blessed me. All my brethren fell sick at one time or another, but I escaped without any illness. Also the sons of my brethren had to endure disease, and they were nigh unto death for the sake of Joseph, because they had no pity in their hearts. But my sons were preserved in perfect health as ye well know. And when I was in Canaan, catching fish at the shores of the sea for my father Jacob, many were drowned in the waters of the sea, but I came away unharmed. For ye must know that I was the first to build a boat for rowing upon the sea, and I plied along the coast in it, and caught fish for my father's household, until we went down into Egypt. Out of pity I would share my hull with the poor stranger, and if he was sick or well on in years, I would prepare a savory dish for him, and I gave unto each according to his needs, sympathizing with him in his distress and having pity upon him. Therefore the Lord brought numerous fish to my nets, for he that gives what to his neighbor, receives it back from the Lord with great increase. For five years I fished in the summer, and in the winter I postured the flocks with my brethren. Now, my children, have pity and compassion on all men, that the Lord may have pity and compassion on you. For in the measure in which man has mercy with his fellow men, God has mercy with him. When we came down into Egypt, Joseph did not visit upon us the wrong he had suffered. Take him as your model, and remember not a wrong done unto you, else unity is rent asunder, and the bonds of kinship are torn, and the soul is disquieted. Observe the water. If it runs on undivided, it carries down stone, wood, and sand along with it. But if it is divided and flows through many channels, the earth sucks it up, and it loses its force. If you separate, one from the other, you will be like divided waters. Be not cleft into two heads, for all that the Lord hath made has but one head. He has given two shoulders unto his creatures, two hands, and two feet, but all these organs obey one head. 
Zebulun ended his exhortation unto unity with an account of the divisions in Israel, whereof he had read in the writings of the fathers, that they would come about in future days, and bring sore suffering upon Israel. However, he spoke encouraging words to his children, saying, Be not grieved over my death, and do not lose heart at my departure from you, for I shall arise again in the midst of you, and I shall live joyously among the people of my tribe, those who observe the law of the Lord. As for the godless, the Lord will bring everlasting fire down upon them, and exterminate them unto all generations. Now I hasten hence unto my eternal rest with my fathers. But ye, fear ye the Lord your God with all your might all the days of your life. Having made an end of saying these words, he sank into the sleep of death, and his sons put him into a coffin, wherein they carried him up to Hebron later, to bury him there next to his fathers. Dan's Confession When Dan assembled his family at the last of his life, he spake, I confess before you this day, my children, that I had resolved to kill Joseph, that good and upright man, and I rejoiced over his sale, for his father loved him more than he loved the rest of us. The spirit of envy and boastfulness goaded me on, saying, Thou, too, art the son of Jacob, and one of the spirits of Barah stirred me up, saying, Take the sword and slay Joseph, for once he is dead thy father will love thee. It was the spirit of anger that was seeking to persuade me to crush Joseph, as a leopard crunches a kid between its teeth. But the God of our father Jacob did not deliver him into my hand, to let me find him alone, and he did not permit me to execute this impious deed, that two tribes in Israel might not be destroyed. And now, my children, I am about to die, and I tell it unto you in truth. If you take not heed against the spirit of lies and anger, and if ye love not truth and generosity, ye will perish. The spirit of anger casts the net of error round its victim, and it blinds his eyes, and the spirit of lies warps his mind, and clouds his vision. Evil is anger, it is the grave of the soul. Desist from anger and hate lies, that the Lord may dwell among you, and bear a flee from your presence. Speak the truth each unto his neighbor and you will not fall into anger and trouble, but you will be at peace, and the Lord of peace you will have with you, and no war will vanquish you. I speak thus, for I know that in the latter days you will fall off from God, and you will kindle the wrath of Levi, and rise in rebellion against Judah, but you will not accomplish aught against them, for the angel of the Lord is their guide, and Israel will perish through them. And if you turn recreant to the Lord, you will execute every kind of evil thing, and do the abominations of the heathen, committing unchastity with the wives of the godless, while the tempter spirits are at work among you. Therefore you will be carried away into captivity, and in the land of exile you will suffer all the plagues of Egypt and all the tribulations of the heathen. But when you return to the Lord, you will find mercy. He will take you into his sanctuary, and grant you peace. And now, my children, fear the Lord, and be on your guard against Satan and his spirits keep aloof from every evil deed, cast anger away from you in every sort of lie, love truth and forbearance, and what ye have heard from your father, tell unto your children. Avoid all manner of unrighteousness, cling to the integrity of the law of the Lord, and bury me near my fathers. Having spoken these words, he kissed his children, and fell asleep. Naphtali's Dreams of the Division of the Tribes In the hundred and thirty-second year of his life, Naphtali invited all his children to a banquet. The next morning when he awoke, he told them that he was dying, but they would not believe him. He, however, praised the Lord, and assured them again that his death was due after the banquet of the day before. Then he addressed his last words to his children. I was born of Bilhah, and because Rachel had acted with cunning, and had given Jacob Bilhah instead of herself, I was called Naphtali. Rachel loved me for I was born upon her knees, and while I was still very young, she was in the habit of kissing me and saying, Oh that I had a brother unto thee from mine own body, one in thine image. Therefore Joseph resembled me in all respects, in accordance with Rachel's prayer. My mother Bilhah was a daughter of Rothius, a brother of Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, and she was born the same day as Rachel. As for Rothius, he was of the family of Abraham, a Chaldean. God-fearing, and a free man of noble birth, and when he was taken captive, 
he was bought by Laban and married to his slave Anna. She bore Rothius a daughter, and he called her Zilpah, after the name of the village in which he was taken captive. His second daughter he called Bilhah, saying, My daughter is impetuous, for hardly was she born when she hastened to suckle. I was fleet a foot like a deer, and my father Jacob appointed me to be his messenger, and in his blessing he called me a hind let loose. As the potter knows the vessel he fashions, how much it is to hold, and uses clay accordingly, so the Lord makes the body in conformity with the soul, and to agree with the capacity of the body he plans the soul. The one corresponds to the other down to the third of a hair breadth, for the whole of creation was made by weight, in measure, and rule. And as the potter knows the use of every vessel he fashions, so the Lord knows the body of his creature, unto what point it will be steadfast in the good, and at what point it will fall into evil ways. Now, then, my children, let your conduct be well ordered unto good in the fear of God, do not that is ill regulated or untimely, for though ye tell your right to hear, it yet cannot, and as little can ye do deeds of light while you abide in darkness. Furthermore Naphtali said unto his children, I give you no command concerning my silver, or my gold, or any other possession that I have bequeathed to you. And what I command you is not a hard matter, which you cannot do, but I speak unto you concerning an easy thing, which you can execute. Then his sons answered, and said, Speak, farther, for we are listening to thy words. Naphtali continued, I give you no commandment except regarding the fear of God that you should serve him and follow after him. Then the sons of Naphtali asked, Wherefore does he require our service? And he replied, saying, He needs no creature, but all creatures need him. Nevertheless he hath not created the world for naught, but that men should fear him, and none should do unto his neighbor what he would not have others do unto him. His sons asked again, Father, hast thou observed that we strayed from the ways of the Lord to the right or to the left? Naphtali replied, God is witness, and so am I witness for you, that it is as you say. But I fear regarding future times, that you may depart from the ways of the Lord, and follow after the idols of the stranger, and walk in the statutes of the heathen peoples, and join yourselves unto the sons of Joseph instead of the sons of Levi and Judah. The sons of Naphtali spoke, What reason hast thou for commanding this thing unto us? Naphtali because I know that the sons of Joseph will one day turn recreant to the Lord, the God of their fathers, and it is they that will lead the sons of Israel into sin, and cause them to be driven away from their inheritance, their beautiful land, to a land that is not ours, even as it was Joseph that brought the Egyptian bondage down upon us. I will tell ye, my children, the vision I had while I was yet a shepherd of flocks. I saw my brethren posturing the herds with me. And our father approached, and said, Up, my sons, each one take what he can in my presence. We answered, and said to him, What shall we take? We see nothing but the sun, the moon, and the stars. Then our father said, These shall ye take. Levi, hearing this, snatched up an ox goad, sprang up to the sun, sat upon him, and rode. Judah did likewise. He jumped up to the moon, and rode upon her. And the other nine tribes did the same, each wrote upon his star or his planet in the heavens. Joseph remained behind alone on the earth, and our father Jacob said to him, My son, why hast thou not done like thy brethren? Joseph answered, What right have men born of woman to be in the heavens, seeing that in the end they must stay on earth? While Joseph was speaking thus, a tall stir appeared before him. He had great pinions like the wings of the stork and his horns were as long as those of the reem. Jacob urged his son, Up, Joseph, mount the steer. Joseph did as his father bade him, and Jacob went his way. For the space of two hours Joseph displayed himself upon the steer, sometimes galloping, sometimes flying, until he reached Judah. Then Joseph unfolded the standard in his hand, and began to rain blows down upon Judah with it, and when his brother demanded the reason for this treatment, he said, Because thou hast twelve rods in thine hand, and I have but one. Give thine to me, and peace shall prevail between us. But Judah refused to do his bidding, and Joseph beat him until he dropped ten rods, and only two remained in his clutch. 
Joseph now invited his brethren to abandon Judah and follow after him. They all did thus, except Benjamin, who stayed true to Judah. Levi was grieved over the desertion of Judah, and he descended from the sun. Toward the end of the day a storm broke out, and it scattered the brethren, so that no two were together. When I gave an account of my vision to my father Jacob, he said, It is but a dream, it can neither help nor harm. A short while thereafter another vision was revealed to me. I saw all of us together with our father at the shores of the sea, and a ship appeared in the midst of the sea, and it had neither sailors nor other crew. Our father spake, Do you see what I see? And when we answered that we did, he commanded us to follow him. He took off his clothes, and sprang into the sea, and we sprang after him. Levi and Judah were the first to scale the side of the ship. Our father cried after them, See what is written upon the mast, for there is no ship that does not bear the name of the owner upon the mast. Levi and Judah scrutinized the writing, and what they read was this, This ship and all the treasures therein belong unto the son of Barashal. Jacob thanked God for having blessed him, not only on land, but also upon the sea, and he said to us, Stretch forth your hands, and whatsoever each one sees as shall be his. Levi caught hold of the big mast, Judah of the second mast, next to Levi's, and the other brethren, with the exception of Joseph, took the oars, and Jacob himself seized the two rudders, wherewith to guide the ship. He bade Joseph take an oar, too, but he refused to do his father's bidding, and Jacob gave him one of the rudders. After our father had instructed us each one in what we had to do, he disappeared, whereupon Joseph took possession of the second rudder, too. All went smoothly for a time, as long as Judah and Joseph acted together in harmony with each other, and Judah kept Joseph informed in what direction to steer. But a quarrel broke out between them, and Joseph did not guide the vessel in the way his father had commanded him, and Judah attempted to direct him, and the vessel was wrecked upon a rock. Levi and Judah descended from the masts, and likewise the other brethren left the ship and escaped to the shore. At this moment Jacob appeared, and he found us scattered in all directions, and we reported to him how Joseph had caused the vessel to run aground, because he had refused, out of jealousy of Judah and Levi, to steer it according to their instructions. Then Jacob asked us to show him the spot where we had lost the ship, of which only the masts were visible above the water. He emitted a whistle summoning us all, and he swam out into the water, and raised the vessel as before. Turning to Joseph, he spake thus, My son, never do that again, never permit jealousy of thy brethren to master thee. Nearly it happened that all thy brethren perished because of thee. When I told my father what I had seen in this vision, he clasped his hands, and tears flowed from his eyes, and he said, My son, for that the vision was deviled unto thee twice. I am dismayed, and I shudder for my son Joseph. I loved him more than all of you, but by reason of his perverseness ye will be carried away into captivity, and scattered among the nations. Thy first and thy second vision have the same meaning, the vision is one. Therefore, my sons, I command you not to join yourselves unto the sons of Joseph, but ye shall join yourselves unto the sons of Levi and Judah. I tell you, too that my inheritance shall be of the best of Palestine, the middle of the earth. You will eat, and the delectable gifts of my portion will satisfy you. But I warn you not to kick in your prosperity and not to become perverse, resisting the commands of God, who satisfies you with the best of his land, and not to forget your God, whom your father Abraham chose when the families of the earth were divided in the days of Peleg. The Lord descended with seventy angels, at their head Michael, and he commanded them to teach the seventy languages unto the seventy families of Noah. The angels did according to the behest of God, and the holy Hebrew language remained only in the house of Shem and Eber, and in the house of their descendant Abraham. On this day of teaching languages, Michael came to each nation separately, and told it the message with which God had charged him, saying, I know the rebellion and the confusion ye have enacted against God. Now, Make choice of him whom you will serve, and whom will you have as your mediator in heaven. Then spake Nimrod the wicked, In my eyes there is none greater than he that taught me the language of Cush. The other nations also answered in words like these, Each one designated its angel. But Abraham said, 
I choose none other than him that spake and the world was. In him I will have faith, and my seed forever and ever. Thenceforth God put every nation in the care of its angel, but Abraham and his seed he kept for himself. Therefore I adjure you not to go astray and serve other gods beside him whom our fathers made choice of. You can perceive somewhat of his power in the creation of man. From head to foot is man wonderfully made. With his ears he hears, with his eyes he sees, with his brain he comprehends, with his nose he smells, with the tubes of his throat he utters sounds, with his gullet he swallows food, with his tongue he articulates, with his mouth he forms words, with his hands he does his work, with his heart he meditates, with his spleen he laughs, with his liver he waxes angry, with his stomach he crushes his food, with his feet he walks, with his lungs he breathes, and with his kidneys he makes resolves, and none of his organs undergoes a change in function, each performs its own. Therefore it behooves man to take to heart who it is that hath created him, and who hath developed him from a foul-smelling drop in the womb of woman, who hath brought him to the light of the world, who hath given sight to his eyes, and who hath bestowed the power of motion upon his feet, who maketh him to stand upright, who hath infused the breath of life into him, and who hath imparted of his own pure spirit unto him. Happy the man, therefore, that polluteth not the Holy Spirit of God within him by doing evil deeds, and well for him if he returns it to his Creator as he received it. After Naphtali had charged his children thus, and with many other lessons like these, he enjoined them to carry his remains to Hebron, to be buried there near his fathers. Then he ate and drank with rejoicing, covered his face, and died, and his sons did according to all that their father Naphtali had commanded them. Gad's Hatred in the hundred and twenty-fifth year of his life Gad assembled his sons, and he spake to them, I am the ninth son of Jacob, and I was a valiant shepherd of the flocks. I guarded the herds, and when a lion or any other wild beast approached, I pursued it, gripped it by the foot, flung it a stone's throw from me, and killed it thus. Once, for a space of thirty days, Joseph tended the flocks with us, and when he returned to our father, he told him that the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah slaughtered the best of the herds, and used the flesh without the knowledge of Reuben and Judah. He had seen me snatch a lamb out of the jaws of a bear, kill the bear, and slaughter the lamb, for it was too badly injured to live. I was wroth with Joseph for his talibaring, until he was sold into Egypt. I would neither look upon him nor hear aught about him, for to our very faces he, blamed us because we had eaten the lamb without seeking the permission of Judah first. And whatever Joseph told our father, he believed. Now I confess my sin, that oft times I longed to kill him, for I hated him from the bottom of my heart, and on account of his dreams I hated him still more, and I desired to destroy him from off the land of the living. But Judah sold him by stealth to the Ishmaelites. Thus the God of our father saved him out of our hands, and he did not permit us to commit an abominable outrage in Israel. Hear now, my children, the words of truth, that ye may practice justice in the whole law of the Most High, and permit yourselves not to be tempted by the spirit of hatred. Evil is hatred, for it is the constant companion of deception, it always contradicts the truth. A little thing it magnifies into a great thing, light it takes for darkness, the sweet it calls bitter, and it teaches slander, enkindles anger brings on war and violence, and fills the heart with devilish poison. I tell you my own experience, my children, that ye may drive hatred out of your hearts, and cleave to the love of the Lord. Righteousness banishes hatred, and humility kills it, for he that fears to give umbrage to the Lord, desires not to do wrong even in his thoughts. This is what I recognized at the last, after I had done penance on account of Joseph, for true atonement, pleasing to God, enlightens the eyes, illumines the soul with knowledge, and creates a counsel of salvation. My penance came in consequence of a sickness of the liver that God inflicted upon me. Without the prayers of my father Jacob, my spirit would have departed from me, for through the organ wherewith man transgresses, he is punished. As my liver had felt no mercy for Joseph, unmerciful suffering was caused unto me by my liver. My judgment lasted eleven months, as long as my enmity toward Joseph. And now, my children, each of you shall love his brother, and ye shall uproot hatred from your hearts by loving one another in word and deed and the thoughts of the soul. 
For I spake peaceably with Joseph in the presence of our father, but when I went out from before him, the spirit of hatred darkened my understanding, and stirred up my soul to murder him. If you see one that hath more good fortune than you, do not grieve, but pray for him, that his happiness may be perfect, and if one of the wicked even should grow rich in substance, like Esau, my father's brother, do not envy him. Wait for the end of the Lord. This also tell unto your children, that they shall honor Judah and Levi, for from them the Lord will cause a Savior to arise unto Israel. For I know that in the end your children will fall off from God, and they will take part in all wickedness, malice, and corruptness, before the Lord. After Gad had rested a little while, he spake again, My children, hearken unto your father, and bury me with my fathers. Then he drew up his feet, and slept in peace. After five years, his sons carried his remains to Hebron unto his fathers. Asher's Last Words In the hundred and twenty-fifth year of his life, while he was still robust in health, Asher summoned his children unto him, and admonished them to walk in the ways of virtue and the fear of God. He spake, Hearken, ye sons of Asher, unto your father, and I will show you all that is right before God. Two ways hath God put before the children of men, and two inclinations hath he bestowed upon them, two kinds of actions and two aims. Therefore all things are in twos, the one opposite to the other. But ye, my children, ye shall not be double, pursuing both goodness and wickedness. Ye shall cling only to the ways of goodness, for the Lord taketh delight in them, and men yearn after them. And flee from wickedness, for thus you will destroy the evil inclination. Heed well the commands of the Lord, by following truth with a single mind. Observe the law of the Lord, and have not the same care for wicked things as for good things. Rather keep your eyes upon what is truly good, and guard it through all the commands of the Lord. The end of man, when he meets the messengers of God and of Satan, shows whether he was righteous or unrighteous in his life. If his soul goes out with agitation, she will be plagued by the evil spirit, whom she served with her lusts and her evil deeds. But if she departs tranquilly, the angel of peace will lead her to life eternal. Be not like Sodom, my children, which recognized not the angels of the Lord, that ye be not delivered into the hands of your enemies, and your land be cursed, and your sanctuary destroyed, and you be scattered to the four corners of the earth, and scorned in the confusion like stale water, until the Most High shall visit the earth, and break the heads of the dragons in the waters. Tell this, my sons, unto your children, that they be not disobedient toward God, for I read in the tablets of the heavens that you will be contumacious and act impiously toward him, in that you will have no care for the law of God, but you will heed human laws, and they are corrupted by reason of man's godlessness. Therefore ye will be dispersed abroad like unto Gad and Dan, my brethren, and you will not know either your land, or your tribe, or your tongue. Nevertheless the Lord will gather you in his faithfulness, for the sake of his gracious mercy, and for the sake of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when he had made an end of saying these words, he commanded them to bury him in Hebron. And he sank into sweet sleep, and died. His sons did as he had commanded, and they carried him up and buried him with his fathers. Benjamin extols Joseph. Benjamin was 125 years old, and he called his children to come to him. When they appeared, he kissed them, and spake, As Isaac was born unto Abraham in his old age, so was I born unto Jacob when he was stricken in years. Therefore I was called Benjamin, the son of days. My mother Rachel died at my birth, and Bilhah her slave suckled me. Rachel had no children for twelve years after bearing Joseph. Therefore she prayed to God, and fasted twelve days, and she conceived and bare me. Our father loved Rachel fondly, and he had longed greatly to have two sons by her. When I came down to Egypt, and my brother Joseph recognized me, he asked me, What said my brethren to my father regarding me? And I told him that they had sent Jacob his coat stained with blood, and had said, Know now whether this be thy son's coat or not. And Joseph said, This is what happened to me. Canaanitish merchantmen stole me away with violence, and on the way they wanted to hide my coat, to make it seem as though a wild beast had met me and slain me. But he who was about to conceal it, was torn by a lion, 
whereupon his companions, in great fear, sold me to the Ishmaelites. My brethren, thou seest, did not deceive my father with a lie. In this wise Joseph tried to keep the deed of our brethren a secret from me. He also summoned my brethren, and enjoined them not to make known to our father what they had done to him, and bade them repeat the tale he had told me. Now, my children, love ye the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, and observe his commandments, taking that good and pious man Joseph as your model. Until the day of his death he would not have divulged what his brethren had done to him, and although God revealed their action to Jacob, he continued to deny it. Only after many efforts, when Jacob adjured him to confess the truth, he was induced to speak out. Even then he besought our father Jacob to pray for our brethren, that God account not the evil they had done to him as a sin. And Jacob exclaimed, O my good child Joseph, thou hast shown thyself more merciful than I was. My children, have you observed the mercy of the good man? Imitate it with pure intention, that ye, too, may wear crowns of glory. A good man has not an envious eye, he has mercy with all, even with sinners, though their evil designs be directed against him, and by his good deeds he conquers the evil, since it was ordained of God. If you do good, the unclean spirits will depart from you, and even the wild beasts will stand in fear of you. The inclination of a good man lies not in the power of the tempter spirit bearer, for the angel of peace guides his soul. Flee before the malice of the liar whose sword is drawn to slay all that pay him obedience, and his sword is the mother of seven evils, bloodshed, corruptness, error, captivity, hunger, panic, and devastation. Therefore God surrendered Cain to seven punishments. Once in a hundred years the Lord brought a castigation upon him. His afflictions began when he was two hundred years old, and in his nine hundredth year he was destroyed by the deluge, for having slain his righteous brother Abel and those who are like unto Cain will be chastised forever with the same punishments as his. Know now, my children, that I am about to die. Practice truth and righteousness, and observe the law of the Lord and also his commandments. This I bequeath unto you as your sole heritage, and you shall leave it to your children as an eternal possession. Thus Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did, they transmitted it unto us, saying, Observe the commands of God until the Lord shall reveal his salvation in the sight of all the heathen. Then you will see Enoch, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob rise up with rejoicing to new life at the right hand of God, and we brethren, the sons of Jacob, will arise also, each of us at the head of his tribe, and we will pay homage to the King of the heavens. After Benjamin had made an end of speaking thus, he said, I command you, my children, to carry my bones up out of Egypt and bury me near my father's. And when he had made an end of saying these things, he fell asleep at a good old age, and they put his body into a coffin, and in the ninety-first year of their sojourning in Egypt, his sons and the sons of his brethren brought up the bones of their father, in secret, and buried them in Hebron, at the feet of their fathers. Then they returned from the land of Canaan, and they dwelt in Egypt until the day of the exodus from the land. Job. Job and the Patriarchs Job, the most pious Gentile that ever lived, one of the few to bear the title of honor the servant of God, was of double kin to Jacob. He was a grandson of Jacob's brother Esau, and at the same time the son-in-law of Jacob himself, for Lai had married Dinah as his second wife. He was entirely worthy of being a member of the Patriarch's family, for he was perfectly upright, one that feared God, and eschewed evil. Had he not wavered in his resignation to the divine will during the great trial to which he was subjected, and murmured against God, the distinction would have been conferred upon him of having his name joined to the name of God in prayer, and man would have called upon the God of Job as they now call upon the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he was not found steadfast like the three fathers, and he forfeited the honor God had intended for him. The Lord remonstrated with him for his lack of patience saying, Why didst thou murmur when suffering came upon thee? Dost thou think thyself of greater worth than Adam, the creation of mine own hands, upon whom together with his descendants I decree death on account of a single transgression? And yet Adam murmured not. Thou art surely not more worthy than Abraham, 
whom I tempted with many trials, and when he asked, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit the land? And I replied, Know of a surety that thy seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years, he yet murmured not. Thou dost not esteem thyself more worthy than Moses, dost thou? Him I would not grant the favor of entering the promised land, because he spake the words, Hear now, ye rebels. Shall we bring you forth water out of this rock? And yet he murmured not. Art thou more worthy than Aaron, unto whom I showed greater honor than unto any created being, for I sent the angels themselves out of the Holy of Holies when he entered the place? Yet when his two sons died, he murmured not. The contrast between Job and the patriarchs appears from words spoken by him and words spoken by Abraham. Addressing God, Abraham said, That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that so the righteous should be as the wicked, and Job exclaimed against God, It is all one. Therefore I say, He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. They both received their due recompense, Abraham was rewarded and Job was punished. Convinced that his suffering was undeserved and unjust, Job had the audacity to say to God, O Lord of the world, Thou didst create the ox with cloven feet and the ass with unparted hoof, Thou hast created paradise and hell, Thou createst the righteous and also the wicked. There is none to hinder, Thou canst do as seemeth good in Thy sight. The friends of Job replied, It is true, God hath created the evil inclination, but He hath also given man the Torah as a remedy against it. Therefore the wicked cannot roll their guilt from off their shoulders and put it upon God. The reason Job did not shrink from such extravagant utterances was because he denied the resurrection of the dead. He judged of the prosperity of the wicked and the woes of the pious only by their earthly fortunes. Proceeding from this false premise, he held it to be possible that the punishment falling to his share was not at all intended for him. God had slipped into an error, he imposed the suffering upon him that had been appointed unto a sinner. But God spake to him, saying, Many hairs have I created upon the head of man, yet each hair hath its own sack, for were two hairs to draw their nourishment from the same sack, man would lose the sight of his eyes. It hath never happened that a sack hath been misplaced. Should I, then, have mistaken Job for another? I let many drops of rain descend from the heavens, and for each drop there is a mold in the clouds, for were two drops to issue from the same mold, the ground would be made so miry that it could not bring forth any growth. It hath never happened that a mold hath been misplaced. Should I, then, have mistaken Job for another? Many thunderbolts I hurl from the skies, but each one comes from its own path, for were two to proceed from the same path, they would destroy the whole world. It hath never happened that a path hath been misplaced. Should I, then, have mistaken Job for another? The gazelle gives birth to her young on the topmost point of a rock, and it would fall into the abyss and be crushed to death, if I did not send an eagle thither to catch it up and carry it to its mother. Were the eagle to appear a minute earlier or later than the appointed time, the little gazelle would perish. It hath never happened that the proper minute of time was missed. Should I, then, have mistaken Job for another? The hind has a contracted womb, and would not be able to bring forth her young, if I did not send a dragon to her at the right second, to nibble at her womb and soften it, for then she can bear. Were the dragon to come a second before or after the right time, the hind would perish. It hath never happened that I missed the right second. Should I, then, have mistaken Job for another? Notwithstanding Job's unpardonable words, God was displeased with his friends for passing harsh judgment upon him. A man may not be held responsible for what he does in his anguish, and Job's agony was great, indeed. Job's Wealth and Benefactions Job was asked once what he considered the severest affliction that could strike him, and he replied, My enemy's joy and my misfortune, and when God demanded to know of him, after the accusations made by Satan, what he preferred, poverty or physical suffering, he chose pain, saying, O Lord of the whole world, chastise my body with suffering of all kinds, only preserve me from poverty. Poverty seemed the greater scourge, because before his trials he had occupied a brilliant position on account of his vast wealth. 
God graciously granted him this foretaste of the messianic time. The harvest followed close upon the plowing of his field. No sooner were the seeds strewn in the furrows, than they sprouted and grew and ripened produce. He was equally successful with his cattle. His sheep killed wolves, but were themselves never harmed by wild beasts. Of sheep he had no less than 130,000, and he required 800 dogs to keep guard over them, not to mention the 200 dogs needed to secure the safety of his house. Besides, his herds consisted of 340,000 asses and 3,500 pairs of oxen. All these possessions were not used for self-indulgent pleasures, but for the good of the poor and the needy, whom he clothed, and fed, and provided with all things necessary. To do all this, he even had to employ ships that carried supplies to all the cities and the dwelling places of the destitute. His house was furnished with doors on all its four sides, that the poor and the wayfarer might enter, no matter from what direction they approached. At all times there were thirty tables laden with viands ready in his house, and twelve besides for widows only, so that all who came found what they desired. Job's consideration for the poor was so delicate that he kept servants to wait upon them constantly. His guests, enraptured by his charitableness, frequently offered themselves as attendants to minister to the poor in his house, but Job always insisted upon paying them for their services. If he was asked for a loan of money, to be used for business purposes, and the borrower promised to give a part of his profits to the poor, he would demand no security beyond a mere signature. And if it happened that by some missions or other the debtor was not able to discharge his obligation, Job would return the note to him, or tear it into bits in his presence. He did not rest satisfied at supplying the material needs of those who applied to him. He strove also to convey the knowledge of God to them. After a meal he was in the habit of having music played upon instruments, and then he would invite those present to join him in songs of praise to God. On such occasions he did not consider himself above playing the cithern while the musicians rested. Most particularly Job concerned himself about the will and woe of widows and orphans. He was wont to pay visits to the sick, both rich and poor, and when it was necessary, he would bring a physician along with him. If the case turned out to be hopeless, he would sustain the stricken family with advice and consolation. When the wife of the incurably sick man began to grieve and weep, he would encourage her with such words as these, Trust always in the grace and love and kindness of God. He hath not abandoned thee until now, and he will not forsake thee henceforth. Thy husband will be restored to health, and will be able to provide for his family as heretofore. But if, which may God forfend, thy husband should die, I call heaven to witness that I shall provide sustenance for thee and thy children. Having spoken thus, he would send for a notary, and have him draw up a document, which he signed in the presence of witnesses, binding himself to care for the family, should it be bereaved of its head. Thus he earned for himself the blessing of the sick man and the gratitude of the sorrowing wife. Sometimes, in case of necessity, Job could be severe, too especially when it was a question of helping a poor man obtain his due. If one of the parties to a suit cited before his tribunal was known to be a man of violence, he would surround himself with his army and inspire him with fear, so that the culprit could not but show himself amenable to his decision. He endeavored to inculcate his benevolent ways upon his children, by accustoming them to wait upon the poor. On the morrow after a feast he would sacrifice bountifully to God and together with the pieces upon the altar his offerings would be divided among the needy. He would say, Take and help yourselves, and pray for my children. It may be that they have sinned, and renounced God, saying in the presumption of their hearts, We are the children of this rich man. All these things are our possessions. Why should we be servants to the poor? Satan and Job The happy God-pleasing life led by Job for many years excited the hatred of Satan, who had an old grudge against him. Near Job's house there was an idol worship by the people. Suddenly doubts assailed the heart of Job, and he asked himself, Is this idol really the creator of heaven and earth? How can I find out the truth about it? In the following night he perceived a voice calling, Jobab. Jobab. Arise, and I will tell thee who he is whom thou desirest to know. This one to whom the people offer sacrifices is not God, 
he is the handiwork of the tempter, wherewith he deceives men. When he heard the voice, Job threw himself on the ground, and said, O Lord, if this idol is the handiwork of the tempter, then grant that I may destroy it. None can hinder me, for I am the king of this land. Job, or, as he is sometimes called, Jobab, was, indeed, king of Edom, the land wherein wicked plans are concocted against God, wherefore it is called also as, counsel. The voice continued to speak. It made itself known as that of an archangel of God, and revealed to Job that he would bring down the enmity of Satan upon himself by the destruction of the idol, and much suffering with it. However, if he remained steadfast under them, God would change his troubles into joys, his name would become celebrated throughout the generations of mankind, and he would have a share in the resurrection to eternal life. Job replied to the voice, Out of love of God I am ready to endure all things unto the day of my death. I will shrink back from naught. Now Job arose, and accompanied by fifty men he repaired to the idol, and destroyed it. Knowing that Satan would try to approach him, he ordered his guard not to give access to any one, and then he withdrew to his chamber. He had guessed aright. Satan appeared at once, in the guise of a beggar, and demanded speech with Job. The guard executed his orders, and forbade his entering. Then the mendicant asked him to intercede for him with Job for a piece of bread. Job knew it was Satan, and he sent word to him as follows, Do not expect to eat of my bread, for it is prohibited unto thee, at the same time putting a piece of burnt bread into the hand of the guard for Satan. The servant was ashamed to give a beggar burnt bread, and he substituted a good piece for it. Satan, however, knowing that the servant had not executed his master's errand, told him so to his face, and he fetched the burnt bread and handed it to him, repeating the words of Job. Thereupon Satan returned this answer, As the bread is burnt, so I will disfigure thy body. Job replied, Do as thou desirest, and execute thy plan. As for me, I am ready to suffer whatever thou bringest down upon me. Now Satan betook himself to God and prayed him to put Job into his power, saying, I went to and fro in the earth, and walked up and down in it, and I saw no man as pious as Abraham. Thou didst promise him the whole land of Palestine, and yet he did not take it in ill part that he had not so much as a burial place for Sarah. As for Job, it is true, I found none that love thee as he does, but if thou wilt put him into my hand, I shall succeed in turning his heart away from thee. But God spake, Satan, Satan, what hast thou a mind to do with my servant Job, like whom there is none in the earth? Satan persisted in his request touching Job, and God granted it, he gave him full power over Job's possessions. This day of Job's accusation was the New Year's Day, whereon the good and the evil deeds of man are brought before God. Job's Suffering Equipped with unlimited power, Satan endeavored to deprive Job of all he owned. He burnt part of his cattle, and the other part was carried off by enemies. What pained Job more than this was that recipients of his bounty turned against him, and took of his belongings. Among the adversaries that assailed him was Lilith, the queen of Sheba. She lived at a great distance from his residence, it took her and her army three years to travel from her home to his. She fell upon his oxen and his asses, and took possession of them after slaying the men to whose care Job had entrusted them. One man escaped alone. Wounded and bruised, he had only enough life in him to tell Job the tale of his losses, and then he fell down dead. The sheep, which had been left unmolested by the Queen of Sheba, were taken away by the Chaldeans. Job's first intention was to go to war against these marauders, but when he was told that some of his property had been consumed by fire from heaven, he desisted, and said, if the heavens turn against me, I can do nothing. Dissatisfied with the result, Satan disguised himself as the king of Persia, besieged the city of Job's residence, took it, and spoke to the inhabitants, saying, This man Job hath appropriated all the goods in the world, leaving not for others, and he hath also torn down the temple of our God, and now I will pay him back for his wicked deeds. Come with me and let us pillage his house. At first the people refused to hearken to the words of Satan. They feared that the sons and daughters of Job might rise up against them later, and avenge their father's wrongs. 
But after Satan had pulled down the house wherein the children of Job were assembled, and they lay dead in the ruins, the people did as he bade them, and sacked the house of Job. Seeing that neither the loss of all he had nor the death of his children could change his pious heart, Satan appeared before God a second time, and requested that Job himself, his very person, be put into his hand. God granted Satan's plea, but he limited his power to Job's body, his soul he could not touch. In a sense Satan was worse off than Job. He was in the position of the slave that has been ordered by his master to break the pitcher and not spill the wine. Satan now caused a terrific storm to burst over the house of Job. He was cast from his throne by the reverberations, and he lay upon the floor for three hours. Then Satan smote his body with leprosy from the sole of his foot unto his crown. This plague forced Job to leave the city, and sit down outside upon an ash heap, for his lower limbs were covered with oozing boils, and the issue flowed out upon the ashes. The upper part of his body was encrusted with dry boils, and to ease the itching they caused him, he used his nails, until they dropped off together with his fingertips, and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal. His body swarmed with vermin, but if one of the little creatures attempted to crawl away from him, he forced it back, saying, Remain on the place whither thou wast set, until God assigns another unto thee. His wife fearful that he would not bear his horrible suffering with steadfastness, advised him to pray to God for death, that lie might be sure of going hence an upright man. But he rejected her counsel, saying, If in the days of good fortune, which usually tempts men to deny God, I stood firm, and did not rebel against him, surely I shall be able to remain steadfast under misfortune, which compels men to be obedient to God. And Job stuck to his resolve in spite of all suffering while his wife was not strong enough to bear her fate with resignation to the will of God. Her lot was bitter, indeed, for she had had to take service as a water carrier with a common churl, and when her master learnt that she shared her bread with Job, he dismissed her. To keep her husband from starving, she cut off her hair, and purchased bread with it. It was all she had to pay the price charged by the bread merchant, none other than Satan himself, who wanted to put her to the test. He said to her, Hadst thou not deserved this great misery of thine, it had not come upon thee. This speech was more than the poor woman could bear. Then it was that she came to her husband, and amid tears and groans urged him to renounce God and die. Job, however, was not perturbed by her words, because he divined at once that Satan stood behind his wife, and seduced her to speak thus. Turning to the tempter, he said, Why dost thou not meet me frankly? Give up thy underhand ways, thou wretch. Thereupon Satan appeared before Job, admitted that he had been vanquished, and went away abashed. The Four Friends The friends of Job lived in different places, at intervals of three hundred miles one from the other. Nevertheless they all were informed of their friend's misfortune at the same time, in this way, each one had the pictures of the other set in his crown, and as soon as any one of them met with reverses, it showed itself in this picture. Thus the friends of Job learned simultaneously of his misfortune, and they hastened to his assistance. The four friends were related to one another, and each one was related to Job. Eliphaz, king of Teman, was a son of Esau. Bildad, Zaphar, and Elihu were cousins, their fathers, Shua, Namat, and Barashal, were the sons of Buzz, who was a brother of Job and a nephew of Abraham. When the four friends arrived in the city in which Job lived, the inhabitants took them outside the gates, and pointing to a figure reclining upon an ash heap at some distance off, they said, Yonder is Job. At first the friends would not give them credence, and they decided to look more closely at the man, to make sure of his identity. But the foul smell emanating from Job was so strong that they could not come near to him. They ordered their armies to scatter perfumes and aromatic substances all around. Only after this had been done for hours, they could approach the outcast close enough to recognize him. Eliphaz was the first to address Job, Art thou indeed Job, a king equal in rank with ourselves? And when Job said I, they broke out into lamentations and bitter tears, and all together they sang an elegy, the armies of the three kings, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zaphar, joining in the choir. Again Eliphaz began to speak, and he bemoaned Job's sad fortune 
and depicted his friend's former glory, adding the refrain to each sentence, Whither hath a part of the splendor of thy throne? After listening long to the wailing and lamenting of Eliphaz and his companions, Job spake, saying, Silence, and I will show you my throne and the splendor of its glory. Kings will perish, rulers disappear, their pride and luster will pass like a shadow across a mirror, but my kingdom will persist forever and ever, for glory and magnificence are in the chariot of my father. These words aroused the wrath of Eliphaz, and he called upon his associates to abandon Job to his fate and go their way. But Bildad appeased his anger, reminding him that some allowance ought to be made for one so sorely tried as Job. Bildad put a number of questions to the sufferer in order to establish his sanity. He wanted to elicit from Job how it came about that God, upon whom he continued to set his hopes, could inflict such dire suffering. Not even a king of flesh and blood would allow a guardsman of his that had served him loyally to come to grief. Bildad desired to have information from Job also concerning the movements of the heavenly bodies. Job had but one answer to make to these questions. Man cannot comprehend divine wisdom, whether it reveal itself in inanimate and brute nature or in relation to human beings. But, continued Job, to prove to you that I am in my right mind, listen to the question I shall put to you. Solid food and liquids combine inside of man, and they separate again when they leave his body. Who effects the separation? And when Bildad conceded that he could not answer the question, Job said, if thou canst not comprehend the changes in thy body, how canst thou hope to comprehend the movements of the planets? Zafar, after Job had spoken thus to Bildad, was convinced that his suffering had had no effect upon his mind, and he asked him whether he would permit himself to be treated by the physicians of the three kings, his friends. But Job rejected the offer, saying, My healing and my restoration come from God, the Creator of all physicians. While the three kings were conversing thus with Job, his wife Zaitidos made her appearance clad in rags, and she threw herself at the feet of her husband's friends, and amid tears she spoke, saying, O Eliphaz, and ye other friends of Job, remember what I was in other days, and how I am now changed, coming before you in rags and tatters. The sight of the unhappy woman touched them so deeply that they could only weep, and not a word could they force out of their mouths. Eliphaz, however, took his royal mantle of purple, and laid it about the shoulders of the poor woman. Zaitidos asked only one favor, that the three kings should order their soldiers to clear away the ruins of the building under which her children lay entombed, that she might give their remains decent burial. The command was issued to the soldiers accordingly, but Job says, Do not put yourselves to trouble for naught. My children will not be found, for they are safely bestowed with their lord and creator. Again his friends were sure that Job was bereft of his senses. He arose, however, prayed to God, and at the end of his devotions, he bade his friends look eastward, and when they did his bidding, they beheld his children next to the ruler of heaven, with crowns of glory upon their heads. Zaitidos prostrated herself, and said, Now I know that my memorial resides with the Lord. And she returned to the house of her master, whence she had absented herself for some time against his will. He had forbidden her to leave it, because he had feared that the three kings would take her with them. In the evening she lay down to sleep next to the manger for the cattle, but she never rose again, she died there of exhaustion. The people of the city made a great mourning for her, and the elegy composed in her honor was set down in writing and recorded. Job Restored more and more the friends of Job came to the conclusion that he had incurred divine punishment on account of his sins, and as he asseverated his innocence again and again, they prepared angrily to leave him to his fate. Especially Elihu was animated by Satan to speak scurrilous words against Job, upbraiding him for his unshakable confidence in God. Then the Lord appeared to them, first unto Job, and revealed to him that Elihu was in the wrong, and his words were inspired by Satan. Next he appeared unto Eliphaz, and to him he spake thus, Thou and thy friends Bildad and Zephar have committed a sin, for ye did not speak the truth concerning my servant Job. Rise up and let him bring a sin offering for you. Only for his sake do I refrain from destroying you. The sacrifice offered by Job in behalf of his friends was accepted graciously by God, 
and Eliphaz broke out into a hymn of thanksgiving to the Lord for having pardoned the transgression of himself and his two friends. At the same time he announced the damnation of Elihu, the instrument of Satan. God appeared to Job once more, and gave him a girdle composed of three ribbons, and he bade him tie it around his waist. Hardly had he put it on when all his pain disappeared, his very recollection of it vanished, and, more than this, God made him to see all that ever was and all that shall ever be. After suffering sevenfold pain for seven years Job was restored to strength. With his three friends he returned to the city, and the inhabitants made a festival in his honor and unto the glory of God. All his former friends joined him again, and he resumed his old occupation, the care of the poor, for which he obtained the means from the people around. He said to them, Give me, each one of you, a sheep for the clothing of the poor, and for silver or gold drachmas for their other needs. The Lord blessed Job, and in a few days his wealth had increased to double the substance he had owned before misfortune overtook him. Zaitidos having died during the years of his trials, he married a second wife, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and she bore him seven sons and three daughters. He had never had more than one wife at a time, for he was wont to say, if it had been intended that Adam should have ten wives, God would have given them to him. Only one wife was bestowed upon him, whereby God indicated that he was to have but one, and therefore one wife suffices for me, too. When Job, after a long and happy life, felt his end approaching, he gathered his ten children around him, and told them the tale of his days. Having finished the narrative, he admonished them in these words, See, I am about to die and you will stand in my place, forsake not the Lord, be generous toward the poor, treat the feeble with consideration, and do not marry with the women of the Gentiles. Thereupon he divided his possessions among his sons, and to his daughters he gave what is more precious than all earthly goods, to each of them one ribbon of the celestial girdle he had received from God. The magic virtue of these ribbons was such that no sooner did their possessors tie them around their waists than they were transformed into higher beings, and with seraphic voices they broke out into hymns after the manner of the angels. For three days Job lay upon his bed, sick though not suffering, for the celestial girdle made him proof against pain. On the fourth day he saw the angels descend to fetch his soul. He arose from his bed, handed a scythe unto his oldest daughter Jemima, Day, a censer to the second one, Kazia, perfume, and a symbol to the third, Amalthias, horn and bade them welcome the angels with a sound of music. They played and sang and praised the Lord in the holy tongue. Then he appeared that sits in the great chariot, kissed Job, and rode away bearing his soul with him eastward. None saw them depart except the three daughters of Job. The grief of the people, especially the poor, the widows, and the orphans, was exceeding great. For three days they left the corpse unburied because they could not entertain the thought of separating themselves from it. As the name of Jah will remain imperishable unto all time, by reason of the man's piety, so his three friends were recompensed by God for their sympathy with him in his distress. Their names were preserved, the punishment of hell was remitted unto them, and, best of all, God poured out the Holy Spirit over them. But Satan, the cause of Job's anguish, the Lord cast down from heaven, for he had been vanquished by Job, who amid his agony had thanked and praised God for all he had done unto him. Moses in Egypt The Beginning of the Egyptian Bondage As soon as Jacob was dead, the eyes of the Israelites were closed, as well as their hearts. They began to feel the dominion of a stranger, although real bondage did not enslave them until some time later. While a single one of the sons of Jacob was alive, the Egyptians did not venture to approach the Israelites with evil intent. It was only when Levi, the last of them, had departed this life that their suffering commenced. A change in the relation of the Egyptians toward the Israelites had, indeed, been noticeable immediately after the death of Joseph, but they did not throw off their mask completely until Levi was no more. Then the slavery of the Israelites supervened in good earnest. The first hostile act on the part of the Egyptians was to deprive the Israelites of their fields, their vineyards, and the gifts that Joseph had sent to his brethren. Not content with these animosities, they sought to do them harm in other ways. The reason for the hatred of the Egyptians was envy and fear. 
the Israelites had increased to a miraculous degree. At the death of Jacob the seventy persons he had brought down with him bad grown to the number of six hundred thousand, and their physical strength and heroism were extraordinary and therefore alarming to the Egyptians. There were many occasions at that time for the display of prowess. Not long after the death of Levi occurred that of the Egyptian king Magron, who had been bred up by Joseph, and therefore was not wholly without grateful recollection of what he and his family had accomplished for the welfare of Egypt. But his son and successor Malal, together with his whole court, knew not the sons of Jacob and their achievements, and they did not scruple to oppress the Hebrews. The final breach between them and the Egyptians took place during the wars waged by Malal against Zepho, the grandson of Esau. In the course of it, the Israelites had saved the Egyptians from a crushing defeat, but instead of being grateful they sought only the undoing of their benefactors, from fear that the giant strength of the Hebrews might be turned against them. Pharaoh's Cunning The counselors and elders of Egypt came to Pharaoh, and spake unto him, saying, Behold! The people of the children of Israel are greater and mightier than we. Thou hast seen their strong power, which they have inherited from their fathers, for a few of them stood up against a people as many as the sand of the sea, and not one hath fallen. Now, therefore, give us counsel what to do with them, until we shall gradually destroy them from among us, lest they become too numerous in the land, for if they multiply, and there falleth out any war, they will also join themselves with their great strength unto our enemies, and fight against us, destroy us from the land, and get them up out of the land. The king answered the elders, saying, This is the plan advised by me against Israel, from which we will not depart. Behold, Pithom and Ramses are cities not fortified against battle. It behooves us to fortify them. Now, go ye and act cunningly against the children of Israel, and proclaim in Egypt and in Goshen, saying, All ye men of Egypt, Goshen, and Pathros. The king has commanded us to build Pithlam and Ramses and fortify them against battle. Those amongst you in all Egypt, of the children of Israel and of all the inhabitants of the cities, who are willing to build with us, shall have their wages given to them daily at the king's order. Then go ye first, and begin to build Pithlam and Ramses, and cause the king's proclamation to be made daily. And when some of the children of Israel come to build, do ye give them their wages daily, and after they shall have built with you for their daily wages, draw yourselves away from them day by day, and one by one, in secret. Then you shall rise up and become their taskmasters and their officers, and you shall have them afterward to build without wages. And should they refuse, then force them with all your might to build. If you do this, it will go well with us for we shall cause our land to be fortified after this manner, and with the children of Israel it will go ill, for they will decrease in number on account of the work, because you will prevent them from being with their wives. The elders, the counselors, and the whole of Egypt did according to the word of the king. For a month the servants of Pharaoh built with Israel, then they withdrew themselves gradually, while the children of Israel continued to work, receiving their daily wages for some men of Egypt were still carrying on the work with them. After a time all the Egyptians had withdrawn, and they had turned to become the officers and taskmasters of the Israelites. Then they refrained from giving them any pay, and when some of the Hebrews refused to work without wages, their taskmasters smote them, and made them return by force to labor with their brethren. And the children of Israel were greatly afraid of the Egyptians, and they came again and worked without pay all except the tribe of Levi, who were not employed in the work with their brethren. The children of Levi knew that the proclamation of the king was made to deceive Israel, therefore they refrained from listening to it, and the Egyptians did not molest them later, since they had not been with their brethren at the beginning, and though the Egyptians embittered the lies of the other Israelites with servile labor, they did not disturb the children of Levi. The Israelites called Malal, the king of Egypt, Marawar, bitterness because in his days the Egyptians embittered their lives with all manner of rigorous service. But Pharaoh did not rest satisfied with his proclamation and the affliction it imposed upon the Israelites. He suspended a brick press from his own neck, and himself took part in the work at Pithlam and Ramses. After this, whenever a Hebrew refused to come and help with the building, alleging that he was not fit for such hard service, the Egyptians would retort, saying, 
Dost thou mean to make us believe thou art more delicate than Pharaoh? The king himself urged the Israelites on with gentle words, saying, My children, I beg you to do this work and erect these little buildings for me. I will give you great reward therefore. By means of such artifices and wily words the Egyptians succeeded in overmastering the Israelites, and once they had them in their power, they treated them with undisguised brutality. Women were forced to perform men's work, and men women's work. The building of Pithom and Ramses turned out of no advantage to the Egyptians, for scarcely were the structures completed, when they collapsed, or they were swallowed by the earth, and the Hebrew workmen, besides having to suffer hardships during their erection, lost their lives by being precipitated from enormous heights, when the buildings fell in a heap. But the Egyptians were little concerned whether or not they derived profit from the forced labor of the children of Israel. Their main object was to hinder their increase, and Pharaoh therefore issued an order, that they were not to be permitted to sleep at their own homes, that so they might be deprived of the opportunity of having intercourse with their wives. The officers executed the will of the king, telling the Hebrews that the reason was the loss of too much time in going to and fro, which would prevent them from completing the required tale of bricks. Thus the Hebrew husbands were kept apart from their wives, and they were compelled to sleep on the ground, away from their habitations. But God spake, saying, Unto their father Abraham I gave the promise, that I would make his children to be as numerous as the stars in the heavens, and you contrive plans to prevent them from multiplying. We shall see whose word will stand, mine or yours. And it came to pass that the more the Egyptians afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And they continued to increase in spite of Pharaoh's command, that those who did not complete the required tale of bricks were to be immured in the buildings between the layers of bricks, and great was the number of the Israelites that lost their lives in this way. Many of their children were, besides, slaughtered as sacrifices to the idols of the Egyptians. For this reason God visited retribution upon the idols at the time of the going forth of the Israelites from Egypt. They had caused the death of the Hebrew children, and in turn they were shattered, and they crumbled into dust. The pious medwives. When now, in spite of all their tribulations, the children of Israel continued to multiply and spread abroad, so that the land was full of them as with thick underbrush, for the women brought forth many children at a birth, the Egyptians appeared before Pharaoh again, and urged him to devise some other way of ridding the land of the Hebrews, seeing that they were increasing mightily though they were made to toil and labor hard. Pharaoh could invent no new design. He asked his counselors to give him their opinion of the thing. Then spake one of them, Job of the land of Uz, which is in Aram Naharaim, as follows, the plan which the king invented, of putting a great burden of work upon the Israelites, was good in its time, and it should be executed henceforth, too, but to secure us against the fear that, if a war should come to pass, they may overwhelm us by reason of their numbers, and chase us forth out of the land. Let the king issue a decree, that every male child of the Israelites shall be killed at his birth. Then we need not be afraid of them if we should be overtaken by war. Now let the king summon the Hebrew midwives, that they come hither, and let him command them in accordance with this plan. Job's advice found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They preferred to have the midwives murder the innocents for they feared the punishment of God if they laid hands upon them themselves. Pharaoh cited the two midwives of the Hebrews before him, and commanded them to slay all men children, but to save the daughters of the Hebrew women alive, for the Egyptians were as much interested in preserving the female children as in bringing about the death of the male children. They were very sensual, and were desirous of having as many women as possible at their service. However, the plan, even if it had been carried into execution, was not wise, for though a man may marry many wives, each woman can marry but one husband. Thus a diminished number of men and a corresponding increase in the number of women did not constitute so serious a menace to the continuance of the nation of the Israelites as the reverse case would have been. The two Hebrew midwives were Jochab, the mother of Moses, and Miriam, his sister. When they appeared before Pharaoh, Miriam exclaimed, will be to this man when God visits retribution upon him for his evil deeds. The king would have killed her for these audacious words, had not Jochem delayed his wrath by saying, Why dost thou pay heed to her words? She is but a child, 
and knows not what she speaks. Yet, although Miriam was but five years old at the time, she nevertheless accompanied her mother, and helped her with her offices to the Hebrew women, giving food to the newborn babes while Jochebed washed and bathed them. Pharaoh's order ran as follows, At the birth of the child, if it be a man-child, kill it. But if it be a female child, then you need not kill it, but you may save it alive. The midwives returned, How are we to know whether the child is male or female? For the king had bidden them kill it while it was being born. Pharaoh replied, If the child issues forth from the womb with its face foremost, it is a man-child, for it looks to the earth, whence man was taken. But if its feet appear first, it is a female, for it looks up toward the rib of the mother, and from a rib woman was made. The king used all sorts of devices to render the midwives amenable to his wishes. He approached them with Amra's proposals, which they both repelled, and then he threatened them with death by fire. But they said within themselves, Our father Abraham opened an inn, that he might feed the wayfarers, though they were heathen, and we should neglect the children, nay, kill them? No, we shall have a care to keep them alive. Thus they failed to execute what Pharaoh had commanded. Instead of murdering the babes, they supplied all their needs. If a mother that had given birth to a child lacked food and drink, the midwives went to well-to-do women, and took up a collection, that the infant might not suffer want. They did still more for the little ones. They made supplication to God, praying, Thou knowest that we are not fulfilling the words of Pharaoh, but it is our aim to fulfill thy words. O oh, that it be thy will, our Lord, to let the child come into the world safe and sound, lest we fall under the suspicion that we tried to slay it, and maimed it in the attempt. The Lord hearkened to their prayer, and no child born under the ministrations of Shipra and Pua, or Jochebed and Miriam, as the midwives are also called, came into the world lame or blind or afflicted with any other blemish. Seeing that his command was ineffectual, he summoned the midwives a second time, and called them to account for their disobedience. They replied, This nation is compared unto one animal and another, and, in sooth, the Hebrews are like the animals. As little as the animals do they need the offices of midwives. These two God-fearing women were rewarded in many ways for their good deeds. Not only that Pharaoh did them no harm, but they were made the ancestors of priests and Levites, and kings and princes. Jochab became the mother of the priest Aaron and of the Levite Moses, and from Miriam's union with Caleb sprang the royal house of David. The hand of God was visible in her married life. She contracted a grievous sickness, and though it was thought by all that saw her that death would certainly overtake her, she recovered, and God restored her youth, and bestowed unusual beauty upon her, so that renewed happiness awaited her husband, who had been deprived of the pleasures of conjugal life during her long illness. His unexpected joys were the reward of his piety and trust in God. And another recompense was accorded to Miriam, she was privileged to bring forth Bezalel, the builder of the tabernacle who was endowed with celestial wisdom. The Three Counselors In the 130th year after Israel's going down to Egypt Pharaoh dreamed that he was sitting upon his throne, and he lifted up his eyes, and he beheld an old man before him with a balance in his hand, and he saw him taking all the elders, nobles, and great men of Egypt, tying them together, and laying them in one scale of the balance, while he put a tender kid into the other. The kid bore down the pan in which it lay until it hung lower than the other with the bound Egyptians. Pharaoh arose early in the morning, and called together all his servants and his wise men to interpret his dream, and the men were greatly afraid on account of his vision. Balaam the son of Beer then spake, and said, This means nothing but that a great evil will spring up against Egypt, for a son will be born unto Israel, who will destroy the whole of our land and all its inhabitants and he will bring forth the Israelites from Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, therefore, O king, take counsel as to this matter, that the hope of Israel be frustrated before this evil arise against Egypt. The king said unto Balaam, What shall we do unto Israel? We have tried several devices against this people, but we could not prevail over it. Now let me hear thy opinion. At Balaam's instance, the king sent for his two counselors. Royal the Midianite and Job the Uzite, to hear their advice. Royal spoke, If it seemeth good to the king, let him desist from the Hebrews, 
and let him not stretch forth his hand against them, for the Lord chose them in days of old, and took them as the lot of his inheritance from amongst all the nations of the earth, and who is there that hath dared stretch forth his hand against them with impunity, but that the God avenge the evil done unto them. Royal then proceeded to enumerate some of the mighty things God had performed for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he closed his admonition with the words, Verily, thy grandfather, the Pharaoh of former days, raised Joseph the son of Jacob above all the princes of Egypt, because he discerned his wisdom, for through his wisdom he rescued all the inhabitants of the land from the famine, after which he invited Jacob and his sons to come down to Egypt, that the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen be delivered from the famine through their virtues. Now, therefore, if it seem good in thine eyes, leave off from destroying the children of Israel, and if it be not thy will that they dwell in Egypt, send them forth from here, that they may go to the land of Canaan, the land wherein their ancestors sojourned. When Pharaoh heard the words of Jethro royal, he was exceedingly wroth with him, and he was dismissed in disgrace from before the king, and he went to Midian. The king then spoke to Job, and said, What sayest thou, Job, and what is thy advice respecting the Hebrews? Job replied, Behold, all the inhabitants of the land are in thy power. Let the king do as seemeth good in his eyes. Balaam was the last to speak at the behest of the king, and he said, From all that the king may devise against the Hebrews, they will be delivered. If thou thinkest to diminish them by the flaming fire, thou wilt not prevail over them, for the God delivered Abraham their father from the furnace in which the Chaldeans cast him. Perhaps thou thinkest to destroy them with a sword, but their father Isaac was delivered from being slaughtered by the sword. And if thou thinkest to reduce them through hard and rigorous labor, thou wilt also not prevail, for their father Jacob served Laban in all manner of hard work, and yet he prospered. If it please the king, let him order all the male children that shall be born in Israel from this day forward to be thrown into the water. Thereby canst thou wipe out their name, for neither any of them nor any of their fathers was tried in this way. The Slaughter of the Innocents Balaam's advice was accepted by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They knew that God pays measure for measure, therefore they believed that the drowning of the men children would be the safest means of exterminating the Hebrews, without incurring harm themselves, for the Lord had sworn unto Noah never again to destroy the world by water. Thus, they assumed, they would be exempt from punishment, wherein they were wrong, however. In the first place, though the Lord had sworn not to bring a flood upon men, there was nothing in the way of bringing men into a flood. Furthermore, the oath of God applied to the whole of mankind, not to a single nation. The end of the Egyptians was that they met their death in the billows of the Red Sea. Measure for measure as they had drowned the men children of the Israelites, so they were drowned. Pharaoh now took steps looking to the faithful execution of his decree. He sent his bailiffs into the houses of the Israelites, to discover all newborn children, wherever they might be. To make sure that the Hebrew should not succeed in keeping the children hidden, the Egyptians hatched a devilish plan. Their women were to take their little ones to the houses of the Israelitish women that were suspected of having infants. When the Egyptian children began to cry or coo, the Hebrew children that were kept in hiding would join in, after the manner of babies, and betray their presence, whereupon the Egyptians would seize them and bear them off. Furthermore, Pharaoh commanded that the Israelitish women employ none but Egyptian midwives, who were to secure precise information as to the time of their delivery and were to exercise great care, and let no male child escape their vigilance alive. If there should be parents that evaded the command, and preserve a newborn boy in secret, they and all belonging to them were to be killed. Is it to be wondered at, then, that many of the Hebrews kept themselves away from their wives? Nevertheless those who put trust in God were not forsaken by him. The women that remained united with their husbands would go out into the field when their time of delivery arrived and give birth to their children and leave them there, while they themselves return home. The Lord, who had sworn unto their ancestors to multiply them, sent one of his angels to wash the babes, anoint them, stretch their limbs, and swathe them. Then he would give them two smooth pebbles, from one of which they suck milk, and from the other honey. And God caused the hair of the infants to grow down to their knees and serve them as a protecting garment, and then he ordered the earth to receive the babes 
that they be sheltered therein until the time of their growing up, when it would open its mouth and vomit forth the children, and they would sprout up like the herb of the field and the grass of the forest. Thereafter each would return to his family and the house of his father. When the Egyptians saw this, they went forth, every man to his field, with his yoke of oxen, and they ploughed up the earth as one ploughs it at sea time. Yet they were unable to do harm to the infants of the children of Israel that had been swallowed up and lay in the bosom of the earth. Thus the people of Israel increased and waxed exceedingly. And Pharaoh ordered his officers to go to Goshen, to look for the male babes of the children of Israel, and when they discovered one, they tore him from his mother's breast by force, and thrust him into the river. But no one is so valiant as to be able to foil God's purposes, though he contrived ten thousand subtle devices unto that end. The child foretold by Pharaoh's dreams and by his astrologers was brought up and kept concealed from the king's spies. It came to pass after the following manner. The Parents of Moses When Pharaoh's proclamation was issued, decreeing that the men children of the Hebrews were to be cast into the river, Amram, who was the president of the Sanhedrin, decided that in the circumstances it was best for husbands to live altogether separate from their wives. He set the example. He divorced his wife, and all the men of Israel did likewise, for he occupied a place of great consideration among his people, one reason being that he belonged to the tribe of Levi, the tribe that was faithful to its God even in the land of Egypt, though the other tribes wavered in their allegiance, and attempted to ally themselves with the Egyptians going so far as to give up Abraham's sign of the covenant.To chastise the Hebrews for their impiety, God turned the love of the Egyptians for them into hatred, so that they resolved upon their destruction. Mindful of all that he and his people owed to Joseph's wise rule, Pharaoh refused at first to entertain the malicious plans proposed by the Egyptians against the Hebrews. He spoke to his people, You fools, we are indebted to these Hebrews for whatever we enjoy and you desire now to rise up against them? But the Egyptians could not be turned aside from their purpose of ruining Israel. They deposed their king, and incarcerated him for three months, until he declared himself ready to execute with determination what they had resolved upon, and he sought to bring about the ruin of the children of Israel by every conceivable means. Such was the retribution they had drawn down upon themselves by their own acts. As for Amram, not only did he belong to the tribe of Levi, distinguished for its piety, but by reason of his extraordinary piety he was prominent even among the pious of the tribe. He was one of the four who were immaculate, untainted by sin, over whom death would have had no power, had mortality not been decreed against every single human being on account of the fall of the first man and woman. The other three that led the same sinless life were Benjamin, Jesse the father of David, and Chileab the son of David. If the Shekinah was drawn close again to the dwelling place of mortals, it was due to Amram's piety. Originally the real residence of the Shekinah was among men, but when Adam committed his sin, she withdrew to heaven, at first to the lowest of the seven heavens. Thence she was banished by Cain's crime, and she retired to the second heaven. The sins of the generation of Enoch removed her still farther off from men, she took up her abode in the third heaven. Then, successively, in the fourth, on account of the malefactors in the generation of the deluge. In the fifth, during the building of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of tongues. In the sixth, by reason of the wicked Egyptians at the time of Abraham. And, finally, in the seventh, in consequence of the abominations of the inhabitants of Sodom. Six righteous men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kohath, and Amram, drew the Shekinah back, one by one, from the seventh to the first heaven, and through the seventh righteous man, Moses, she was made to descend to the earth and abide among men as aforetime. Amram's sagacity kept pace with his piety and his learning. The Egyptians succeeded in enslaving the Hebrews by seductive promises. At first they gave them a shekel for every brick they made, tempting them to superhuman efforts by the prospect of earning much money. Later, when the Egyptians forced them to work without wages, they insisted upon having as many bricks as the Hebrews had made when their labor was paid for, but they could demand only a single brick daily from Amram, for he had been the only one whom they had not led astray by their artifice. 
he had been satisfied with a single shekel daily, and had therefore made only a single brick daily, which they had to accept afterward as the measure of his day's work. As his life partner, Amram chose his aunt Jochebed, who was born the same day with him she was the daughter of Levi, and she owed her name, Divine Splendor, to the celestial light that radiated from her countenance. She was worthy of being her husband's helpmate, for she was one of the midwives that had imperiled their own lives to rescue the little Hebrew babes. Indeed, if God had not allowed a miracle to happen, she and her daughter Miriam would have been killed by Pharaoh for having resisted his orders and saved the Hebrew children alive. When the king sent his hangman for the two women, God caused them to become invisible, and the bailiffs bade to return without accomplishing their errand. The first child of the union between Amram and Jochebed, his wife, who was 126 years old at the time of her marriage, was a girl, and the mother called her Miriam, bitterness, for it was at the time of her birth that the Egyptians began to invent in the life of the Hebrews. The second child was a boy, called Aaron, which means, woe unto this pregnancy. Because Pharaoh's instructions to the midwives, to kill the male children of the Hebrews, was proclaimed during the months before Aaron's birth the birth of Moses. When Amram separated from his wife on account of the edict published against the male children of the Hebrews, and his example was followed by all the Israelites, his daughter Miriam said to him, Father, thy decree is worse than Pharaoh's decree. The Egyptians aim to destroy only the male children, but thou includest the girls as well. Pharaoh deprives his victims of life in this world, but thou preventest children from being born and thus thou deprivest them of the future life, too. He resolves destruction, but who knows whether the intention of the wicked can persist. Thou art a righteous man, and the enactments of the righteous are executed by God, hence thy decree will be upheld. Amram recognized the justice of her plea, and he repaired to the Sanhedrin, and put the matter before this body. The members of the court spoke, and said, It was thou that didst separate husbands and wives and from thee should go forth the permission for remarriage. Amram then made the proposition that each of the members of the Sanhedrin return to his wife, and wed her clandestinely, but his colleagues repudiated the plan, saying, And who will make it known unto the whole of Israel? Accordingly, Amram stood publicly under the wedding canopy with his divorced wife Jochebed, while Aaron and Miriam danced about it, and the angels proclaimed, let the mother of children be joyful. His remarriage was solemnized with great ceremony, to the end that the men that bad followed his example in divorcing their wives might imitate him now in taking them again unto themselves. And so it happened. Old as Jochebed was, she regained her youth. Her skin became soft, the wrinkles in her face disappeared, the warm tints of maiden beauty returned, and in a short time she became pregnant. Amram was very uneasy about his wife's being with child. He knew not what to do. He turned to God in prayer, and entreated him to have compassion upon those who had in no wise transgressed the laws of his worship, and afford them deliverance from the misery they endured, while he rendered abortive the hope of their enemies, who yearned for the destruction of their nation. God had mercy on him, and he stood by him in his sleep, and exhorted him not to despair of his future favors. He said further, that he did not forget their piety, and he would always reward them for it, as he had granted his favor in other days unto their forefathers. No, therefore, the Lord continued to speak, that I shall provide for you altogether what is for your good, and for thee in particular that which shall make thee celebrated. For the child out of dread of whose nativity the Egyptians have doomed the Israelite children to destruction, shall be this child of thine and be shall remain concealed from those who watch to destroy him, and when he has been bred up, in a miraculous way, he shall deliver the Hebrew nation from the distress they are under by reason of the Egyptians. His memory shall be celebrated while the world lasts, and not only among the Hebrews, but among strangers also. And all this shall be the effect of my favor toward thee and thy posterity. Also his brother shall be such that he shall obtain my priesthood for himself, and for his posterity after him, unto the end of the world. After he had been informed of these things by the vision, Amram awoke, and told all unto his wife Jochebed. His daughter Miriam likewise had a prophetic dream, and she related it unto her parents, saying, In this night I saw a man clothed in fine linen. Tell thy father and thy mother, he said, 
that he who shall be born unto them, shall be cast into the waters, and through him the waters shall become dry, and wonders and miracles shall be performed through him, and he shall save my people Israel, and be their leader forever. During her pregnancy, Jochebed observed that the child in her womb was destined for great things. All the times she suffered no pain, and also she suffered none in giving birth to her son, for pious women are not included in the curse pronounced upon Eve, decreeing sorrow in conception and in childbearing. At the moment of the child's appearance, the whole house was filled with radiance equal to the splendor of the sun and the moon. A still greater miracle followed. The infant was not yet a day old when he began to walk and speak with his parents, and as though he were an adult, he refused to drink milk from his mother's breast. Jochab gave birth to the child six months after conception. The Egyptian bailiffs, who kept strict watch over all pregnant women in order to be on the spot in time to carry off their newborn boys, had not expected her delivery for three months more. These three months the parents succeeded in keeping the babe concealed, though every Israelitish house was guarded by two Egyptian women, one stationed within and one without. At the end of this time they determined to expose the child, for Amram was afraid that both he and his son would be devoted to death if the secret leaked out and he thought it better to entrust the child's fate to divine providence. He was convinced that God would protect the boy, and fulfill his word in truth. Moses rescued from the water. Jochebed accordingly took an ark fashioned of bulrushes, daubed it with pitch on the outside, and lined it with clay within. The reason she used bulrushes was because they float on the surface of the water, and she put pitch only on the outside to protect the child as much as possible against the annoyance of a disagreeable odor. Over the child as it lay in the ark she spread a tiny canopy, to shade the babe, with the words, perhaps I shall not live to see him under the marriage canopy. And then she abandoned the ark on the shores of the Red Sea. Yet it was not left unguarded. Her daughter Miriam stayed nearby, to discover whether a prophecy she had uttered would be fulfilled. Before the child's birth, his sister had foretold that her mother would bring forth a son that should redeem Israel. When he was born, and the house was filled with brilliant light, Amram kissed her on her head, but when he was forced into the expedient of exposing the child, he beat her on her head, saying, My daughter, what hath become of thy prophecy? Therefore Miriam stayed, and strolled along the shore, to observe what would be the fate of the babe, and what would come of her prophecy concerning him. The day the child was exposed was the 21st of the month of Nisan, the same on which the children of Israel later, under the leadership of Moses, sang the song of praise and gratitude to God for the redemption from the waters of the sea. The angels appeared before God, and spoke, O Lord of the world, shall he that is appointed to sing a song of praise unto thee on this day of Nisan, to thank thee for rescuing him and his people from the sea, shall he find his death in the sea today? The Lord replied, Ye know well that I see all things. The contriving of man can do not to change what hath been resolved in my counsel. Those do not attain their end who use cunning and malice to secure their own safety, and endeavor to bring ruin upon their fellow men. But he who trusts me in his peril will be conveyed from profoundest distress to unlooked for happiness. Thus my omnipotence will reveal itself in the fortunes of this babe. At the time of the child's abandonment, God sent scorching heat to plague the Egyptians, and they all suffered with leprosy and smarting boils. Thermidus, the daughter of Pharaoh, sought relief from the burning pain in a bath in the waters of the Nile. But physical discomfort was not her only reason for leaving her father's palace. She was determined to cleanse herself as well of the impurity of the idol worship that prevailed there. When she saw the little ark floating among the flags on the surface of the water, she supposed it to contain one of the little children exposed at her father's order, and she commanded her handmaids to fetch it. But they protested, saying, O oh, our mistress, it happens sometimes that a decree issued by a king is unheeded, yet it is observed at least by his children and the members of his household, and dost thou desire to transgress thy father's edict? Forthwith the angel Gabriel appeared, seized all the maids except one, whom he permitted the princess to retain for her service and buried them in the bowels of the earth. Pharaoh's daughter now proceeded to do her own will. She stretched forth her arm, and although the ark was swimming at a distance of sixty ells, she succeeded in grasping it, 
because her arm was lengthened miraculously. No sooner had she touched it than the leprosy afflicting her departed from her. Her sudden restoration led her to examine the contents of the ark, and when she opened it, her amazement was great. She beheld an exquisitely beautiful boy, for God had fashioned the Hebrew babe's body with peculiar care, and beside it she perceived the Shekinah. Noticing that the boy bore the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, she knew that he was one of the Hebrew children, and mindful of her father's decree concerning the male children of the Israelites, she was about to abandon the babe to his fate. At that moment the angel Gabriel came and gave the child a vigorous blow, and he began to cry aloud, with a voice like a young man's. His vehement weeping and the weeping of Aaron, who was lying beside him, touched the princess, and in her pity she resolved to save him. She ordered an Egyptian woman to be brought, to nurse the child, but the little one refused to take milk from her breast, as he refused to take it from one after the other of the Egyptian woman fetched thither. Thus it had been ordained by God, that none of them might boast later on, and say, I suckled him that holds converse now with the Shekinah. Nor was the mouth destined to speak with God to draw nourishment from the unclean body of an Egyptian woman. Now Miriam stepped into the presence of Thermutus, as though she had been standing there by chance to look at the child, and she spoke to the princess, saying, It is vain for thee, O queen, to call for nurses that are in no wise of kin to the child, but if thou wilt order a woman of the Hebrews to be brought, he may accept her breast, seeing that she is of his own nation. Thermutus therefore bade Miriam fetch a Hebrew woman, and with winged steps, speeding like a vigorous youth, she hastened and brought back her own mother, the child's mother, for she knew that none present was acquainted with her. The babe, unresisting, took his mother's breast, and clutched it tightly. The princess committed the child to Jochen's care, saying these words, which contained an unconscious divination, Here is what is thine. Nurse the boy henceforth and I will give thee two silver pieces as thy wages. The return of her son, safe and sound, after she had exposed him, was Joked's reward from God for her services as one of the midwives that had bidden defiance to Pharaoh's command and save the Hebrew children alive. By exposing their son to danger, Amram and Joked had effected the withdrawal of Pharaoh's command and joining the extermination of the Hebrew men children. The day Moses was set adrift in the little ark, the astrologers had come to Pharaoh and told him the glad tidings, that the danger threatening the Egyptians on account of one boy, whose doom lay in the water, had now been averted. Thereupon Pharaoh cried a halt to the drowning of the boys of his empire. The astrologers had seen something, but they knew not what, and they announced a message, the import of which they did not comprehend. Water was, indeed, the doom of Moses, but that did not mean that he would perish in the waters of the Nile. It had reference to the waters of Meribah, the waters of strife, and how they would cause his death in the desert, before he had completed his task of leading the people into the promised land. Pharaoh, misled by the obscure vision of his astrologers, thought that the future Redeemer of Israel was to lose his life by drowning, and to make sure that the boy whose appearance was foretold by the astrologers might not escape his fate, he had ordered all boys, even the children of the Egyptians born during a period of nine months to be cast into the water. On account of the merits of Moses, the six hundred thousand men children of the Hebrews begotten in the same night with him, and thrown into the water on the same day, were rescued miraculously together with him, and it was therefore not an idle boast, if he said later, the people that went forth out of the water on account of my merits are six hundred thousand men. The Long Route the exodus would have been impossible if Joseph's bones had remained behind. Therefore Moses made it his concern to seek their resting place, while the people had but the one thought of gathering in the treasures of the Egyptians. But it was not an easy matter to find Joseph's body. Moses knew that he had been interred in the mausoleum of the Egyptian kings, but there were so many other bodies there that it was impossible to identify it. Moses' mother Jochebed came to his aid. She led him to the very spot where Joseph's bones lay. As soon as he came near them, he knew them to be what he was seeking, by the fragrance they exhaled and spread around. But his difficulties were not at an end. The question arose, how he was to secure possession of the remains. Joseph's coffin had been sunk far down into the ground, and he knew not how to raise it from the depths. 
standing at the edge of the grave, he spoke these words. Joseph, the time hath come whereof thou didst say, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. No sooner had this reminder dropped from his lips than the coffin stirred and rose to the surface. And even yet the difficulties in Moses' way were not removed wholly. The Egyptian magicians had stationed two golden dogs at Joseph's coffin, to keep watch, and they barked vehemently if anyone ventured close to it. The noise they made was so loud it could be heard throughout the land, from end to end, a distance equal to a forty days journey. When Moses came near the coffin, the dogs emitted their warning sound, but he silenced them at once with words, Come, ye people, and behold the miracle. The real, live dogs did not bark, and these counterfeit dogs produced by magic attempted. What he said about real, live dogs and their refraining from barking had reference to the fact that the dogs of the Egyptians did not move their tongues against any of the children of Israel, through they had barked all the time the people were engaged in burying the bodies of their smitten firstborn. As a reward God gave the Israelites the law, to cast to the dogs the flesh they themselves are forbidden to eat, for the Lord withholds due recompense from none of his creatures. Indeed, the dogs received a double reward, for their excrements are used in tanning the hides from which the Torah scrolls are made, as well as the mezuzot and the phylacteries. Joseph's coffin in the possession of Moses, the march of the Israelites could begin. The Egyptians put no manner of obstacle in their way. Pharaoh himself accompanied them, to make sure that they were actually leaving the land, and now he was so angry at his counselors for having advised against letting the Israelites depart that he slew them. For several reasons God did not permit the Israelites to travel along the straight route to the promised land. He desired them to go to Sinai first and take the law upon themselves there, and, besides, the time divinely appointed for the occupation of the land by the Gentiles had not yet elapsed. Over and above all this, the long sojourn in the wilderness was fraught with profit for the Israelites, spiritually and materially. If they had reached Palestine directly after leaving Egypt, they would have devoted themselves entirely each to the cultivation of his allotted parcel of ground, and no time would have been left for the study of the Torah. In the wilderness they were relieved of the necessity of providing for their daily wants, and they would give all their efforts to acquiring the law. On the whole, it would not have been advantageous to process at once to the Holy Land and take possession thereof, for when the Canaanites heard that the Israelites were making for Palestine, they burnt the crops, felled the trees, destroyed the buildings, and choked the water springs, all in order to render the land uninhabitable. Hereupon God spake, and said, I did not promise their fathers to give a devastated land unto their sea, but a land full of all good things. I will lead them about in the wilderness for forty years, and meanwhile the Canaanites will have time to repair the damage they have done. Moreover, the many miracles performed for the Israelites during the journey through the wilderness had made their terror to fall upon the other nations, and their hearts melted, and there remained no more spirit in any man. They did not venture to attack the Israelites, and the conquest of the land was all the easier. Nor does this exhaust the list of reasons for preferring the longer route through the desert. Abraham had sworn a solemn oath to live at peace with the Philistines during a certain period, and the end of the term had not yet arrived. Besides, there was the fear that the sight of the land of the Philistines would awaken sad recollections in the Israelites, and drive them back into Egypt speedily, for once upon a time it had been the scene of a bitter disappointment to them. They had spent 180 years in Egypt in peace and prosperity, not in the least molested by the people. Suddenly Ganon came, a descendant of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, and he spake, The Lord hath appeared unto me, and he bade me lead you forth out of Egypt. The Ephraimites were the only ones to heed his words. Proud of their royal lineage as direct descendants of Joseph, and confident to their valor in war, for they were great heroes, they left the land and betook themselves to Palestine. They carried only weapons and gold and silver. They had taken no provisions, because they expected to buy food and drink on the way or capture them by force if the owners would not part with them for money. After a day's march they found themselves in the neighborhood of Gath, at the place where the shepherds employed by the residents of the city gathered with the flocks. The Ephraimites asked them to sell them some sheep, 
which they expected to slaughter in order to satisfy their hunger with them, but the shepherds refused to have business dealings with them, saying, Are the sheep ours, or does the cattle belong to us, that we could part with them for money? Seeing that they could not gain their point by kindness, the Ephraimites used force. The outcries of the shepherds brought the people of Gath to their aid. A violent encounter, lasting a whole day, took place between the Israelites and the Philistines. The people of Gath realized that alone they would not be able to offer successful resistance to the Ephraimites, and they summoned the people of the other Philistine cities to join them. The following day an army of 40,000 stood ready to oppose the Ephraimites. Reduced in strength, as they were, by their three days fast, they were exterminated root and branch. Only ten of them escaped with their bare life, and returned to Egypt, to bring Ephraim word of the disaster that had overtaken his posterity, and he mourned many days. This abortive attempt of the Ephraimites to leave Egypt was the first occasion for oppressing Israel. Thereafter the Egyptians exercised force and vigilance to keep them in their land. As for the disaster of the Ephraimites, it was well-merited punishment, because they had paid no heed to the wish of the father Joseph, who had adjured his descendants solemnly on his deathbed not to think of quitting the land until the Redeemer should appear. Their death was followed by disgrace, for their bodies lay unburied for many years on the battlefield near Gath and the purpose of God in directing the Israelites to choose the longer route from Egypt to Canaan, was to spare them the sight of those dishonored corpses. Their courage might have deserted them, and out of apprehension of sharing the fate of their brethren they might have hastened back to the land of slavery. Pharaoh pursues the Hebrews. When Pharaoh permitted Israel to depart, he was under the impression that they were going only a three days journey into the wilderness for the purpose of offering sacrifices. He sent officers with them, whose duty was to bring them back at the appointed time. The exodus took place on a Thursday. On the following Sunday the king's watchers noticed that the Israelites, so far from preparing for a return, were making arrangements looking to a long sojourn in the desert. They remonstrated and urged them to go back. The Israelites maintained that Pharaoh had dismissed them for good, but the officers would not be put off with their mere assertions. They said, willy-nilly, you will have to do as the powers that be command. To such arrogance the Israelites would not submit, and they fell upon the officers, slaying some and wounding others. The maimed survivors went back to Egypt, and report the contumacy of the Israelites to Pharaoh. Meantime Moses, who did not desire the departure of his people to have the appearance of flight before the Egyptians, gave the signal to turn back to Pihahirath. Those of little faith among the Israelites tore their hair and their garments in desperation, though Moses assured them that by the word of God they were free men, and no longer slaves to Pharaoh. Accordingly, they retraced their steps to Pihahirath, where two rectangular rocks form an opening, within which the great sanctuary of Baal Zephon was situated. The rocks are shaped like human figures, the one a man and the other a woman, and they were not chiseled by human hands, but by the Creator Himself. The place had been called Pithom in earlier times, but later, on account of the idols set up there, it received the name Hahirath. Of sad purpose God had left Baal Zephon uninjured, alone of all the Egyptian idols. He wanted the Egyptian people to think that this idol was possessed of exceeding might, which it exercised to prevent the Israelites from journeying on. To confirm them in their illusory belief, God caused wild beasts to obstruct the road to the wilderness and they took it for granted that their idol Baal Zephon had ordained their appearance. Pihahirath was famous, besides, on account of the treasures heaped up there. The wealth of the world which Joseph had acquired through the sale of corn he had stored up during the seven years of plenty, he had divided into three parts. The first part he surrendered to Pharaoh. The second part he concealed in the wilderness, where it was found by Korah, though it disappeared again not to come to view until the messianic time, and then it will be for the benefit of the pious. The third part Joseph hid in the sanctuary of Baal Zephon, whence the Hebrews carried it off as booty. When Amalek and the magicians brought the information to Pharaoh, that the Israelites had resolved not to return to Egypt, his heart and the heart of his whole people turned against them. The very counselors that had persuaded him to dismiss the children of Israel spake now as follows. If we had only been smitten with the plaques, we could have resigned ourselves to our fate. Or if, 
Besides being smitten with the plagues, we had been compelled to let the Hebrews depart from the land, that, too, we could have been born with patience. But to be smitten with the plagues, to be compelled to let our slaves depart from us, and to sit by and see them go off with our riches, that is more than we can endure. Now that the children of Israel had gone from them the Egyptians recognized how valuable an element they had been in their country. In general, the time of the exodus of Israel was disastrous for their former masters. In addition to losing their dominion over the Israelites, the Egyptians had to deal with mutinies that broke out among many other nations tributary to them, for hitherto Pharaoh had been the ruler of the whole world. The king resorted to blandishments and promises, to induce the people to make war against the Israelites, saying, As a rule the army marches forth first, and the king follows in security, but I will precede you. And as a rule the king has the first choice of the booty, and as much of it as he desires, but I will take no more than any one of you, and on my return from the war I will divide my treasures of silver, gold, and precious stones among you. In his zeal Pharaoh did not wait to have his chariot made ready for him he did it with his own hands, and his nobles followed his example. Samael granted Pharaoh assistance, putting six hundred chariots men with his own hosts at his disposal. These formed the vanguard, and they were joined by all the Egyptians, with their vast assemblages of chariots and warriors, no less than three hundred of their men to one of the children of Israel, each equipped with their different sorts of weapons. The general custom was for two charioteers to take turns at driving a car, but to overtake the Israelites more surely and speedily, Pharaoh ordered three to be assigned to each. The result was that they covered in one day the ground which it had taken the Israelites three to traverse. The mind of the Egyptians was in no wise directed toward spoil and plunder in this expedition. Their sole and determined purpose was to exterminate Israel, kith and kin. As the heathen lay great stress upon omens when they are about to start out on a campaign, God caused all their preparations to proceed smoothly, without the slightest untoward circumstance. Everything pointed to a happy issue. Pharaoh, himself an adept in magic, had a presentiment that dire misfortune would befall the children of Israel in the wilderness, that they would lose Moses there, and there the whole generation that had departed from Egypt would find its grave. Therefore he spoke to Dathan and Abiram, who remained behind in Egypt, saying, Moses is leading them, but he himself knows not whither. Verily, the congregation of Israel will lift up their voice in the wilderness, and cry, and there they will be destroyed. He thought naturally that these visions had reference to an imminent future, to the time of his meeting with his dismissed slaves. But his error was profound, he was hurrying forward to his own destruction. When he reached the sanctuary of Baal Zephon, Pharaoh, in his joy at finding him spared while all the other idols in Egypt had been annihilated, lost no time, but hastened to offer sacrifices to him, and he was comforted, for, he said, Baal Zephon approves my purpose of drowning the children of Israel in the sea. When the Israelites beheld the huge detachments of the Egyptian army moving upon them, and when they considered that in Migdal there were other troops stationed, besides, more, Indeed, than their own numbers, men, women, and children all told, great terror overwhelmed them. What affrighted them most, was the sight of the angel of Egypt darting through the air as he flew to the assistance of the people under his tutelage. They turned to Moses, saying, What hast thou done to us? Now they will requite us for all that hath happened, that their firstborn were smitten, and that we ran off with their money, which was thy fault for thou didst bid up borrow gold and silver from our Egyptian neighbors and depart with their property. The situation of the Israelites was desperate. Before them was the sea, behind them the Egyptians, on both sides the wild beasts of the desert. The wicked among them spoke to Moses, saying, While we were in Egypt, we said to thee and to Aaron, The Lord look upon you, and judge, because ye have made our savour to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. Then there died many of our brethren during the days of darkness, which was worse than the bondage in which the Egyptians kept us. Nevertheless our fate in the desert will be sadder than theirs. They at least were mourned, and their bodies ere buried, but our corpses will lie exposed, consumed in the day by drought and by frost in the night. Moses in his wisdom knew how to pacify the thousands and myriads under his leadership. 
he impressed them with the words, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. When will his salvation come? Questioned the people, and he told them it would appear the following day, but they protested, We cannot wait until tomorrow. Then Moses prayed to God, and the Lord showed him the angel hosts standing ready to hasten to the assistance of the people. They were not agreed as to what they were to do. There were four contending parties. The opinion of the first party was that they seek death by drowning in the sea. Of the second, that they return to Egypt. The third was in favor of a pitched battle with the enemy, and the fourth thought it would be a good plan to intimidate the Egyptians by noise and a great hubbub. To the first Moses said, Stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. To the second, The Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. To the third, the Lord shall fight for you. And to the fourth, ye shall hold your peace. What, then, shall we do? These asked their leader, and Moses answered them, saying, Ye shall bless, praise, extol, adore and glorify him that is the Lord of war. Instead of the sword and the five sorts of arms which they bore, they made use of their mouth, and it was of greater avail than all possible weapons of war. The Lord hearkened unto their prayer, for which he had but been waiting. Moses also addressed himself to God, saying, O Lord of the world! I am like the shepherd who, having undertaken to pasture a flock, has been heedless enough to drive his sheep to the edge of a precipice, and then is in a despair how to get them down again. Pharaoh is behind my flock Israel, in the south is Baal Zephon, in the north Midgal, and before us the sea lies spread out. Thou knowest, O Lord! that it is beyond human strength and human contrivance to surmount the difficulties standing in our way. Thine alone is the work of procuring deliverance for this army, which left Egypt at thy appointment. We despair of all other assistance or device, and we have recourse only to our hope in thee. If there be any escape possible, we look up to thy providence to accomplish it for us. With such words Moses continued to make fervent supplication to God to succor Israel in their need. But God cut short his prayer, saying, Moses, my children are in distress, the sea blocks the way before them, the enemy is in hot pursuit after them, and thou standest here and proudest. Sometimes long prayer is good, but sometimes it is better to be brief. If I gathered the waters together unto one place, and let the dry land appear for Adam, a single human being, should I not do the same for this holy congregation? I will save them if only for the sake of the merits of Abraham, who stood ready to sacrifice his son Isaac unto me, and for the sake of my promise to Jacob. The sun and the moon are witnesses that I will cleave the sea for the seed of the children of Israel, who deserve my help for going after me in the wilderness unquestioningly. Do thou but see to it that they abandon their evil thought of returning to Egypt, and then it will not be necessary to turn to me and entreat my help. Moses, however, was still very much troubled in mind, on account of Zemael, who had not left off lodging accusations before God against Israel since the exodus from Egypt. The Lord adopted the same procedure in dealing with the accuser as the experienced shepherd, who, at the moment of transferring his sheep across a stream, was faced by a ravening wolf. The shepherd threw a strong ram to the wolf, and while the two engaged in combat, the rest of the flock was carried across the water, and then the shepherd returned and snatched the wolf's supposed prey away from him. Samael said to the Lord, Up to this time the children of Israel were idol worshippers, and now thou proposest so great a thing as dividing the sea for them? What did the Lord do? He surrendered Job to Samael, saying, While he busies himself with Job, Israel will pass through the sea unscathed, and as soon as they are in safety, I will rescue Job from the hands of Samael. Israel had other angel adversaries, besides. Uzzah, the tutelary angel of the Egyptians, appeared before God, and said, O Lord of the world! I have a suit with this nation which thou hast brought forth out to Egypt. If it seemeth well to thee, let their angel Michael appear, and contend with me before thee. The Lord summoned Michael, and Uzzah stated his charges against Israel, O Lord of the world! Thou didst decree concerning this people of Israel that his hall be held in bondage by my people, the Egyptians, for a period of four hundred years. But they had dominion over them only eighty-six years, 
therefore the time of their going forth hath not yet arrived. If it be thy will, give me permission to take them back to Egypt, that they may continue in slavery for the three hundred and fourteen years that are left, and thy word be fulfilled. As thou art immutable, so let thy decree be immutable. Michael was silent, for he knew not how to controvert these words, and it seemed as if Uzzah had won his suit. But the Lord himself espoused the cause of Israel, and he said to Uzzah, The duty of serving thy nation was laid upon my children only on account of an unseemly word uttered by Abraham. When I spoke to him, saying, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it, he made answer, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Therefore did I say to him, Thy seed shall be a stranger. But it is well known and manifest before me that they were strangers from the day of Isaac's birth, and reckoning thence, the period of four hundred years has elapsed, and thou hast no right to keep my children in bondage any longer. The seed divided. God spake to Moses, saying, Why dost thou stand here praying? My children's prayer has anticipated thine. For thee there is naught to do but lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. Moses replied, Thou commandest me to divide the sea, and lay bare the dry ground in the midst of it, and yet thou didst thyself make it a perpetual decree, that the sand shall be placed for the bound of the sea. And again God spake to Moses, Thou hast not read the beginning of the Torah. I, yea, I, did speak, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and at that time I made the condition that the water shall divide before Israel. Take the rod that I gave unto thee, and go to the sea upon mine errand, and speak thus, I am the messenger sent by the Creator of the world. Uncover thy paths, O sea, for my children, that they may go through the midst of thee on dry ground. Moses spoke to the sea as God had bidden him, but it replied, I will not do according to thy words, for thou art only a man born of woman, and, besides, I am three days older than thou, O man, for I was brought forth on the third day of creation, and thou on the sixth. Moses lost no time, but carried back to God the words the sea has spoken, and the Lord said Moses, What does a master do with an intractable servant? He beats him with a rod, said Moses. Do thus. Ordered God. Lift up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. Thereupon Moses raised up his rod, the rod that had been created at the very beginning of the world, on which were graven in plain letters the great and exalted name, the names of the ten plagues inflicted upon the Egyptians, and the names of the three fathers, the six mothers, and the twelve tribes of Jacob. This rod he lifted up, and stretched it out over the sea. The sea, however, continued in its perverseness, and Moses entreated God to give his command direct to it. But God refused, saying, Were I to command the sea to divide, it would never again return to its former estate. Therefore, do thou convey my order to it, that it be not drained dry forever. But I will let a semblance of my strength accompany thee, and it will compel its obedience. When the sea saw the strength of God at the right hand of Moses, it spoke to the earth saying, Make hollow places for me, that I may hide myself therein before the Lord of all created things, blessed be he. Noticing the terror of the sea, Moses said to it, For a whole day I spoke to thee at the bidding of the Holy One, who desired thee to divide, but thou didst refuse to pay heed to my words. Even when I showed thee my rod, thou didst remain obdurate. What hath happened now that thou skippest hence? The sea replied, I am fleeing, not before thee, but before the Lord of all created things, that his name be magnified in all the earth. And the waters of the Red Sea divided, and not they alone, but all the waters in heaven and on earth, in whatever vessel it was, in cisterns, in wells, in caves, in casks, in pitchers, in drinking cups, and in glasses, and none of these waters return to their former estate until Israel has passed through the sea on dry land. The angel Gabriel was eager to drown the Egyptians during the same night, but God bade him wait until early the next day, until the hour of the morning watch, when Abraham had made himself ready to set out for the sacrifice of his son. Gabriel succeeded, however, in holding back the turbulent water about to sweep over Israel. 
to the wall of water on the right, he called, Beware of Israel, who will receive the law in time to come from the right hand of the Lord, and turning to the wall of water on the left, he said, Beware of Israel, who will wind the phylacteries about their left hand in time to come. The water behind he admonished, Beware of Israel, who will let the zizit drop down upon their back in time to come, and to the water towering in front of them, he called, Beware of Israel, who bear the sign of the covenant upon their bodies. God caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind, the wind he always makes use of when he chastises the nations. The same east wind had brought the deluge. It had laid the Tower of Babel in ruins. It was to cause the destruction of Samaria, Jerusalem, and Tyre. And it will, in future, be the instrument for castigating Rome drunken with pleasure. And likewise the sinners in Gehenna are punished by means of the east wind. All night long God made it to blow over the sea. To prevent the enemy from inflicting harm upon the Israelites, he enveloped the Egyptians in profound darkness, so impenetrable it could be felt, and none could move or change his posture. He that sat when it fell could not arise from his place, and he that stood could not sit down. Nevertheless, the Egyptians could see that the Israelites were surrounded by bright light, and were enjoying a banquet where they stood, and when they tried to speed darts and arrows against them, the missiles were caught up by the cloud and by the angels hovering between the two camps, and no harm came to Israel. The Passage Through the Red Sea On the morning after the eventful night, though the sea was not yet made dry land, the Israelites, full of trust in God, were ready to cast themselves into its waters. The tribes contended with one another for the honor of being the first to jump. Without awaiting the outcome of the wordy strife, the tribe of Benjamin sprang in, and the princes of Judah were so incensed at having been deprived of preeminence in danger that they pelted the Benjamites with stones. God knew that the Judeans and the Benjamites were animated by a praiseworthy purpose. The ones like the others desired but to magnify the name of God, and he rewarded both tribes. In Benjamin's allotment the Shekinah took up her residence, and the royalty of Israel was conferred upon Judah. When God saw the two tribes in the waves of the sea, he called upon Moses, and said, My beloved are in danger of drowning, and thou standest by and prattest. Bid Israel go forward, and thou lift up thy rod over the sea, and divide it. Thus it happened, and Israel passed through the sea with its water cleft in twain. The dividing of the sea was but the first of ten miracles connected with the passage of the Israelites through it. The others were that the waters united in a vault above their heads. Twelve paths opened up, one for each of the tribes. The water became transparent as glass, and each tribe could see the others. The soil underfoot was dry, but it changed into clay when the Egyptians stepped upon it. The walls of water transformed into rocks against which the Egyptians were thrown and dashed to death, while before the Israelites could slake their thirst. And, finally, the tenth wonder was, that this drinking water was congealed in the heart of the sea as soon as they had satisfied their need. And there were other miracles, besides. The sea yielded the Israelites whatever their hearts desired. If a child cried as it lay in the arms of its mother, she needed but to stretch out her hand and pluck an apple or some fruit and quiet it. The waters were piled up to the height of 1600 miles, and they could be seen by all the nations of the earth. The great wonder of Israel's passage through the sea took place in the presence of the three fathers and the six mothers, for God had fetched them out of their graves to the shores of the Red Sea, to be witnesses of the marvelous deeds wrought in behalf of their children. Wonderful as were the miracles connected with the rescue of the Israelites from the waters of the sea, those performed when the Egyptians were drowned were no less remarkable. First of all God felt called upon to defend Israel's cause before Uzzah, the angel of the Egyptians, who would not allow his people to perish in the waters of the sea. He appeared on the spot at the very moment when God wanted to drown the Egyptians, and he spake, O Lord of the world! Thou art called just and upright, and before thee there is no wrong, no forgetting, no respecting of persons. Why? Then, dost thou desire to make my children perish in the sea? Canst thou say that my children drowned or slew a single one of thine? If it be on account of the rigorous slavery that my children imposed upon Israel, then consider that thy children have received their wages, in that they took their silver and golden vessels from them. 
Then God convoked all the members of his celestial family, and he spake to the angel hosts, Judge ye in truth between me and yonder Uzzah, the angel of the Egyptians. At the first I brought a famine upon his people, and I appointed my friend Joseph over them, who saved them through his sagacity, and they all became his slaves. Then my children went down into their land as strangers, in consequence of the famine, and they made the children of Israel to serve with rigor in all manner of hard work there is in the world. They groaned on account of their bitter service, and their cry rose up to me, and I sent Moses and Aaron, my faithful messengers, to Pharaoh. When they came before the king of Egypt, they spake to him, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. In the presence of the kings of the east and of the west, the sinner began to boast, saying, Who is the Lord, that I should hearken unto his voice, to let Israel go? Why comes he not before me, like all the kings of the world, and why doth he not bring me a present like the others? This God of whom you speak, I know him not at all. Wait and let me search my lists, and see whether I can find his name. But his servant said, We have heard that he is the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Then Pharaoh asked my messengers, What are the works of this God? And they replied, He is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, who created the heaven and the earth. But Pharaoh doubted their words, and said, There is no God in all the world that can accomplish such works besides me, for I made myself, and I made the Nile River. Because he denied me thus, I sent ten plagues upon him, and he was compelled to let my children go. Yet, in spite of all, he did not leave off from his wicked ways, and he tried to bring them back under his bondage. Now, seeing all that hath happened to him, and that he will not acknowledge me as God and Lord, does he not deserve to be drowned in the sea with his host? The celestial family called out when the Lord had ended his defense, Thou hast every right to drown him in the sea. Uzzah heard their verdict, and he said, O Lord of all the worlds! I know that my people deserve the punishment thou hast decreed, but may it please thee to deal with them according to thy attribute of mercy, and take pity upon the work of thy hands, for thy tender mercies are over all thy works. Almost the Lord had yielded to Uzzah's entreaties, when Michael gave a sign to Gabriel that bade him fly to Egypt swiftly and fetch thence a brick for which a Hebrew child had been used as a mortar. Holding this incriminating object in his head, Gabriel stepped into the presence of God, and said, O Lord of the world! Wilt thou have compassion with the accursed nation that has slaughtered thy children so cruelly? Then the Lord turned himself away from his attribute of mercy, and seating himself upon his throne of justice he resolved to drown the Egyptians in the sea. The first upon whom judgment was executed was the angel of Egypt, Uzzah was thrown into the sea. A similar fate overtook Reb, the angel of the sea, with his hosts. Reb had made intercession before God in behalf of the Egyptians. He had said, Why shouldst thou drown the Egyptians? Let us suffice the Israelites that thou hast saved them out of the hand of their masters. At that God dealt Reb and his army a blow, under which they staggered and fell dead, and then he cast their corpses in the sea, whence its unpleasant odor. The destruction of the Egyptians. At the moment when the last of the Israelites stepped out of the bed of the sea, the first of the Egyptians set foot into it, but in the same instant the waters surged back into their wonted place, and all the Egyptians perished. But drowning was not the only punishment decreed upon them by God. He undertook a thoroughgoing campaign against them. When Pharaoh was preparing to persecute the Israelites, he asked his army which of the saddle beasts was the swiftest runner, that one he would use, and they said, There is none swifter than thy piebald mare, whose like is to be found nowhere in the world. Accordingly, Pharaoh mounted the mare, and pursued after the Israelites seaward. And while Pharaoh was inquiring of his army as to the swiftest animal to mount, God was questioning the angels as to the swiftest creature to use to the detriment of Pharaoh. And the angels answered, O Lord of the world! All thing are thine, and all are thine handiwork. Thou knowest well, and it is manifest before thee, that among all thy creatures there is none so quick as the wind that comes from under the throne of thy glory, and the Lord flew swiftly upon the wings of the wind. The angels now advanced to support the Lord in his war against the Egyptians. 
Some brought swords, some arrows, and some spears. But God warded them off, saying, Away! I need no help. The arrows sped by Pharaoh against the children of Israel were answered by the Lord with fiery darts directed against the Egyptians. Pharaoh's army advanced with gleaming swords, and the Lord sent out lightnings that disqualified the Egyptians. Pharaoh hurled missiles, and the Lord discharged hailstones and coals of fire against him. With trumpets, sackbuts, and horns the Egyptians made their assault, and the Lord thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice. In vain the Egyptians marched forward in orderly battle array. The Lord deprived them of their standards, and they were thrown into wild confusion. To lure them into the water, the Lord caused fiery steeds to swim out upon the sea, and the horses of the Egyptians followed them, each with a rider upon his back. Now the Egyptians tried to flee to their land in their chariots drawn by shemules. As they had treated the children of Israel in a way contrary to nature, so the Lord treated them now. Not the shemules pulled the chariots but the chariots, those fire from heaven had consumed their wheels, dragged the men and the beasts into the water. The chariots were laden with silver, gold, and all sorts of costly things, which the river Pishon, as it flows forth from paradise, carries down into the Gia. Thence the treasures flowed into the Red Sea, and by its waters they were tossed into the chariots of the Egyptians. It was the wish of Israel, and for this reason he caused the chariots to roll down into the sea, and the sea in turn to cast them out upon the opposite shore, at the feet of the Israelites. And the Lord fought against the Egyptians also with the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. The former made the soil miry, and the mire was heated to the boiling point by the latter, so that the hoofs of the horses dropped from their feet, and they could not budge from the spot. The anguish and the torture that God brought upon the Egyptians at the Red Sea caused them by far more excruciating pain than the plagues they had endured in Egypt, for at the sea delivered them into the hands of the angels of destruction, who tormented them pitilessly. Had God not endowed the Egyptians with a double portion of strength, they could not have stood the pain a single moment. The last judgment executed upon the Egyptians corresponded to the wicked designs harbored against Israel by the three different parties among them when they set out in pursuit of their liberated slaves. The first party had said, We will bring Israel back to Egypt. The second had said, We will strip them bare, and the third had said, We will slay them all. The Lord blew upon the first with his breath, and the sea covered them. The second party he shook into the sea, and the third he pitched into the depths of the abyss. He tossed them about as lentils are shaken up and down in a saucepan. The upper ones are made to fall to the bottom, the lower ones fly to the top. This was the experience of the Egyptians. And were still, first the rider and his beast were whisked high up in the air, and then the two together, the rider sitting upon the back of the beast, were hurled to the bottom of the sea. The Egyptians endeavored to save themselves from the sea by conjuring charms, for they were great magicians. Of the ten measures of magic allotted to the world, they had taken nine for themselves. And, indeed, they succeeded for the moment. They escaped out of the sea. But immediately the sea said to itself, How can I allow the pledge entrusted to me by God to be taken from me? And the water rushed after the Egyptians, and dragged back every man of them. Among the Egyptians were the two arch-magicians Jans and Jambers. They made wings for themselves, with which they flew up to heaven. They also said to Pharaoh, If God himself hath done this thing, we can effect naught. But if this work has been put into the hands of his angel, then we will shake his lieutenants into the sea. They proceeded at once to use their magic contrivances, whereby they dragged the angels down. These cried up to God, Save us. O God, for the waters are coming unto our soul. Speak thy word that will cause the magicians to drown in the mighty waters. And Gabriel cried to God, By the greatness of thy glory dash thy adversaries to pieces. Hereupon God bade Michael go and execute judgment upon the two magicians. The archangel seized hold of Jans and Jambres by the locks of their hair, and he shattered them against the surface of the water. Thus all the Egyptians were drowned. Only one was spared, Pharaoh himself. When the children of Israel raised their voices to sing a song of praise to God at the shores of the Red Sea, Pharaoh heard it as he was jostled hither and thither by the billows, 
and he pointed his finger heavenward, and called out, I believe in thee, O God. Thou art righteous, and I and my people are wicked, and I acknowledge now that there is no God in the world beside thee. Without a moment's delay, Gabriel descended and laid an iron chain about Pharaoh's neck, and holding him securely, he addressed him thus, Villain. Yesterday thou didst say, Who is the Lord that I should hearken to his voice? And now thou say yes, the Lord is righteous. With that he let him drop into the depths of the sea, and there he tortured him for fifty days, to make the power of God known to him. At the end of the time he installed him as king of the great city of Nineveh, and after the lapse of many centuries, when Jonah came to Nineveh, and prophesied the overthrow of the city on account of the evil done by the people, it was Pharaoh who, seized by fear and terror, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and with his own mouth made proclamation and published this decree through Nineveh, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. For I know there is no God beside him in all the world, all his words are truth, and all his judgments are true and faithful. Pharaoh never died, and never will die. He always stands at the portal of hell, and when the kings of the nations enter, he makes the power of God known to them at once, in these words, O ye fools! Why have ye not learned knowledge from me? I am denied the Lord God, and he brought ten plagues upon me, sent me to the bottom of the sea, kept me there for fifty days, released me then, and brought me up. Thus I could not but believe in him. God caused the Egyptians to be washed ashore in their death struggle. There were four reasons for this. The Israelites were not to say that as they themselves had escaped, so also the Egyptians had passed through the sea Drishad, only the latter had gone in another direction, and therefore had vanished from sight. The Egyptians, on the other hand, were not to think that the children of Israel had been drowned in the sea like themselves. In the third place, the Israelites were to have, as their booty, the silver, gold, and other precious things with which the Egyptians were decked. And, finally, the Israelites were to enjoy the satisfaction of seeing their enemies suffer. With their finger thy could point them out one by one, saying, This one way my task master, who beat me with those fists of his at which the dogs are now gnawing, and yonder Egyptian, the dogs are chewing the feet with which he kicked me. As they lay on the shore in their last agony, they had to witness their own destruction and the victory of the Israelites, and they also beheld the suffering of their brethren that had remained behind in Egypt, for God poured out his punishment over the whole people, whether in Egypt or at the Red Sea. As for the corpses by the shores of the sea, they did not remain unburied, the earth swallowed them, by way of reward for Pharaoh's having acknowledged the justice of the chastisement that had been inflicted upon king and people. Before their corpses had been disposed of in this way, there had been a quarrel between the earth and the sea. The sea said to the earth, Take thy children unto thyself, and the earth retorted, Keep those whom thou hast slain. The sea hesitated to do as the earth bade, for fear that God would demand them back on the day of judgment. And the earth hesitated, because it remembered with terror the curse that had been pronounced upon it for having sucked up Abel's blood. Only after God swore an oath, not to punish it for receiving the corpses of the Egyptians, would the earth swallow them. The Song at the Sea Mighty is faith, for the Spirit of God came upon the Israelites as a reward for their trust in God, and in the servant Moses. And it was in this exultation that they sang to the Lord a song that moved him to grant forgiveness for all their sins. This song was the second of the nine songs that in the course of history of Israel sang to their God. They assembled to sing the first in Egypt, on the night when they were freed from captivity. Their second was the song of triumph by the Red Sea. Their third, when the well sprang up in the wilderness. Moses sang the fourth before his death. The fifth was Joshua's song after his victory over the five Amorite kings. Deborah and Barak sang the sixth when they conquered Sisera. The seventh was David's psalm of thanksgiving to God for his deliverance out of the hand of all his enemies. The eighth was Solomon's song at the dedication of the temple. The ninth Jehoshaphat sang as, trusting in God, he went to battle against the Moabites and the Ammonites. The tenth and last song, however, will be that grand and mighty song, 
when Israel will raise their voice in triumph at their future deliverance, for that will be the final release of Israel for all time. When Israel prepared to sound their praises to God for delivering them from destruction in the Red Sea, God, to show his recognition of Israel's fulfillment of the token of the Abrahamic covenant, bade the angels who came to intone their song, Wait, let my children sing first, he said. This incident with the angels is like the story of the king who, upon returning from a victorious campaign, was told that his son and his servant were waiting with wreaths in their hands, and were asking who should first crown him. The king said, O oh ye fools, to question if my servant should walk before my son. No, let my son come first. This was the second time the angels were obliged to retire before Israel. When Israel stood by the Red Sea, before them the rolling waters, and behind them the hosts of Egypt, then, too, the angels appeared, to sing their daily song of praise to the Lord, but God called to them, Forbear. My children are in distress, and you would sing. But even after the men had completed their song, it was not yet given to the angels to raise their voices, for after the men followed the women of Israel, and only then came the turn of the angels. Then they began to murmur, and said, Is it not enough that the men have preceded us? Shall the women come before us also? But God replied, As surely as ye live, so it is. At first Israel requested their leader Moses to begin the song, but he declined, saying, No, ye shall begin it, for it is a greater mark of honor to be praised by the multitude than by a single one. At once the people sang, We will glorify the Eternal, for he has shown us signs and tokens. When the Egyptians passed the decree against us, and said, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, our mothers went into the field, and thou didst bid a sleep to fall upon them, and they bore us without any pain. And the angels descended from heaven, washed and anointed us, and robed us in many colored silken garments, and placed in our hands two lumps, one of butter and one of honey. When our mothers awoke and saw us washed, anointed, and clothed in silk, then they praised thee, and said, Praise be God who has not turned his grace and his lasting love from the seed of our father Abraham. And now behold, they are in thy hand, do with them as thou wilt. And they departed. When the Egyptians saw us, they approached to kill us, but thou in thy great mercy didst bid the earth swallow us and set us in another place, where we were not seen by the Egyptians, and lo! In this way didst thou save us from their hand. When we grew up, we wandered in troops to Egypt, where each recognized his parents and his family. All this hast thou done for us, therefore will we sing of thee. Thereupon Moses said, Ye have given thanks to the Holy One, blessed be he, and not I will praise his name, for to me also has he shown signs and tokens. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him and habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The song by the Red Sea was as much the song of Moses as of all Israel, for the great leader counted as not less than all the other Israelites together, and, besides, he had composed a large portion of the song. In virtue of the Spirit of God that possessed them while they sang, Moses and the people mutually supplemented each other, so that, as soon as Moses spoke half the verse, the people repeated it, and linked the second complementary part to it. So Moses began with the half verse. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, whereupon the people answered, The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And in this wise developed the whole song. But not alone the adults took part in the song, even the sucklings dropped their mother's breasts to join in singing. Yea, even the embryos in the womb joined the melody, and the angels' voices swelled the song. God so distinguished Israel during the passage through the Red Sea, that even the children beheld his glory, yea, even the woman slave saw more of the presence of God by the Red Sea than the prophet Ezekiel was ever permitted to behold. They closed the song with the words, Let us set the crown of glory upon the head of our Deliverer, who suffers all things to perish, but does not himself decay, who changes all things, but is himself unchanged. His is the diadem of sovereignty, for he is the King of kings in this world and his is the sovereignty of the world to come. It is as and will be as in all eternity. Thereupon Moses spake to Israel, 
ye have seen all the signs, all miracles and works of glory that the Holy One, blessed be He, hath wrought for you, but even more will He do for you in the world to come. For not like unto this world is the world of the hereafter. For in this world war and suffering, evil inclination, Satan, and the angel of death hold sway. But in the future would, there will be neither suffering nor enmity, neither Satan nor the angel of death, neither groans nor oppression, nor evil inclination. As Moses and the race that wandered from Egypt with him sang a song to the Lord by the Red Sea, so shall they sing again in the world to come. In the world to come, all generations will pass before the Lord and will ask him who should first intone the song of praise, whereupon he will reply, In the past it was the generation of Moses that offered up to me a song of praise. Let them do it now once more, and as Moses conducted the song by the Red Sea, so shall he do in the world of the hereafter. In other respects, too, it shall be in the world to come as it was at the time of the song by the sea. For when Israel intoned the song of praise, God put on a festive robe, on which were embroidered all the promises for a happy future to Israel. Among them were written, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them, and many similar promises. But when Israel sinned, God rent the festive robe, and he will not restore it, or put it on until the coming of the future world. After the men had completed the song, the women under the guidance of Miriam sang the same song to the accompaniment of music and dancing. The Israelites had had perfect faith, that God would perform for them miracles and deeds of glory, hence they had provided themselves with timbrels and with flutes, that they might have them at hand to glorify the anticipated miracles. Then Miriam said to the women, Let us sing unto the Lord, for strength and sublimity are his. He lords it over the lordly, and he resents presumption. He hurled Pharaoh's horses and chariots into the sea, and drowned them, because wicked Pharaoh in his presumption pursued God's people, Israel. The Awful Desert Just as Israel had displayed sullenness and lack of faith upon approaching the sea, so did they upon leaving it. Hardly had they seen that the Egyptians met death in the waters of the sea, when they spoke to Moses, and said, God had led us from Egypt only to grant us five tokens, to give us the wealth of Egypt, to let us walk in clouds of glory, to cleave the sea for us, to take vengeance on the Egyptians, and to let us sing him a song of praise. Now that all this has taken place, let us return to Egypt. Moses answered, The Eternal said, The Egyptians whom ye have seen today, Yes shall see them again no more forever. But the people were not yet content, and said, Now the Egyptians are all dead, and therefore we can return to Egypt. Then Moses said, You must now redeem your pledge, for God said, When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Still the people remained headstrong, and without giving heed to Moses, they set out on the road to Egypt under the guidance of an idol that they had brought with them out of Egypt, and had even retained during their passage through the sea. Only through sheer force was Moses able to restrain them from their sinful transgression. This was the second of the ten temptations with which Israel tempted God during their wanderings through the desert. There was one other difficulty with the people that Moses had to overcome, the sea cast up many jewels, pearls and other treasures that had belonged to the Egyptians, drowned in its waves and Israel found it hard to tear themselves away from the spot that brought them such riches. Moses, however, said, Do you really believe that the sea will continue to yield you pearls and jewels? From the sea they passed to the desert sure, a horrible and dreadful wilderness, full of snakes, lizards, and scorpions, extending over hundreds of miles. So deadly is the nature of the snakes that dwell in the desert, that if one of them merely glides over the shadow of a flying bird, the bird falls into pieces. It was in this desert that the following happened to King Shapur, a cohort that he sent through this desert was swallowed by a snake, and the same fate overtook a second and a third cohort. Upon the advice of his sages, he then filled the hides of animals with hot coals wrapped in straw, and had these cast before the snake until it expired. It was then a proof of Israel's great faith in their God, that they obeyed Moses, and without murmur or delay followed him into this frightful wilderness. Therefore did God reward them for their trust in him, 
for not only were they not harmed by the snakes and scorpions during their many year stay in the desert, but they were even relieved of the fear of the reptiles, for as soon as the snakes saw the Israelites, they meekly lay down upon the sand. For three days they marched through the desert, uncomplaining, but when their supply of water gave out, the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? While crossing through the Red Sea they had provided themselves with water, for, miraculously, the sea flowed sweet for them. And now when the supply was becoming exhausted, they began to give expression to their dissatisfaction. On this occasion they again betrayed their faint-heartedness, for instead of seeking advice from their leader Moses, they began to murmur against him and against God, even though at present they had not yet suffered from lack of water. So poorly did they stand the test to which God has put them, for in fact the very ground upon which they trod had running water beneath it, but they were not aware of this. God had desired to see how they would act under these conditions. The people were all the more exasperated because their joy, when they sighted the springs and hastened to draw from the, turned to keenest disappointment when they tasted of the water and found it bitter. These deluded hopes cast them down spiritually as well as physically, and grieved them, not so much for their own sakes as for those of their young children, to whose pleas for water they could not listen without tears. Some of the thoughtless and fickle of faith among them uttered the accusation that even the former kindness had been granted them so much as a benefit, but rather with a view to the present and much greater privation. These said that death by the hand of the enemy is to be thrice preferred to perishing by thirst. For by the wise man, speedy and painless departure from life is in no way to be distinguished from immortality. The only real death, however, is slow and painful dying for the dread lies not in being dead, but in dying. While they indulged in these lamentations, Moses prayed to God to forgive the faint of heart their unseemly words, and, furthermore, to supply the general want. Mindful of the distress of the people, Moses did not pray long, but uttered his request in a few words. And quickly, as he had prayed, was his prayer answered. God bade him take a piece of a laurel tree, write upon it the great and glorious name of God, and throw it into the water, whereupon the water would become drinkable and sweet. The ways of the Holy One, blessed be He, differed from the ways of man, man turns bitter to sweet by the agency of some sweet stuff, but God transformed the bitter water through the bitter laurel tree. When Israel beheld this miracle, they asked forgiveness of their Heavenly Father, and said, O Lord of the world! We sin against thee when we murmured about the water. Not through this miracle alone, however, has Merah become a significant spot for Israel, but, especially, because their God gave to Israel important percepts, like the Sabbath rest, marriage and civil laws, and said to the people, If you will observe these statutes, you will receive many more, the Ten Commandments, the Halakot, and the Haggadot. The Torah, however, will bring you happiness in life. If you will diligently endeavor to walk through life uprightly, so that you will be virtuous in your dealing with men, I will value it as if you had fulfilled all commandments, and will put upon you none of those diseases that I brought Egypt. If, however, you will not be mindful of my laws, and will be visited by diseases, then will I be you physician and will make you well, for as soon as you will observe the laws, shall the diseases vanish. The cause for the want of water at Merah had been that for three days the people had neglected the study of the Torah, and it was for this reason that the prophets and elders of Israel instituted the custom of reading from the Torah on Saturday, Monday and Thursday, at the public service, so that three days might never again pass without a reading from the Torah. From Merah they moved on to Elam. From a distance palm trees made the place look inviting enough, but when the people came close, they were again disappointed. There were not more than three score and ten palm tress, and there were of stunted growth owing to a lack of water, for in spite of the presence of twelve wells of water, the soil was so barren and sandy that the wells were not sufficient to water it. Here again the marvelous intercession of God in favor of the fate of Israel is shown, for the scant supply of water at Elam, which had hardly sufficed for seventy palm trees, satisfied sixty myriads of the wandering people that stayed there for several days. The men of understanding could at this place see a clear allusion to the fortune of the people. For there are twelve tribes of the people, each of which, if it prove God-fearing, 
will be a well of water, inasmuch as its piety will constantly and continually bring forth beautiful deeds. The leaders of the people, however, are seventy, and they recall the noble palm tree, for in outward appearance as well as in its fruits, it is the most beautiful of trees, whose seed of life does not lie buried deep in the roots, as with other plants, but soars high, set like the heart in the midst of its branches, by which it is surrounded as a queen under the protection of her bodyguard. The soul of him who has tasted piety possesses a similar spirit. It has learned to look up and ascend, and itself ever busy with spiritual things in the investigation of divine beauty, disdains earthly things, and considers them only a childish play, whereas that aspiration alone seems serious. It was at Elam, where, at the creation of the world, God had made the twelve wells of water, and the seventy palm trees, to correspond to the twelve tribes and the seventy elders of Israel, that Israel first took up the study of the law, for there they studied the laws given them at Merah. The Heavenly Food The bread which Israel had taken along out of Egypt sufficed for thirty-one days, and when they had consumed it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against their leader Moses. It was not only immediate want that oppressed them, but despair of a food supply for the future. For when they saw the vast, extensive, utterly barren wilderness before them, their courage gave way, and they said, We migrated, expecting freedom, and now we are not even free from the cares of subsistence. We are not, as our leader promised, the happiest, but in truth the most unfortunate of men. After our leader's words had keyed us to the highest pitch of expectation, and had filled our ears with vain hopes, he tortures us with famine and does not provide even the necessary food. With the name of a new settlement he has deceived this great multitude. After he had succeeded in leading us from a well-known to an uninhabited land, he now plans to send us to the underworld, the last road of life. Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord during the three days of darkness in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. In their exasperation they spoke untruths, for in reality they had suffered from want of food in Egypt, too, as the Egyptians had not given them enough to eat. In spite of the railings against him, Moses was not so much indignant about their words as about the fickleness of the people. After those many quite extraordinary experiences they had no right to expect merely the natural and the probable, but should cheerfully have trusted him. For, truly, in the sight of all, they had been shown the most tangible proofs of his reliability. When, on the other hand, Moses considered their distress, he forgave them. For he told himself that a multitude is by nature fickle, and allows itself to be easily influenced by impressions of the moment, which cast the past into oblivion, and engender despair of the future. God also forgave the unworthy conduct of Israel, and instead of being angry with them because they murmured against him, when it should have been their duty to pray to him, he was ready to grant them aid, saying to Moses, They act according to their lights, and I will act according to mine. Not later than tomorrow morning manna will descend from heaven. As a reward for Abraham's readiness, in answer to the summons to sacrifice Isaac, when he said, Here am I, God promised manna to the descendants of Abraham with the same words, Here I am in the same way, during their wanderings through the wilderness, God repaid the descendants of Abraham for what their ancestor had done by the angels who visited him. He himself had fetched bread for them, and likewise God himself caused bread to rain from heaven. He himself ran before them on their way, and likewise God moved before Israel. He had water fetched for them, and likewise God, through Moses, caused water to flow from the rock. He bade them seek shade under the tree, and likewise God had a cloud spread over Israel. Then God spoke to Moses, I will immediately reveal myself without Jacob, I will rain bread from my treasure in heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. There were good reasons for not exceeding a day's ration in the daily downpour of manna. First, that they might be spared the need of carrying it on their wanderings. Secondly, that they might daily receive it hot. And, lastly, that they might day by day depend upon God's aid, and in this way exercise themselves in faith. While the people were still abed, God fulfilled their desire and rained down manna for them. For this food had been created on the second day of creation, and ground by the angels, 
it later descended for the wanderers in the wilderness. The mills are stationed in the third heaven, where manna is constantly being ground for the future use of the pious. For in the future world manna will be set before them. Manna deserves its name, bread of the angels, not only because it is prepared by them, but because those who partake of it become equal to the angels in strength, and, furthermore, like them, have no need of easing themselves, as manna is entirely dissolved in the body. Not until they sinned, did they have to ease themselves like ordinary mortals. Manna also showed its heavenly origin in the miraculous flavor it possessed. There was no need of cooking or baking it, nor did it require any other preparation and still it contained the flavor of every conceivable dish. One had only to desire a certain dish, and no sooner had he thought of it, than manna had the flavor of the dish desire. The same food had a different taste to every one who partook of it, according to his age. To the little children it tasted like milk, to the strong youths like bread, to the old men like honey, to the sick like barley steeped in oil and honey. As miraculous as the taste of manna was it descent from heaven. First came a north wind to sweep the floor of the desert. Then a rain to wash it quite clean. Then dew descended upon it, which was congealed into a solid substance by the wind, that it might serve as a table for the heaven-descending gold. But, that no insects or vermin might settle on the manna, the frozen dew formed not only a tablecloth, but also a cover for the manna, so that it lay enclosed there as in a casket, protected from soiling or pollution above and below. The Gathering of the Manna With an easy mind every individual might perform his morning prayer in his house and recite the Shema, then betake himself to the entrance of his tent, and gather manna for himself and all his family. The gathering of manna caused little trouble, and those among the people who were too lazy to perform even the slightest work, went out while manna fell, so that it fell straight into their hands. The manna lasted until the fourth hour of the day, when it melted. But even the melted manna was not wasted, for out of it formed the rivers, from which the pious will drink in the hereafter. The heathen even then attempted to drink out of these streams, but the manna that tasted so deliciously to the Jews, had a quite bitter taste in the mouth of the heathen. Only indirectly could they partake of the enjoyment of manna, they used to catch the animals that drank the melted manna, and even at this form it was so delicious that the heathen cried, Happy is the people that is in such a case. For the descent of manna was not a secret to the heathen, as it settled at such enormous heights that the kings of the east and of the west could see how Israel received its miraculous food. The mass of the manna was in proportion to its height, for as much descended day by day, as might have satisfied the wants of sixty myriads of people, through two thousand years. Such profusion of manna fell over the body of Joshua alone, as might have sufficed for the maintenance of the whole congregation. Manna indeed, had the peculiarity of falling to every individual in the same measure. And when, after gathering, they measured it, they found that there was an omer for every man. Many lawsuits were amicably decided through the fall of manna. If a married couple came before Moses, each accusing the other of inconstancy, Moses would say to them, Tomorrow morning judgment will be given. If, then, manna descended for the wife before the house of her husband, it was known that he was in the right. But if her share descended before the house of her own parents, she was in the right. The only days on which manna did not descend were the Sabbaths and the holy days, but then a double portion fell on the preceding day. These days had the further distinction that, while they lasted, the color of the manna sparkled more than usual, and it tasted better than usual. The people, however, were faint-hearted, and on the very first Sabbath, they wanted to go out as usual to gather manna in the morning, although announcement had been made that God would send them no food on that day. Moses, however, restrained them. They attempted to do it again toward evening, and again Moses restrained them with the words, Today ye shall not find it in the field. At these words they were greatly alarmed, for they feared that they might not receive it any more at all, but their leader quieted them with the words, Today ye shall not find any of it but assuredly tomorrow. In this world ye shall not receive manna on the Sabbath, but assuredly in the future world. The unbelieving among them did not hearken to the words of God, and went out on the Sabbath to find manna. Hereupon God said to Moses, Announce these words to Israel, 
I have led you out of Egypt, have cleft the sea for you, have sent you manna, have caused the well of water to spring up for you, have sent the quails to come up to you, have battled for you against Amalek, and wrought other miracles for you, and still you do not obey my statutes and commandments. You have not even the excuse that I imposed full many commandments upon you, for all that I bade you do at Merah, was to observe the Sabbath, but you have violated it. If, continues Moses, you will observe the Sabbath, God will give you three festivals in the months of Nisan, Siwan, and Tishri. And as a reward for the observance of the Sabbath, you will receive six gifts from God, the land of Israel, the future world, the new world, the sovereignty of the dynasty of David, the institution of the priests and the Levites. And, furthermore, as a reward for the observance of the Sabbath, you shall be freed from the three great afflictions, from the sufferings of the times of Gog and Magog, from the travails of the messianic time, and from the day of the great judgment. When Israel heard these exhortations and promises, they determined to observe the Sabbath, and did so. They did not know, to be sure, what they had lost through their violation of the first Sabbath. Had Israel then observed the Sabbath, no nation would ever have been able to exercise any authority over them. This, moreover, was not the only sin that Israel committed during this time, for some among them also broke the other commandment in regard to manna, that it, not to store it away from day to day. These sinners were none other than the infamous pair, Dathan and Abiram, who did not hearken to the word of God, but save the manna for the following day. But if they fancied they could conceal their sinful deed, they were mistaken, for great swarms of worms bred from the manna and these moved in a long train from their tents to the other tents, so that everyone perceived what these two had done. To serve future generations as a tangible proof of the infinite power of God, the Lord bade Moses lay an earthen vessel full of manna before the holy ark, and this command was carried out by Aaron in the second year of the wanderings through the desert. When, many centuries later, the prophet Jeremiah exhorted his contemporaries to study the Torah, and they answered his exhortations saying, How shall we then maintain ourselves? The prophet brought forth the vessel with manna, and spoke to them, saying, O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. See what it was that served your fathers as food when they applied themselves to the study of the Torah. You, too, will God support in the same way, if you will but devote yourselves to the study of the Torah. When the imminent destruction of the temple was announced to King Josiah, he concealed the holy ark, and with it also the vessel with manna, as well as the jug filled with sacred oil, which was used by Moses for anointing the sacred implements, and other sacred objects. In the messianic time the prophet Elijah will restore all these concealed objects. Israel received three gifts during their wanderings through the desert, the well, the clouds of glory, and the manna. The first for the merits of Miriam, the second for those of Aaron, and the third for those of Moses. When Miriam died, the well disappeared for a time, but it reappeared as a reward for the merits of Aaron and Moses. When Aaron dies, the clouds of glory disappeared for a time, but reappeared owing to the merits of Moses. But when the last name died, the well, the clouds of glory, and the manna disappeared forever. Throughout forty years, however, manna served them not only as food, but also as provender for their cattle, for the dew that preceded the fall of manna during the night brought grain for their cattle. Manna also replaced perfume for them, for it shed an excellent fragrance upon those who ate of it. In spite of all the excellent qualities of manna, they were not satisfied with it, and demanded that Moses and Aaron give them flesh to eat. These replied, We might put up with you if you murmur only against us, but you murmur against the Eternal. Come forward that you may hear the judgment of God. At once God appeared to Moses, and said to him, It is revealed to me what the congregation of Israel have said, and what they will say, but tell them this, you have demanded two things. You have desired bread, and I gave it to you, because man cannot exist without it. But now, filled to satiety, you demand flesh. This also will I give you, so that you might not say if your wish were denied. God cannot grant it, but at some future time you shall make atonement for it. I am a judge and shall assign punishment for this. In the meantime, however, God granted their wish, 
and toward evening thick swarms of quails came up from the sea, and covered the whole camp, taking their flight quite low, not two ells above the ground, so that they might be easily caught. Contrary to the manna, which fell in the morning, the quails did not come before evenfall. With a radiant countenance God gave them the former, as their desire for bread was justified, but with a darkened mean, under cover of night, he sent quails. Now, because the one food came in the morning and the second in the evening, Moses instituted the custom among his people of taking two meals a day, one in the morning and one in the evening. And he set the meal with the use of meat for the evening. At the same time he taught them the prayer in which they were to offer thanks after eating manna, which read, Blessed be thou, O God our Lord, King of the world, who in thy bounty, dost provide for all the world. Who, in thy grace, goodwill, and mercy, dost grant food to every creature, for thy grace is everlasting. Thanks to thy bounty we have never lacked food, nor ever shall lack it, for thy great name's sake. For thou suppliest and providest for all. Thou art bountiful, and nourishest all thy creatures which thou hast made. Blessed be thou, O God, that dost provide for all. Miriam's well. Relieved as they were of all the cares of subsistence through the gift of manna, it was plainly the duty of the Israelites to devote themselves exclusively to the study of the Torah. When, therefore, they slackened in the performance of this duty, punishment in the form of lack of water immediately overtook them. This was the first time that they actually experienced this want, for at Merah nothing more than alarm that this need might come upon them, had caused them to murmur and complain. In their distress they once more unreasonably cast reproaches upon their leader, and disputed with him, saying, Wherefore is this, children, that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us, and our children, and our cattle with thirst? Moses replied, As often as you quarrel with me, you tempt God, but God performeth wonders and excellent deeds for you, as often as you dispute with me, that his name may sound in glory throughout the world. In spite of the injury they had done him, Moses prayed to God that he might aid them in their distress and also stand by him. O Lord of the world! said he, I am surely doomed to die. Thou biddest me not to be offended with them, but if I obey thy words, I shall certainly be killed by them. God, however, replied, Try thou to act like me. As I return good for evil, so do thou return to them good for evil, and forgive their trespass. Go on before the people and we shall see who dares touch thee. Hardly had Moses shown himself to the people, when all of them rose reverently from their seats, whereupon God said to Moses, How often have I told thee not to be angry with them, but to lead them, as a shepherd leads his flock? It is for their sake that I have set thee on this height, and only for their sake wilt thou find grace, goodwill, and mercy in my sight. Then God bade him go with some elders to the rock on Horeb, and fetch water out of it. The elders were to accompany him there, that they might be convinced that he was not bringing water from a well, but smiting it from a rock. To accomplish this miracle, God bade him smite the rock with his rod, as the people labored under the impression that this rod could only bring destruction, for through its agency Moses had brought the ten plagues upon the Egyptians in Egypt, and at the Red Sea. Now they were to see that it could work good also. Upon God's bidding, Moses told the people to choose from which rock they wished water to flow, and hardly had Moses touched with his sapphire rod the rock which they had chosen, when plenteous water flowed from it. The spot where this occurred, God called Massa, in Meribah, because Israel had there tried their God, saying, If God is Lord over all, as over us, if he satisfies our needs, and will further show us that he knows our thoughts, then will we serve him, but not otherwise. The water that flowed for them on this spot served not only as a relief for their present need, but on this occasion there was revealed to them a well of water, which did not abandon them in all their forty years wandering, but accompanied them on all their marches. God wrought this great miracle for the merits of the prophetess Miriam, wherefore also it was called Miriam's well. But as well dates back to the beginning of the world, for God created it on the second day of the creation and at one time it was in the possession of Abraham. It was this same well that Abraham demanded back from Abimelech, king of the Philistines, after the king's servants had violently taken it away.
But when Abimelech pretended not to know anything about it, saying, I want not who hath done this thing, Abraham said, Thou and I will send sheep to the well, and he shall be declared the rightful owner of the well, for who sheep the water will spout forth to water them. And, continued Abraham, from that same well shall the seventh generation after me, the wanderers in the desert, draw their supply. This well was in the shape of a sieve-like rock, out of which water gushes forth as from a spout. It followed them on all their wanderings, uphill and down dale, and wherever they halted, it halted, too, and it settled opposite the tabernacle. Thereupon the leaders of the twelve tribes would appear, each with his staff and chant these words to the well, Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. Nobles of the people digged it by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves. Then the water would gush forth from the depths of the well, and shoot up high as pillars, then discharge itself into great streams that were navigable, and on these rivers the Jews sailed to the ocean, and hauled all the treasures of the world therefrom. The different parts of the camp were separated by these rivers, so that women, visiting each other, were obliged to make use of ships. Then the water discharged itself beyond the encampment, where it surrounded a great plain, in which grew every conceivable kind of plant and tree. And these trees, owing to the miraculous water, daily bore fresh fruits. This well brought fragrant herbs with it, so that the women had no need of perfumes on the march, for the herbs they gathered served this purpose. This well furthermore threw down soft, fragrant kinds of grass that served as pleasant couches for the poor, who had no pillows or bedclothes. Upon the entrance to the Holy Land this well disappeared and was hidden in a certain spot of the Sea of Tiberias. Standing upon Carmel, and looking over the sea, one can notice there a sieve-like rock, and that is the well of Miriam. Once upon a time it happened that a leper bathed at this place of the Sea of Tiberias, and hardly had he come in contact with the waters of Miriam's well when he was instantly healed. Amalek's war against Israel. As a punishment because they had not had sufficient faith in God, and had doubted whether he could fulfill all their wishes, and had grown negligent in the study of the Torah and in the observance of the laws, God turned Amalek against them during their sojourn in Rephidim, where they had committed these sins. God dealt with them as did that man with his son, whom he bore through the river on his shoulders. Whenever the child saw something desirable, he said, Father, buy it for me, and he fulfilled the child's wish. After the son had in this way received many beautiful things from his father, he called to a passing stranger with these words, Hast thou perhaps seen my father? Then, indignantly, the father said to his son, O thou fool, that sittest on my shoulder! All that thou didst desire, did I procure for thee, and now dost thou ask of that man, Hast thou seen my father? Thereupon the father threw the child off his shoulder, and a dog came and bit him. So did Israel fare. When they moved out of Egypt, God enveloped them in seven clouds of glory. They wished for bread, and he gave them manna. They wished for flesh, and he gave them quails. After all their wishes had been granted, they began to doubt, saying, Is the Lord among us, or not? Then God answered, You doubt my power. So surely as you live shall you discover it. The dog will soon bite you. Then came Amalek. This enemy of Israel bore the name Amalek to denote the rapidity with which he moved against Israel, for like a swarm of locusts he flew upon them. And the name furthermore designates the purpose of this enemy, who came to suck the blood of Israel. This Amalek was a son of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, and although the descendants of Jacob had been weaker and more insignificant in earlier times, Amalek had left them in peace, for he had excellent reasons to delay his attack. God had revealed to Abraham that his seed would have to serve in the land of the Egyptians, and had put the payment of this debt upon Isaac, and after his death, upon Jacob and his descendants. The wicked Amalek now said to himself, if I destroy Jacob and his descendants, God will impose the Egyptians' bondage upon me, grandson of Esau, descendant of Abraham. Therefore he kept himself in restraint as long as Israel dwelt in Egypt, but only after the bondage predicted to the seed of Abraham had been served in full, did he set out to accomplish the war of annihilation against Israel, which his grandfather Esau had enjoined upon him. No sooner had he heard of Israel's departure from Egypt, 
Then he set out against them and met them by the Red Sea. There, indeed, he could work them no ill, for Moses uttered against him the ineffable name. And so great was his confusion, that he was forced to retreat without having effected his object. Then, for some time, he tried lying hidden in ambush, and in this wise molesting Israel, but as length he gave up this game of hide and seek, and with a bold front revealed himself as the open enemy of Israel. Not alone, however, did he himself declare war upon Israel, but he also seduced all the heathen nations to assist him in his enterprise against Israel. Although these declined to war upon Israel, fearing that they might have to fare like the Egyptians, they agreed to the following plan of Amalek. He said, Follow my expedition. Should Israel conquer me, there will still be plenty of time for you to flee, but should success crown my attempt, join your fate to mine, in my undertaking against Israel. So Amalek now marched from a settlement in Seir, which was no less than 400 parasangs away from the encampment of the Jews. And although five nations, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, had their dwellings between his home and the camp of the Jews, he insisted upon being the first to declare war upon Israel. God punished Israel, who had shown themselves an ungrateful people, by sending against them an enemy that was ungrateful, too, never recalling that he owed his life to the sons of Jacob, who had had him in their power after their brilliant victory over Esau and his followers. In his expedition against Israel he made use of his kinsmen. Before going over to open attack, he lured many unsuspecting Jews to death by his kindly words. He had fetched from Egypt the table of descent of the Jews. For every Jew had there to mark his name on the bricks produced by him, and these lists lay in the Egyptian archives. Familiar with the names of the different Jewish families, Amalek appeared before the Jewish camp, and calling the people by name, he invited them to leave the camp, and come out to him. Reuben. Simeon. Levi etc., he would call, come out to me, your brother, and transact business with me. Those who answered the enticing call, found certain death at his hands. And not only did Amalek kill them, but he also mutilated their corpses, following the example of his grandsire Esau, by cutting off a certain part of the body, and throwing it toward heaven with the mocking words, Here shalt thou have what thou desirest. In this way did he jeer at the token of the Abrahamic covenant. So long as the Jews remained within the encampment, he could, of course, do them no harm, for the cloud enveloped them, and under its shelter they were as well fortified as a city that is surrounded by a solid wall. The cloud, however, covered those only who were pure, but the unclean had to stay beyond it, until they were cleansed by a ritual bath, and these Amalek caught and killed. The sinners, too, particularly the tribe of Dan, who were all worshippers of idols, were not protected by the cloud, and therefore exposed to the attacks of Amalek. Moses did not himself set out to battle against this dangerous foe of Israel, but he sent his servant Joshua, and for good reasons. Moses knew that only a descendant of Rachel, like the Ephraimite Joshua, could conquer the descendant of Esau. All the sons of Jacob had taken part in the unbrotherly act of selling Joseph as a slave hence none of their descendants might stand up in battle against the descendant of Esau. For they who had themselves acted unnaturally to a brother, could hardly hope for God's assistance in a struggle with the unbrotherly Edomites. Only the descendants of Joseph, the man who had been generous and good to his brothers, might hope that God would grant them aid against the unbrotherly descendants of Esau. In many other respects, too, Joseph was the opposite of Esau and his services stood his descendants in good stead in their battles against the descendants of Esau. Esau was the firstborn of his father, but through his evil deeds he lost his birthright. Joseph, on the other hand, was the youngest of his father's sons, and through his good deeds was he found worthy of enjoying the rights of a firstborn son. Joseph had faith in the resurrection, while Esau denied it. Hence God said, Joseph, the devout, shall be the one to visit merited punishment on Esau, the unbelieving. Joseph associated with two wicked men, Potiphar and Pharaoh, yet he did not follow their example. Esau associated with two pious men, his father and his brother, yet he did not follow their example. 
Hence, said God, Joseph, who did not follow example of wicked men, shall visit punishment upon him who did not follow the example of pious men. Esau soiled his life with lewdness and murder. Joseph was chaste and shunned bloodshed, hence God delivered Esau's descendants into the hands of Joseph's descendants. And, as in the course of history only the descendants of Joseph were victorious over the descendants of Esau, so will it be in the future, at the final reckoning between the angel of Esau and the angels of the Jews. The angel of Reuben will be rebuffed by the angel of Esau with these words, you represent on who had illegal relations with his father's wife. The angels of Simeon and Levi will have the listen to this reproof, you represent people who slew the inhabitants of Shechem. The angel of Judah will be repulsed with the words, Judah had illicit relations with his daughter-in-law. And the angels of the other tribes will be repulsed by Esau's angel, when he points out to them that they all took part in selling Joseph. The only one whom he will not be able to repulse will be Joseph's angel, to whom he will be delivered and by whom he will be destroyed. Joseph will be the flame and Esau the straw burned in the flame. Amalek defeated. Moses now instructed Joshua in regard to his campaign against Amalek, saying, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. The words choose us characterize the modesty of Moses, who treated his disciple Joshua as an equal. In these words he has taught us that the honor of our disciples should stand as high as our own. Joshua did not at first want to expose himself to danger and leave the protection of the cloud, but Moses said to him, Abandon the cloud and set forth against Amalek, if ever thou dost hope to set the crown upon thy head. He commanded him to choose his warriors from among the pious and God-fearing, and promised him that he would set a fast day for the following day, and implore God, in behalf of the good deeds of the patriarchs and the wives of the patriarchs, to stand by Israel in this war. Joshua acted in accordance with these commands and set out against Amalek to conquer whom required not only skillful strategy, but also a deafness in the art of magic. For Malek was a great magician and knew that propitious and the unpropitious hour of each individual, and in this way regulated his attacks against Israel. He attacked that one at night, whose death had been predicted for a night, and him whose death had been preordained for a day did he attack by day. But in this art, too, Joshua was his match, for he, too, knew how to time properly the attack upon individuals, and he destroyed Amalek, his sons, the armies he himself commanded, and those under the leadership of his sons. But in the very heat of battle, Joshua treated his enemies humanely, he did not repay like with like. Far was it from him to follow Amalek's example in mutilating the corpses of the enemy. Instead with a sharp sword he cut off the enemy's heads, an execution that does not dishonor. But only through the aid of Moses, did Joshua with his victory. Moses did not go out into battle, but through his prayer and through his influence upon the people in inspiring them with faith, the battle was won. While the battle raged between Israel and Amalek, Moses was stationed on a height, where, supported by the Levite Aaron and the Judean Hur, the representatives of the two noble tribes Levi and Judah, he fervently implored God's aid. He said, O Lord of the world! Through me hast thou brought Israel out of Egypt, through me hast thou cleft the sea, and through me hast thou wrought miracles. So do thou now work miracles for me, and lend me victory to Israel, for I well know that while all other nations fight only to the sixth hour of the day, the sinful nations stand in battle ranks till sunset. Moses did not consider it sufficient to pray alone to God but he raised his hands toward heaven as a signal for the whole nation to follow his example and trust in God. As often as he then raised his hands to heaven and the people prayed with him, trusting that God would lend them victory, they were indeed victorious. As often, however, as Moses let down his hands and the people ceased prayer, weakening in their faith in God, Amalek conquered. But it was hard for Moses constantly to raise his hands. This was God's way of punishing him for being somewhat negligent in the preparations for the war against Amalek. Hence Aaron and her were obliged to hold up his arms and assist him in his prayer. As, furthermore, he was unable to stand all that time, he seated himself on a stone, disdaining a soft and comfortable seat, saying, So long as Israel is in distress, I shall share it with them. At evenfall, the battle was not yet decided, 
Therefore Moses prayed to God that he might stay at the setting of the sun and thus enable Israel to draw the battle to a close. God granted this prayer, for the sun did not set until Israel had completely destroyed their enemy. Thereupon Moses blessed Joshua with the words, Some day the sun shall stand still for thy sake, as it did today for mine, and this blessing was later fulfilled at Gibeon, when the sun stood still to help Joshua in his battle against the Amorites. Although Amalek had not received the merited punishment from the hands of Joshua, still his enterprise against Israel had not been entirely unavailing. The miraculous exodus of Israel out of Egypt, and especially the cleaving of the sea, had created such alarm among the heathens, that none among them had dared to approach Israel. But this fear vanished as soon as Amalek attempted to compete in battle with Israel. Although he was terrible beaten, still the fear of the inaccessibility of Israel was gone. It was with Amalek as with that foolhardy white who plunged into a scalding hot tub. He squalded himself terribly, yet the tub became cold through his plunge into it. Hence God was not content with the punishment Amalek received in the time of Moses, but swore by his throne and by his right hand that he would never forget Amalek's misdeeds, that in this world as well as in the time of the Messiah he would visit punishment upon him, and would completely exterminate him in the future world. So long as the seed of Amalek exist, the face of God is, as it were, covered, and will only then come to view, when the seed of Amalek shall have been entirely exterminated. God had at first left the war against Amalek in the hands of his people, therefore he bade Joshua, the future leader of the people, never to forget the war against Amalek. And if Moses had listened intently, he would have perceived from this command of God that Joshua was destined to lead the people into the promised land. But later, when Amalek took part in the destruction of Jerusalem, God himself took up the war against Amalek, saying, by my throne I vow not to leave a single descendant of Amalek under the heavens, yea, no one shall even be able to say that this sheep or that weather belong to an Amalekite. God bade Moses impress upon the Jews to repulse no heathen should he desire conversion, but never to accept an Amalekite as a proselyte. It was in consideration of this word of God that David slew the Amalekite, who announced to him the death of Saul and Jonathan. For he saw in him only a heathen, although he appeared in the guise of a Jew. Part of the blame for the destruction of Amalek falls upon his father, Eliphaz. He used to say to Amalek, My son, dost thou indeed know who will possess this world and the future world? Amalek paid no attention to his allusion to the future fortune of Israel, and his father urged it no more strongly upon him, although it would have been his duty to instruct his son clearly and fully. He should have said to him, My son, Israel will possess this world as well as the future world. Dig wells then for their use and build road for them, so that thou mayest be judged worthy to share in the future world. But as Amalek had not been sufficiently instructed by his father, in his wantonness he undertook to destroy the whole world. God, who tries the reins in the heart, said to him, O thou fool, I created thee after all the seventy nations, but for thy sins thou shalt be the first to descend into hell. To glorify the victory over Amalek, Moses built an altar, which God called my miracle, for the miracle God wrought against Amalek in the war of Israel was, as it were, a miracle for God. For so long as the Israelites dwell in sorrow, God feels with them, and a joy for Israel is a joy for God, hence, too, the miraculous victory over Israel's foe was a victory for God. Jethro Smite a scorner, and the simple will beware. The destruction of Amalek brought Jethro to his senses. Jethro was originally in the same plot with Amalek, both having incited Pharaoh against Israel, but when he saw that Amalek lost this world and the other, he repented of his sinful ways, saying, There is nothing left to me but to go over to the God of Israel. And although he dwelt in the greatest wealth and honor, he determined to set out for the desert, to Moses and his God. Arrived at the camp of Israel, he could not enter it, for it was enveloped by a cloud that none could pierce, hence he wrote a letter to Moses and shot it off with an arrow, so that it fell into the camp. The letter read, I adjure thee, by thy two sons and by thy God, to come to meet me and receive me kindly. If thou wilt not do it for my sake, do it for thy wife's sake. And if thou wilt not do it for her sake, do it for thy son's sake. 
for Jethro brought with him his daughter Zipporah, from whom Moses had been divorced, as well as her two sons, her only children, for after her separation from Moses, she had wed no other man. At first Moses was inclined to give no ear to this letter, but God said to him, I, through whose word the world came into being, I bring men to me and do not thrust them back. I permitted Jethro to approach me, and did not push him from me. So do thou, too, receive this man, who desires to betake himself under the wings of the Shekinah, let him approach, and do not repulse him. God herewith taught Moses that one should repulse with the left hand, and beckon with the right. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, together with the seventy elders of Israel, carrying with them the sacred ark, hastened to welcome Jethro kindly. And Moses so honored his father-in-law as to make an obeisance before him and kiss him. Before Moses told his father-in-law of the great miracles God had wrought for Egypt, such as the exodus from Egypt, the cleaving of the sea, the rain of manna, and the rest, he offered him the greeting of peace. For great is peace, that precedes event he prays of God. After the peace greeting, Moses, to draw his father-in-law nearer to true faith in God and his revelation, began to relate to him the miracles that God had wrought for them at the exodus from Egypt, during the passing through the Red Sea, and during the war with Amalek. He said, Moreover, in the manna that God gives us we perceive the taste of bread, of meat, of fish, in short, of all the dishes there are. Out of the well that God gives us we draw a drink that possesses the taste of old wine as well as new, of milk and of honey, in short, of all the beverages that exist. We shall, Moses continued, receive six other gifts from God, the land of Israel, the future world, the new world, the sovereignty of David, the institution of priests, and of Levites. When Jethro heard all this, he determined to become a Jew and to believe in the only God, and although he felt a pang at heart upon hearing that the Egyptians had perished, for no one should scoff at a heathen before a proselyte who is not a Jew of ten generations standing, still he burst into a song of praise to God for the deeds he had won for his people. In truth, it reflects shame upon Moses and the sixty myriads of Jews that they had not given thanks to God for the release from Egypt, until Jethro came and did so. He said, Praised be God who delivered Moses and Aaron, as well as the whole nation of Israel, from the bondage of Pharaoh, that great dragon, and of the Egyptians. Truly, great is the Lord before all gods, for whereas formerly not a single slave succeeded in escaping from Egypt, he led sixty myriads out of Egypt. There is no God whom I had not, at some time in my life, worship, but not I must admit that none is like the God of Israel. This God had not been unbeknown to me heretofore, but now I know him better, for his fame will sound throughout the world, because he visited upon the Egyptians exactly what they had planned to undertake against Israel. They wanted to destroy Israel by water, and by water were they destroyed. With sacrifices and a feast was the arrival of Jethro celebrated, for after he had made the burnt offering not far from the bush of thorns that had been unscathed by fire, Jethro prepared a feast of rejoicing for the whole people, at which Moses did not consider it below the dignity to wait on the guests in person. In this he followed the example of Abraham, who in person waited on the three angels, though they appeared in the guise of idolatrous Arabs. Abraham like Moses sought to follow in the ways of the Lord, to provide each according to his wants, and to grant to everybody what he lacks, whether he be a righteous man, or an idolater, who through his sins conjures up God's wrath. To this feast the people sat down according to their tribes. They ate, drank and were merry, while Aaron and Jethro with their relatives sang songs of thanksgiving to God, and praised him as the creator and donor of their lives and their liberty. At the same time they gave due appreciation to Moses, through whose courage everything had happily come to pass. In his words of gratitude to Moses, Jethro also gave expression to many glorious eulogies on the people of Israel, but he especially extolled Moses, who through difficulties and dangers had shown so much courage in the salvation of his friends. The Installation of Elders Jethro, who had come to Moses shortly before the revelation on Mount Sinai, stayed with the son-in-law for more than a year. In the first months, however, he had no opportunity of observing Moses in the capacity of judge, 
for Moses spent the time from the day of the revelation to the tenth day of Tishri almost entirely in heaven. Hence Jethro could not be present at a court proceeding of his before the eleventh day of Tishri, the first day after Moses' return from heaven. Jethro now perceived how Moses sat like a king upon his throne, while the people, who brought their lawsuits before him, stood around him. This so displeased him that he said to his son-in-law, Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning until even? Moses answered, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. It is not in my honor that they stand, but in honor of God, whose judgment they would know. When they are in doubt over a case of clean or unclean, or when there is a dispute between two parties, which they desire to have settled exactly according to the law, or in conformity with a the compromise, they come to me. And when the parties at dispute leave me, they part as friends and no longer enemies. I expound to the people, besides, the words of God and his decisions. On the day that Moses again took up his activity as a judge, and Jethro had for the first time the chance of observing him, came the mixed multitude with the pleas that they, like the other Israelites, wanted their share in the Egyptians' booty. Moses' method, first seen by him in practice, struck Jethro as most absurd, and he therefore said, The thing that thou doest is not good, through delicacy softening his real opinion, it is bad to it is not good. The people, he continued, will surely unbraid thee and Aaron, his two sons Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders, if thou continuest in this fashion. But if thou hearkenest now to my voice, thou wilt fare well, provided God approves of my plan. This is, that thou shalt be the vessel of the revelations of God, and shalt lay the revelations of God before the people, as often as thou receivest them, so that they may understand the exposition of the Torah, as well as its decisions. And thou shalt instruct them how to pray in the synagogues, how to tend the sick, how to bury their dead, how to render the services of friendship to one another, how to practice justice, and how, in some cases, not to insist on strict justice. But as for trying the people as a judge, thou shouldst, in accordance with thy prophetic insight, choose men that are possessed of wisdom, fear of God, modesty, hate of covetousness, love of truth, love of humanity, and a good name, and these shall devote all their time to trials, and to the study of the study of the Torah. If God approve my plan, then wilt thou and Aaron, his sons and the seventy elders, and all the people dwell in peace. This counsel of Jethro's found great favor in Moses' eyes, for he had been only too well aware of the difficulties and annoyances with which he had had to contend. The people were very disputatious, being willing to spend seventy silverlings in litigation costs for the sake of gaining one silverling, and did their utmost to lengthen their disputes at law. When on say that Moses was about to cast a decision against him, he demanded that his lawsuit be adjourned, declaring that had witnesses and other proofs, which he would bring forward on the next occasion. But they were not merely litigious and disputations, they were also spiteful, and vented their temper on Moses. If Moses went out early, they would say, Behold the son of Amram, who betakes himself early to the gathering of manna, that he may get the largest grains. If he went out late, they would say, Behold the son of Amram, he goes through the multitude, to gather in marks of hone. But if he chose a path aside from the crowd, they said, Behold the son of Amram, who makes it impossible for us to follow the simple commandment, to hone a sage. Then Moses said, If I did this you were not content, and if I did that you were not content. I can no longer bear you alone. The Eternal, your God, hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord, God of you fathers, make you a thousand times so many as ye are, and bless you, as he hath promised you. The Israelites were not content with this blessing of Moses, and said to him, O our teacher Moses, we do not desire thee to bless us, we have had much greater blessings given to us. God spoke to our father Abraham, I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thou dost limit our blessings. Moses cried, I am only a creature of flesh and blood, limited in my powers, hence is my blessing limited. I give you my blessing, but the blessing of God remains preserved for ye, 
and he will bless you unlimitedly, and multiply you as the fish of the sea and the sands on the seashore, as the star in the sky and the plants on the earth. After he had bestowed his blessing upon them, he asked them to propose capable pious men, that he might appoint them as judges and leaders over them. He said, If a man were to present himself to me as a candidate for this position of honor, I alone should not be able to decide to what tribe he belonged, and whence he came. But you know them, and hence it is advisable for you to propose them. Do not think, however, that I feel I must abide by your choice, for it depends solely upon me, whether or not I shall appoint them. The people were very eager to carry this plan of Moses into execution, and requested him to settle the matter as quickly as possible. But their motive was self-interested, for everyone among them said, Moses will now appoint about 80,000 officials. If I myself should not be among them, surely my son will be, and if not he, my grandson, and with a gift of some kind it will be an easy matter to induce such a judge to look after my interests at court. Moses, of course, was not deceived about their true sentiments. Still, he paid no further attention to them, and picked out the best men among the people, though they were not possessed of nearly all the good qualities Jethro had thought essential for judges and leaders of people. With kindly words he invited them to assume their offices, and said, Blessed are ye that are judged worthy of being leader of the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of a people whom God called his friends, his brothers, his flock, and other titles of love. He impressed upon them that they must possess much patience, and must not become impatient if the lawsuit is brought before them more than once. Heretofore, he said, you belong to yourselves, but from now you belong to the people. For you judge between every man, and his brother and his neighbor. If ye are to appoint judges, do so without respect of persons. Do not say I will appoint that man because he is a handsome man or a strong man, because he is my kinsman or because he is a linguist. Such judges will declare the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent, not through wickedness, but through ignorance. And God will reckon the appointment of such judges against you, as a perversion of justice, on account of your respect of persons. If a wealthy man and a poor man come before you to court, do not say, Why should I insult the rich man for so small a matter? I will rather give judgment in his favor, and then, outside the court, Tell him to give the poor man what he demands, as he is in the right. But do not, on the other hand, if the poor man is in the wrong, say, the rich man is obliged to assist the poor anyhow, I will now decide in favor of the poor, that in a decent way he may, without begging, obtain money from his rich fellow man. Do not, moreover, say, I fear to pronounce judgment, lest that man kill my son, burn my barn, or destroy my plants for the judgment is God's. After these admonitions, Moses instructed the new judges in legal procedure, in both civil and criminal cases, and at the same time urged the people no to deny the judges the veneration due him. For great is the importance of justice. For him who hates it, there is no remedy. But the judge who decides conscientiously is the true peacemaker, for the will of Israel, of the commonwealth, and indeed of all living creatures. Jethro rewarded. Although the installation of elders on Moses' part came to pass in accordance with the command of God, still it was Jethro upon whose advice Moses besought God to lighten his burden, and to permit him partly to transfer the leadership of the people to others. Hence he did not conceal the name of the advisor, but announced it to all the people, and immortalized him as such in the holy scriptures. For he deemed it praiseworthy to appreciate duly the merits of others. It had however, been part of God's scheme to reward Jethro for the love he bore the Torah. And for this reason did he allow it to come to pass that Moses had to have his attention called to the plan of installing the elders through his father-in-law, that the Holy Scriptures might devote a whole chapter to the plan of Jethro. This, however, is not the only reward for Jethro's piety, who, in his love for the Torah, excelled all proselytes. A miracle occurred on the very first day of his arrival in camp for manna in his honor descended at the noon hour, the hour of his arrival. And, moreover, in as great quantities as was wont to rain down for sixty myriads of Israelites. He did not have to exert himself to gather the food, for it came over his body, 
so all he had to do was to carry his hand to his mouth to partake of it. Jethro, nevertheless, did not remain with Moses, but returned to his native land. Moses, of course, tried to persuade his father-in-law to stay. He said to him, Do not think that we shall continue to move thus slowly through the desert, nay, we shall now move directly to the promised land. Only to urge Jethro to stay longer with them did Moses use the words we move, so that his father-in-law might believe that Moses too would enter the promised land, for otherwise he would hardly have allowed himself to be persuaded to join the march to Palestine. Moses continued, I do not want to mislead thee, hence I will tell thee that the land will be divided only among the twelve tribes, and that thou has no claim to possession of lands. But God bade us be kind to the proselytes, and to thee we shall be kinder than to all other proselytes. Jethro, however, was not to be persuaded by his son-in-law, considering himself in duty bound to return to his native land. For the inhabitants of his city had for many years made a habit of having him store their valuable, as none possessed their confidence in such a measure as he. If he had stayed still longer with Moses, people would have declared that he had absconded with all these things and fled to Moses to share it with him, and that would have been a blot on his fair name and that of Moses. Jethro had furthermore made many debts during the year in which he came to Moses, for, owing to the hail God had sent upon Egypt before the exodus of Israel, a great famine had arisen in Jethro's home too and he had found himself obliged to lend money for the support of the poor. If he were not now to return to his home, people would say that he had run away in order to evade his creditors, and such talk concerning a man of piety would have been desecration of the divine name. So he said to Moses, There are people who have a fatherland, but no property there. There are also property holders who have no family, but have a fatherland, and have property there as well as a family. Hence I desire to return to my fatherland, my property, and my family. But Moses would not yield so soon, and said to his father-in-law, If thou dost not accompany us as a favor, I will command thee to do so, that the Israelites might not say thou hadst been converted to our religion only in the expectation of receiving a share in the promised land, but hadst returned to thy home when thou didst discover that proselytes have no claim on property in the holy land. Through thy refusal to move with us, thou wilt give the heathens an opportunity to say that the Jews do not accept proselytes, since they did not accept even their own king's father-in-law, but allowed him to return to his own land. Thy refusal will injure the glory of God, for the heathens will keep away from the true faith. But if thou wilt wander with us, I assure thee that they seed shall share with us the temple, the Torah, and the future reward of the pious. How canst thou? Moreover, who hast seen all the miracles of God wrought for us during the march through the desert? Who wert a witness of the way in which even the Egyptians became fond of us, how canst thou now depart from us? It is a sufficient motive for thee to remain with us, in order to officiate as a member of the Sanhedrin, and teach the Torah. We, on our part, want to retain thee, only that thou mightest in difficult cases enlighten our eyes. For thou wert the man who gave us good and fair counsel, to which God himself could not refuse his assent. Jethro replied, A candle may glow in the dark, but not when the sun and the moon. Of what avail would my candle light be? I had, therefore, better return to my home city that I may make proselytes of its inhabitants, instruct them in the Torah, and lead them under the wings of the Shekinah. Amid great marks of honor, and provided with rich gifts, Jethro returned to his home, where he converted his kinsmen and his compatriots to the belief in the true God, as he had intended. The descendants of Jethro later settled in Palestine, where the fruitful land of Jericho was allotted to them as a dwelling place. After the capture of Palestine, the tribes, by mutual consent, agreed that the fertile strip of land at Jericho should fall to the share of the tribe on whose land the temple was to be erected. But when its erection was postponed for a long time, they agreed to allot this piece of land to Jethro's sons, because they, being proselytes, had no other possession in the Holy Land. 480 years did the descendants of Jethro dwell in Jericho, when, upon the erection of the temple at Jerusalem, they relinquished it to the tribe of Judah, who claimed it as an indemnity for the site of the temple. Jethro's descendants inherited his devotion to the Torah, like him dedicating their lives entirely to its study.
So long as Joshua lived, they sat at this master's feet, but when he died, they said, We left our fatherland and came here only for the sake of studying the Torah. If we were now to spend our time in cultivating the soil, when should we study the Torah? They therefore gave up their dwelling place in Jericho, and moved to the cold barren wilderness, to Jabez, who there had his house of instruction. But when they there beheld the priests, the Levites, and the noblest of the Jews, they said, How can we, proselytes, presume to sit beside these? Instead of sitting within the house of instruction, they remained at the entrance of it, where they listened to the lectures, and in this manner made further progress in the study of the Torah. They were rewarded for their piety, their prayer was heard by God, and their good deeds served as a protection to Israel. And on account of their pious actions they were called the families of the scribes, the Terathites, the Shimeathites, and the Succothites, names designating their piety and devotion to the Torah. One of the descendants of Jethro was Jonadab, son of Rechab, who, when he heard from a prophet that God would destroy the temple, bade all his children, as a toke of mourning, to drink no wine, use no oil for anointing themselves, nor cut their hair, nor dwell in houses. The Rechabites obeyed this command of their sire, and as a reward for this, God made a covenant with them that their descendants should always be members of the Sanhedrin, and teachers of Israel. The covenant with the Rechabites was even stronger than that with David, for to the house of the latter God promised to keep the covenant only if his descendants were pious, but he made an unconditional covenant with the Rechabites. God rewarded them for their devotion to him in this way, although they did not belong to the Jewish nation. From this one can gather how great would have been their reward if they had been Israelites. The time is at hand. Moses sent his father-in-law Jethro back to his home, shortly before the revelation on Mount Sinai. He thought, when God gave us a single commandment of the Torah in Egypt, the Passover, he said, there shall no stranger eat thereof. Surely Jethro may not look on when God bestows on us the whole Torah. Moses was right, God did not want Jethro to be present at the revelation. He said, Israel was in Egypt, bound to work with clay and bricks, at the same time as Jethro was sitting at home in peace and quiet. He who suffers with the community shall share their future joys, but he who does not share the sufferings of the community shall not take part in their rejoicing. God had not only good cause to delay the giving of the Torah until after the departure of Jethro, but the time he chose to bestowing it was also chosen for a good reason. Just as a female proselyte, or a woman freed from captivity, or an emancipated slave, may not enter wedlock before she has for three months lived as a free Jewess, so God also waited three months after the deliverance of Israel from the bondage in the slavery of Egypt, before his union with Israel on Mount Sinai. God furthermore treated his bride as did that king who went to the marriage ceremony only after he had overwhelmed his chosen bride with many gifts. So did Israel first receive manna, the well, and the quails, and not till then was the Torah granted them. Moses, who had received this promise when God had first appeared to him, viz, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain waited most longingly for the promised time, saying, when will this time come to pass? When the time drew near, God said to Moses, the time is at hand when I shall bring about something entirely new. This new miracle of which God spoke was the healing of all the sick among the Jews. God had wanted to give the Torah to the Jews immediately after the exodus from Egypt, but among them were found many that were lame, halt, or deaf. Wherefore God said, The Torah is without a blemish, hence would I not bestow it on a nation that has in it such as are burdened with defects. Nor do I want to wait until their children shall have grown to manhood, for I do not desire any longer to delay the delight of the Torah. For these reasons nothing was left him to do, but to heal those afflicted with disease. In the time between the exodus from Egypt and the revelation on Mount Sinai, all the blind among the Israelites regained their sight, all the halt became whole, so that the Torah might be given to a sound and healthy people. God wrought for that generation the same miracle which he will hereafter bring about in the future world, when the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongues of the dumb sing. Not only physically was this generation free from blemishes, but spiritually, 
2. It stood on a high plane, and it was the combined merits of such a people that made them worthy of their high calling. Never before or after lived a generation as worthy as this of receiving the Torah. Had there been but one missing, God would not have given them the Torah, for he layeth up wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. For one other reason did God delay the revelation of the Torah. He had intended giving them the Torah immediately after their exodus from Egypt, but at the beginning of the march through the desert, great discord reigned among them. Nor was harmony established until the new moon of the third month, when they arrived at Mount Sinai. Whereupon God said, The ways of the Torah are ways of loveliness, and all its paths are paths of peace. I will yield the Torah to a nation that dwells in peace and amity. This decision of God, now to give them the Torah, also shows how mighty is the influence of penance. For they had been sinful upon their arrival at Mount Sinai, continuing to tempt God and doubting His omnipotence. After a short time, however, they changed in spirit. And hardly had they reformed, when God found them worthy of revealing to them the Torah. The third month was chosen for the revelation because everything that is closely connected with the Torah and with Israel is triple in number. The Torah consists of three parts, the Pentateuch, the Prophets, and the Hagiographa. Similarly the Oral Law consists of Midrash, Haloka, and Haggadah. The communications between God and Israel were carried on by three, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Israel also was divided into three divisions, priests, Levites, and laymen. And they are, Furthermore, the descendants of the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God has a preference for the third it was the third of Adam's sons, Seth, who became the ancestor of humanity, and so too it was the third among Noah's sons, Shem, who attained high station. Among the Jewish kings, too, it was the third, Solomon, whom God distinguished before all others. The number three plays a particularly important part in the life of Moses. He belonged to the tribe of Levi, which is not only the third of the tribes, but has a name consisting of three letters. He himself was the third of the children of the family. His own name consists of three letters. In his infancy he had been concealed by his mother throughout three months. And in the third month of the year, after a preparation of three days, did he receive the Torah on a mountain, the name of which consists of three letters. The Gentiles refused the Torah. The mountain on which God made his revelation bears six names, it is called the desert Sin, because God there announced his commandments. It is called the desert Kaddish, because Israel was sanctified there. The desert Kadmut because the pre-existing Torah was there revealed. The desert Paran because Israel there was greatly multiplied. The desert Sinai because the hatred of God against the heathens began there, for the reason that they would not accept the Torah. And for this same reason is it called through, because the annihilation of the heathens was there decreed by God. For the wrath of God against the heathens dates from their refusal to accept the Torah offered them. Before God gave Israel the Torah, he approached every tribe and nation, and offered them the Torah, that hereafter they might have no excuse to say, had the Holy One, blessed be he, desired to give us the Torah, we should have accepted it. He went to the children of Esau and said, Will ye accept the Torah? They answered him, saying, What is written therein? He answered them, Thou shalt not kill. Then they all said, Wilt thou perchance take from us the blessing with which our father Esau was blessed? For he was blessed with the words, By thy sword shalt thou live. We do not want to accept the Torah. Thereupon he went to the children of Lot and said to them, Will ye accept the Torah? They said, What is written therein? He answered, Thou shalt not commit unchastity. They said, From unchastity do we spring. We do no want to accept the Torah. Then he went to the children of Ishmael and said to them, Do ye want to accept the Torah? They said to him, What is written therein? He answered, Thou shalt not steal. They said, Wilt thou take from us the blessing with which our father was blessed? God promised him, His hand will be against every man. We do not want to accept the thy Torah. Thence he went to all the other nations, who likewise rejected the Torah, saying, We cannot give up the law of our fathers, we do not want thy Torah, 
Give it to thy people Israel. Upon this he came to Israel and spoke to them, Will ye accept the Torah? They said to him, What is written therein? He answered, Six hundred and thirteen commandments. They said, All that the Lord has spoken will we do and be obedient. O Lord of the world! They continued, We acted in accordance with thy commandments before they were revealed to us. Jacob fulfilled the first of the Ten Commandments by bidding his sons put away strange gods that were among them. Abraham obeyed the commandment not to take the name of the Lord in vain, for he said, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God. Joseph fulfilled the commandment to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And when his brothers came to him, he had everything for their welcome prepared on Friday. Isaac observed the law to honor his father and his mother when he allowed Abraham to bind him on the altar as a sacrifice. Judah observed the commandment not to kill when he said to his brothers, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Joseph observed the law, Thou shalt not commit adultery, when he repulsed the desire of the wife of Potiphar. The other sons of Jacob observed the commandment, Thou shalt not steal, saying, How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver and gold? Abraham observed the commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness, for he was a true witness, and bore witness before all the world that thou art the Lord of all creation. It was Abraham, also, who observed the last of the Ten Commandments Thou shalt not covet, saying, I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet. The Contest of the Mountains While the nations and peoples were refusing to accept the Torah, the mountains among themselves were fighting for the honor being chosen as the spot for the revelation. One said, Upon me shall the Shekinah of God rest, and mine shall be this glory, whereupon the other mountain replied, Upon me shall the Shekinah rest, and mine shall be this glory. The mountain of Tabor said to the mountain of Hermon, Upon me shall the Shekinah rest, mine shall be this glory, for in times of old, when in the days of Noah the flood came over the earth, all the mountains that are under the heavens were covered with water, whereas it did not reach my head, nay, not even my shoulder. All the earth was sunk under water, but I, the highest of the mountains, towered high above the waters, hence I am called upon to bear the Shekinah. Mount Hermon replied to Mount Tabor, Upon me shall the Shekinah rest, I am the destined one, for when Israel wished to pass through the Red Sea, it was I who enabled them to do so for I settled down between the two shores of the sea, and they moved from one side to the other, through my aid, so that not even their clothes became wet. Mount Carmel was quite silent, but settled down on the shore of the sea, thinking, if the Shekinah is to repose on the sea, it will rest upon me, and if it is to repose on the mainland, it will rest upon me. Then a voice out of the high heavens rang out and said, The Shekinah shall not rest upon these high mountains that are so proud, for it is not God's will that the Shekinah should rest upon high mountains that quarrel among themselves and look upon one another with disdain. He prefers the low mountains, and Sinai among these, because it is the smallest and most insignificant of all. Upon it will he let the Shekinah rest. The other mountains hereupon said to God, Is it possible that thou art partial, and wilt give us no reward for our good intention? God replied, because ye have striven in my honor will I reward ye. Upon Tabor will I grant aid to Israel at the time of Deborah, and upon Carmel will I give aid to Elijah. Mount Sinai was given the preference not for its humility alone, but also because upon it there had been no worshipping of idols. Whereas the other mountains, owing to their height, had been employed as sanctuaries by the idolaters. Mount Sinai has a further significance, too for it had been originally a part of Mount Moriah, on which Isaac was to have been sacrificed. But Sinai separated itself from it, and came to the desert. Then God said, Because their father Isaac lay upon this mountain, bound as a sacrifice, it is fitting that upon it his children receive the Torah. Hence God now chose this mountain for a brief stay during the revelation, for after the Torah had been bestowed, he withdrew again to heaven. In the future world, Sinai will return to its original place, Mount Moriah, when the mountain of the Lord's houses shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills. Just as Sinai was chosen as the spot for the revelation owing to its humility, so likewise was Moses when God said to Moses, Go, 
deliver Israel, he in his great humility, said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? There are nobler and wealthier than I. But God replied, Thou art a great man, thee have I chosen out of all Israel. Of thee shall the prophet of the future say, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted on chosen out of the people. Moses in his humility, however, still stood apart and would not accept the office offered him, until God said to him, Why dost thou stand apart? If they are not to be delivered by thee, by none other will they be delivered. When, likewise, at God's command Moses had erected the tabernacle, he did not enter it, out of great humility, until God said to him, Why dost thou stand outside? Thou art worthy to serve me. The Torah offered to Israel. On the second day of the third month, Moses received word from God to betick himself to Mount Sinai, for without this direct summons he would not have gone there. This time, as at all times, when God desired to speak with Moses, he twice called him by name, and after he had answered, Here I am, God's revelation to him followed. When Moses had been carried to God in a cloud, which was always ready to bear him to God and to restore him to men, God said to him, Go and acquaint the women of Israel with the principles of Judaism, and try with kindly words to persuade them to accept the Torah. But expound the full contents of the Torah to the men, and with them speak solemn words concerning it. There were several reasons for his going to the women first. God said, When I created the world, I gave my commandment concerning the forbidden fruit to Adam only, and not to his wife Eve, and this omission had the effect that she tempted Adam to sin. Hence it appears advisable that the women first hear my commandments, and the men will then follow their counsel. God, furthermore, knew that women are more scrupulous in their observance of religious percepts, and hence he first addressed himself to them. Then, too, God expected the women to instruct their children in the ways of the Torah, wherefore he sent his messenger first to them. The words that Moses was to address to the women as well as to the men, to the Sanhedrin as well as to the people, were as follows, You yourselves have seen, for it is not from writings, or through tradition, or from the mouths of others that ye learn it, what I did for you in Egypt. For although they were idolaters, slayers of men, and men of lewd living, still I punished them not for these sins, but only for the wrong done to you. But ye will I carry on the wings of eagles on the day of the revelation at Sinai, and ye will I bring to me when the temple shall be erected. Since I have wrought for you so many miracles, even before you have received the Torah and observed the laws, how many more miracles will I work for you, when you will have received the Torah and observed the laws? The beginning of all things is hard, but as soon as you will have grown accustomed to obedience, all else will be easy to you. If you will now observe the Abrahamic covenant, the Sabbath, and the commandment against idolatry, then will you be my possession. For although everything belongs to me, Israel will be my especial possession, because I led them out of Egypt, and freed them from bondage. With respect to Israel, God is like one who received many fields as an heritage, but one he purchased himself, and the one he earned was dearest to his heart. I will reign alone over you, as my possession, I am none other, so long as you keep yourselves aloof from other peoples. If not, other peoples shall reign over you. But if you obey me, you shall be a nation, not only free from care, but also a nation of priests, and a holy nation. If Israel had not sent through worshipping the golden calf, there would be among them no caste of priests, the nation would have been a nation of priests, and it was only after their sin that the greater part of the people lost the right to priesthood. God now instructed Moses to transmit to the people his words without adding to them or diminishing from them, in the precise order and in the same tongue, the Hebrew. Moses hereupon betook himself to the people to deliver his message, without first seeing his family. He first addressed the word of God to the elders, for he never forgot the honor due the elders. Then, in simple and well-arranged form, he repeated it to all the people, including the women. Joyfully and of his own impulse, every Israelite declared himself willing to accept the Torah, whereupon Moses returned to God to inform him of the decision of the people. For although God, being omniscient, had no need of hearing from Moses the answer of the people, 
Still propriety demands that one who is sent on a message return to make a report of his success to him who sent him. God hereupon said to Moses, I will come to thee in a thick cloud and repeat to thee the commandments that I gave thee on Merah, so that what thou tellest them may seem to the people as important as what they hear from me. But not only in thee shall they have faith, but also in the prophets and sages that will come after thee. Moses then returned to the people once more, and explained to them the serious effects that disregard of the law would have upon them. The first time he spoke to them about the Torah, he expounded its excellencies to them, so as to induce them to accept it. But now he spoke to them of the terrible punishments they would bring upon themselves, if they did not observe the laws. The people did not, however, alter their resolution, but were full of joy and the expectation of receiving the Torah. They only wished Moses to voice to God their desire to hear him impart his words directly to them, so they said to Moses, We want to hear the words of our king from himself. They were not even content with this, but wanted to see the divine presence, for hearing is not like seeing. God granted both their wishes, and commanded Moses to tell them to prepare themselves during the next two days for receiving the Torah. Israel prepares for the revelation. Just as one who is to be admitted to Judaism must first submit to the three ceremonies of circumcision, baptism, and sacrifice, so Israel did not receive the Torah until they had performed these three ceremonies. They had already undergone circumcision in Egypt. Baptism was imposed upon them two days before the revelation on Mount Sinai. On the day preceding the revelation Moses recorded in a book the covenant between Israel and their God and on the morning of the day of the revelation, sacrifices were offered as a strengthening of the covenant. As there were no priests at that time, the service was performed by the elders of Israel, who in spite of their age performed their duty with youthful vigor. Moses erected an altar on Mount Sinai, as well as twelve memorial pillars, one for each tribe, and then bade them bring bowls, as a burnt offering and a peace offering. The blood of these animals was then separated exactly into two halves. This was attended to by the angel Michael, who guided Moses' hand, and so conducted the separation of the blood that there might be not a drop more in one half than in the other. God upon this said to Moses, Sprinkle the one half of the blood upon the people, as a token that they will not barter my glory for the idols of other peoples. And sprinkle the other half on the altar as a token that I will not exchange them for any other nation. Moses did as he was bidden, and lo! The miracle came to pass that the blood of a few animals sufficed to sprinkle every single Israelite. Before this covenant between God and Israel had been made, Moses read aloud to the people all of the Torah, that they might know exactly what they were taking upon themselves. This covenant was made a second time in the desert of Moab by Moses, and a third time by Joshua after the entrance into the Promised Land, on the mountains of Jerizim and Ebel. Although the people had now clearly expressed their desire to accept the Torah, still God hesitated to give it to them, saying, Shall I without further ado give you the Torah? Nay, bring me bondsmen, that you will observe it, and I will give you the Torah. Israel, O Lord of the world! Our fathers are bondsmen for us. God, your fathers are my debtors, and therefore not good bondsmen. Abraham said, Whereby shall I know it? And thus proved himself lacking in faith. Isaac loved Esau, whom I hated, and Jacob did not immediately upon his return from Paden Aram keep his vow that he had made upon his way there. Bring me good bondsmen and I will give you the Torah. Israel, our prophets shall be our bondsmen. God, I have claims against them for like foxes in the deserts became your prophets. Bring me good bondsmen and I will give you the Torah. Israel, we will give thee our children as bondsmen. God, well, then, these are good bondmen, on whose bond I will give you the Torah. Hereupon the Israelites brought their wives with their babes at their breasts, and their pregnant wives, and God made the bodies of the pregnant women transparent as glass, and he addressed the children in the womb with these words, Behold, I will give your fathers the Torah. Will you be surety for them that they will observe it? They answered, Yea. He furthermore said, I am your God. They answered, Yea. Ye shall have no other gods. They said, Nay. In this wise the children in the womb answered every commandment with Yea, 
and every prohibition with nay. As it was the little children upon whose bond God gave his people the Torah, it comes to pass that many little children die when Israel does not observe the Torah. The Revelation on Mount Sinai From the first day of the third month, the day on which Israel arrived at Mount Sinai, a heavy cloud rested upon them, and everyone except Moses was forbidden to ascend the mountain, yea, they durst not even stay near it, lest God smite those who pushed forward, with hail or fiery arrows. The day of the revelation announced itself as an ominous day even in the morning, for diverse rumblings sounded from Mount Sinai. Flashes of lightning, accompanied by an ever-swelling peal of horns, moved the people with mighty fear and trembling. God bent the heavens, moved the earth, and shook the bounds of the world, so that the depths trembled, and the heavens grew frightened. His splendor passed through the four portals of fire, earthquake, storm and hail. The kings of the earth trembled in their palaces, and they all came to the villain Balaam, and asked him if God intended the same fate for them as for the generation of the flood. But Balaam said to them, O ye fools! The Holy One, blessed be he, has long since promised Noah never again to punish the world with a flood. The kings of the heathen, however, were not quieted, and furthermore said, God has indeed promised never again to bring a flood upon the world but perhaps he now means to destroy it by means of fire. Balaam said, Nay, God will not destroy the world either through fire or through water. The commotion throughout nature was caused through this only, that he is not about to bestow the Torah upon his people. The Eternal will give strength unto his people. At this all the kings shouted, May the Eternal bless his people with peace, and each one, quieted in spirit, went to his house. Just as the inhabitants of the earth were alarmed at the revelation, and believed the end of all time had arrived, so too did the earth. She thought the resurrection of the dead was about to take place, and she would have to account for the blood of the slain that she had absorbed, and for the bodies of the murdered whom she covered. The earth was not calmed until she heard the first words of the Decalogue. Although phenomena were perceptible on Mount Sinai in the morning, still God did not reveal himself to the people until noon. For owing to the brevity of the summer nights, and the pleasantness of the morning sleep in summer, the people were still asleep when God had descended upon Mount Sinai. Moses betook himself to the encampment and awakened them with these words, Arise from your sleep, the bridegroom is at hand, and is waiting to lead his bride under the marriage canopy. Moses, at the head of the procession, hereupon brought the nation to its bridegroom, God, to Sinai, himself going up the mountain. He said to God, Announce thy words, thy children are ready to obey them. These words of Moses rang out near and far, for on the occasion, his voice, when he repeated the words of God to the people, had as much power as the divine voice that he heard. It was not indeed quite of their own free will that Israel declared themselves ready to accept the Torah, for when the whole nation, in two divisions, men and women, approached Sinai, God lifted up this mountain and held it over the heads of the people like a basket, saying to them, If you accept the Torah, it is well, otherwise you will find you grave under this mountain. They all burst into tears and poured out their heart in contrition before God, and then said, All that the Lord hath said, will we do, and be obedient. Hardly had they uttered these words of submission to God, when a hundred and twenty myriads of angels descended, and provided every Israelite with a crown and a girdle of glory divine gifts, which they did not lose until they worshipped the golden calf, when the angels came and took the gifts away from them. At the same time with these crowns and girdles of glory, a heavenly radiance was shed over their faces, but this also they later lost through their sins. Only Moses retained it, whose face shone so brightly, that if even today a crack were made in his tomb, the light emanating from his corpse would be so powerful that it could not but destroy all the world. After God had bestowed upon Israel these wonderful gifts, he wanted to proceed to the announcement of the Torah, but did not desire to do so while Moses was with him, that the people might not say it was Moses who had spoken out of the cloud. Hence he sought an excuse to be rid of him. He therefore said to Moses, Go down, warn the people, that they shall not press forward to see, for if even one of them were to be destroyed, the loss to me would be as great as if all creation had been destroyed. Bid Nadab and Abihu also, as well as the firstborn that are to perform priestly duties, 
beware that they do not press forward. Moses, however, desirous of remaining with God, replied, I have already warned the people and set the bounds beyond which they may not venture. God hereupon said to Moses, Go, descend and call upon Aaron to come up with thee, but let him keep behind thee, while the people do not move beyond the positions thou hadst assigned them. Hardly had Moses left the mountain, when God revealed the Torah to the people. This was the sixth revelation of God upon earth since the creation of the world. The tenth and last is to take place on the day of judgment. The heavens opened and Mount Sinai, freed from the earth, rose into the air, so that its summit towered into the heavens, while a thick cloud covered the sides of it, and touched the feet of the divine throne. Accompanying God on one side, appeared twenty-two thousand angels with crowns for the Levites, the only tribe that remained true to God while the rest worshipped the golden calf. On the second side were sixty myriads, three thousand five hundred and fifty angels, each bearing a crown of fire for each individual Israelite. Double this number of angels was on the third side, whereas on the fourth side they were simply innumerable. For God did not appear from one direction, but from all four simultaneously, which, however, did not prevent His glory from filling the heaven as well as all the earth. In spite of these innumerable hosts of angels there was no crowding on Mount Sinai, no mob, there was room for all the angels that had appeared in honor of Israel in the Torah. They had, however, at the same time received the order to destroy Israel in case they intended to reject the Torah. The First Commandment the first word of God on Sinai was Anoki, it is I. It was not a Hebrew word, but an Egyptian word that Israel first heard from God. He treated them as did that king his homecoming son, whom, returning from a long stay over sea, he addressed in the language the son had acquired in a foreign land. So God addressed Israel in Egyptian, because it was the language they spoke. At the same time Israel recognized in this word Anoki, that as was God who addressed them. For when Jacob had assembled his children around his deathbed, he warned them to be mindful of the glory of God, and confided to them the secrets that God would hereafter reveal to them with the word Anoki. He said, With the word Anoki he addressed my grandfather Abraham. With the word Anoki he addressed my father Isaac, and with the word Anoki he addressed me. Know, then, that when he will come to you, and will so address, you, it will be he, but not otherwise. When the first commandment had come out of the mouth of God thunder and lightning proceeded from his mouth, a torch was at his right, and a torch at his left, and his voice flew through the air, saying, My people, my people, house of Israel! I am the Eternal, you God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Israel heard the awful voice, they flew back in their horror twelve miles, until their souls fled from them. Upon this the Torah turned to God, saying, Lord of the world! Hast thou given me to the living, or to the dead? God said, To the living. The Torah, but they are all dead. God, for thy sake will I restore them to life. Hereupon he let fall upon them the dew that will hereafter revive the dead, and they return to life. The trembling of heaven and earth it set in upon the perception of the divine voice, alarmed Israel so greatly that they could hardly stand on their feet. God hereupon sent to every one of them two angels. On lay his hand upon the heart of each, that his soul might not depart, and on to lift the head of each, that he might behold his Maker's splendor. They beheld the glory of God as well as the otherwise invisible word when it emanated from the divine vision, and rolled forward to their ears, whereupon they perceived these words, Wilt thou accept the Torah, which contains 248 commandments? corresponding to the number of the members of their body. They answered, Yea, yea. Then the word passed from the ear to the mouth. It kissed the mouth, then rolled again to the ear again to the ear, and called to it, Wilt thou accept the Torah, which contains 365 prohibitions, corresponding to the days of the year? And when they replied, Yea, yea, again the word turned from the ear to the mouth and kissed it. After the Israelites had in this wise taken upon themselves the commandments and the prohibitions, God opened the seven heavens and the seven earths, and said, Behold, these are my witnesses that there is none like me in the heights or on earth. See that I am the only one, and that I have revealed myself in my splendor and my radiance. 
If anyone should say to you, Go, serve other gods, then say, Can one who has seen his Maker, face to face, in his splendor, in his glory and his strength, leave him and become an idolater? See, it is I that have delivered you out of the house of bondage. It is I that cleave the seas before you and led you on dry land, while I submerged you enemies in the depths. I am the God of the dry land as well as the sea, of the past as well as of the future, the God of this world as well as of the future worlds. I am the God of all nations, but only with Israel is my name allied. If they fulfill my wishes, I, the Eternal, am merciful, gracious and long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. But if you are disobedient, then will I be a stern judge. If you had not accepted the Torah, no punishment could have fallen upon you were you not to fulfill it, but now that you have accepted it, you must obey it. In order to convince Israel of the unity and uniqueness of God, he bade all nature stand still, that all might see that there is nothing beside him. When God bestowed the Torah, no bird sang, no ox lowed, the Ophanim did not fly, the Seraphim uttered not their holy, 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 the sea did not roar, no creature uttered a sound. All listened in breathless silence to the words announced by an echoless voice, I am the Lord you God. These words as well as the others, made no by God on Mount Sinai, were not heard by Israel alone, but by the inhabitants of all the earth. The divine voice divided itself into the seventy tongues of men, so that all might understand it. But whereas Israel could listen to the voice without suffering harm, the souls of the heathens almost fled from them when they heard it. When the divine voice sounded, all the dead in Sheol were revived, and betook themselves to Sinai. For the revelation took place in the presence of the living as well as of the dead, yea, even the souls of those who were not yet born were present. Every prophet, every sage, received at Sinai his share of the revelation, which in the course of history was announced by them to mankind. All heard indeed the same words, but the same voice, corresponding to the individuality of each was God's way of speaking with them. And as the same voice sounded differently to each one, so did the divine vision appear differently to each, wherefore God warned them not to ascribe the various forms to various beings, saying, Do not believe that because you have seen me in various forms, there are various gods, I am the same that appeared to you at the Red Sea as a god of war, and at Sinai as a teacher. The other commandments revealed on Sinai. After Israel had accepted the first commandment with a yea, God said, As you have now acknowledged me as you sovereign, I can now give you commands, Thou shalt not acknowledge the gods of other nations as such, for they bring no advantage to those who adore them. This thou shalt not do while I exist. I have given you my Torah in order to lend sovereignty to you, hence you must not kindle my wrath by breaking my covenant through idolatry. You shall not worship dead idols but him who kills and restores to life, and in whose hand are all living things. Do not learn the works of other nations, for their works are vanity. I, the Eternal, you God, rule over zeal and am not ruled by it. I wait until the fourth generation to visit punishment. But those who love me, or fear me, will I reward even unto the thousandth generation. When Moses heard these words, according to which God would visit upon the descendants the sins of their fathers only if the consecutive generations were one after another sinful, he cast himself upon the ground and thanked God for it. For he knew it never occurred among Israel that three consecutive generations were sinful. The third commandment read, O my people of Israel, none among you shall call the name of the Lord in vain, for he who swears falsely by the name of the Lord shall not go unpunished on the great judgment day. Swearing falsely has terrible consequences not only for the one who does it, but it endangers all the world. For when God created the world, he laid over the abyss a shard, on which is engraved the ineffable name, that the abyss may not burst forth and destroy the world. But as often as on swears falsely in God's name, the letters of the ineffable name fly away, and as there is then nothing to restrain the abyss, the waters burst forth from it to destroy the world. This would surely come to pass, if God did not send the angel E. Israel, who has charge of the seventy pencils, to engrave anew the ineffable name on the shard. God said then to Israel, If you accept my Torah and observe my laws, I will give you for all eternity a thing most precious that I have in my possession. 
and what, replied Israel, is that precious thing which thou wilt give us if we obey thy Torah? God, the future world. Israel, but even in this world should we have a foretaste of that other. God, the Sabbath will give you this foretaste. Be mindful of the Sabbath on the seventh day of the creation of the world. For when the world was created, the seventh day came before God, and said to him, All that thou has created is in couples, why not I? Whereupon God replied, The community of Israel shall be thy spouse. Of this promise that God had made to the seventy day, he reminded the people on Mount Sinai, when he gave them the fourth commandment, to keep the Sabbath holy. When the nations of the earth heard the first commandment, they said, There is no king that does not like to see himself acknowledged as sovereign, and just so does God desire his people to pledge unto him their allegiance. At the second commandment they said, No king suffers a king beside himself, nor does the God of Israel. At the third commandment they said, Is there a king that would like to have people swear false oaths by his name? At the fourth commandment they said, no king dislikes to see his birthday celebrated. But when the people heard the fifth commandment, Honor thy father and thy mother, they said, According to our laws, if a man enrolls himself as a servant of the king, he thereby disowns his parents. God, however, makes it a duty to honor father and mother. Truly, for this is honor due to him. It was with these words that the fifth commandment was emphasized, Honor thy parents to whom thou wast existence as thou honorest me. Honor the body that bore thee, and the breasts that gave thee suck, maintain thy parents, for thy parents took part in thy creation. For man owes his existence to God, to his father, and to his mother, in that he receives from each of his parents five of the parts of his body, and ten from God. The bones, the veins, the nails, the brain, and the white of the eye come from the father. The mother gives him skin, flesh, blood, hair, and the pupil of the eye. God gives him the following, breath, soul, light of countenance, sight, hearing, speech, touch, sense, insight, and understanding. When a human being honors his parents, God says, I consider it as if I had dwelled among men and they had honored me, but if people do not honor their parents, God say, it is good that I do not dwell among men, or they would have treated me superciliously, too. God not only commanded to love and fear parents as himself, but in some respects he places the honor due to parents even higher than that due him. A man is only then obliged to support the poor or to perform certain religious ceremonies, if he has the wherewithal, but it is the duty of each one even to go begging at men doors, if he cannot otherwise maintain his parents. The sixth commandment said, O my people Israel, be no slayers of men. Do not associate with murderers, and shun their companionship, that your children may not learn the craft of murder. As a penalty for deeds of murder, God will send a devastating war over mankind. There are two divisions in Sheol, an inner and an outer. In the latter are all those who were slain before their time. There they stay until the course of the time predestined them is run. And every time a murder has been committed, God says, who has slain this person and has forced me to keep him in the outer Sheol, so that I must appear unmerciful to have removed him from earth before his time. On the judgment day the slain will appear before God, and will implore him, O Lord of the world. Thou hast formed me, thou hast developed me, thou hast been gracious unto me while I was in the womb, so that I left it unharmed. Thou in thy great mercy hast provided for me. O Lord of all worlds! Grant me satisfaction from this villain that knew no pity for me. Then God's wrath will be kindled against the murderer, into Gehenna will he throw him and damn him for all eternity, while the slain will see satisfaction given him, and be glad. The seventh commandment says, O my people of Israel, be not adulterers, nor the accomplices or companions of adulterers, that your children after you may not be adulterers. Commit no unchaste deeds, with your hands, feet, eyes, or ears, for as a punishment therefore the plague will come over the world. This is the eighth commandment, Be not thief, nor the accomplice or companion of thieves, that your children may not become thieves. As a penalty for robbery and theft famine will come upon the world. God may forgive idolatry, but never theft, 
and he is always ready to listen to complaints against forgers and robbers. The Ninth Commandment reads, O my people of Israel, bear not false witness against your companions, for in punishment for this the clouds will scatter, so that there may be no rain, and famine will ensue owing to drought. God is particularly severe with a false witness because falsehood is the one quality that God did not create, but is something that men themselves produces. The content of the Tenth Commandment is, O my people Israel, covet not the possessions of your neighbors, for owing to this sin will the government take their possessions from the people, so that even the wealthiest will become poor and will have to go into exile. The Tenth Commandment is directed against a sin that sometimes leads to a trespassing of all the Ten Commandments. If a man covets his neighbor's wife and commits adultery, he neglects the First Commandment, I am the Eternal, thy God, for he commits his crime in the dark and thinks that none sees him, not even the Lord, whose eyes float over all the world, and see good as well as evil. He oversteps the Second Commandment, Thou shalt not have strange gods besides me I am a jealous God, who is wroth against faithlessness, whether toward me, or toward men. He breaks the third commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, for he swears he has not committed adultery, but he did so. He is the cause of profanation of the Sabbath, the consecration of which God commands in the fourth commandment, because in his illegal relation he generates descendants who will perform priestly duties in the temple on the Sabbath, which, being bastards, they have no right to do. The fifth commandment will be broken by the children of the adulterer, who will honor as a father a strange man, and will not even know their true father. He breaks the sixth commandment, Thou shalt not kill, if he is surprised by the rightful husband, for every time a man goes to a strange woman, he does so with the consciousness that this may lead to his death or the death of his neighbor. The trespassing of the seventh commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery, is the direct outcome of a forbidden coveting. The eighth commandment, Thou shalt not steal, is broken by the adulterer, for he steals another man's fountain of happiness. The ninth commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness, is broken by the adulterous woman who pretends that the fruit of her criminal relations is the child of her husband. In this way, the breaking of the Tenth Commandment has not only led to all the other sins, but has also the evil effect that the deceived husband leaves his whole property to one who is not his son, so that the adulterer robs him of his possessions as well as of his wife. The Unity of the Ten Commandments The Ten Commandments are so closely interwoven, that the breaking of one leads to the breaking of another. But there is a particularly strong bond of union between the first five commandments, which are written on one table, and the last five, which were on the other table. The first commandment, I am the Lord, thy God, corresponds to the sixth, thou shalt not kill, for the murderer slays the image of God. The second, thou shalt have no strange gods before me, corresponds to the seventh, thou shalt not commit adultery, for conjugal faithlessness is as grave a sin as idolatry which is faithlessness to God. The third commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, corresponds to the eighth, Thou shalt not steal, for theft leads to false oath. The fourth commandment, Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, corresponds to the ninth, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, for he who bears false witness against his neighbor commits as grave a sin as if he had borne false witness against God saying that he had not created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, the Sabbath. The fifth commandment, Honor thy father and thy mother, corresponds to the tenth, covet not thy neighbor's wife, for one who indulges this lust produces children who will not honor their true father, but will consider a stranger their father. The ten commandments, which God first revealed on Mount Sinai, correspond in their character to the ten words of which he had made use at the creation of the world. The first commandment, I am the Lord, thy God, corresponds to the first word at the creation, let there be light, for God is the eternal light. The second commandment, thou shalt have no strange gods before me, corresponds to the second word, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. For God said, choose between me and the idols. Between me, the fountain of living waters, and the idols, the stagnant waters. The third commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of thy God in vain corresponds to the word, Let the waters be gathered together, 
for as little as water can be gathered in a cracked vessel, so can a man maintain his possession which he has obtained through false oaths. The fourth commandment, remember to keep the Sabbath holy, corresponds to the word, let the earth bring forth grass, for he who truly observes the Sabbath will receive good things from God without having to labor for them, just as the earth produces grass that need not be sown. For at the creation of man it was God's intention that he be free from sin, immortal, and capable of supporting himself by the products of the soil without toil. The fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, corresponds to the word, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven, for God said to man, I gave thee two lights, thy father and thy mother, treat them with care. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, corresponds to the word, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature, for God said, Be not like the fish, among whom the great swallow the small. The seventh commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery, corresponds to the word, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, for God said, I chose for thee a spouse, abide with her. The eighth commandment, Thou shalt not steal, corresponds to the word, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, for none said God, should touch his neighbor's goods, but only that which grows free as the grass, which is the common property of all. The ninth commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, corresponds to the word, Let us make man in our image. Thou, like thy neighbor, art made in my image, hence bear not false witness against thy neighbor. The tenth commandment, Thou shalt not covet the wife of thy neighbor, corresponds to the tenth word of the creation, it is not good for man to be alone, for God said, I created thee a spouse, and let not one among ye covet his neighbor's wife. Moses chosen as intermediator. After Israel had heard the Ten Commandments, they supposed that God would on this occasion reveal to them all the rest of the Torah. But the awful vision on Mount Sinai, where they heard the visible and saw the audible, the privilege was granted them that even the slave women among them saw more than the greatest prophet of later times, this vision has so exhausted them that they would surely have perished, had they heard another word from God. They therefore went to Moses and implored him to be the intermediator between them and God. God found their wish right, so that he not only employed Moses as his intermediator, but determined in all future times to send prophets to Israel as messengers of his words. Turning to Moses, God said, All that they have spoken is good. If it were possible, I would even now dismiss the angel of death, but death against humanity has already been decreed by me, hence it must remain go, say unto them, Return to your tents, but stay thou with me. In these words God indicated to Israel that they might again enter upon conjugal relations, from which they has abstained throughout three days, while Moses should forever have to deny himself all earthly indulgences. Moses in his great wisdom now knew how, in a few words, to calm the great excitement of the myriads of men, saying to them, God gave you the Torah and wrought marvels for you, in order, through this and through the observances of the laws which he imposed upon you, to distinguish you before all other nations on earth. Consider, however, that whereas up to this time you have been ignorant, and your ignorance served as your excuse, you now know exactly what to do and what not to do. Until now you did not know that the righteous are to be rewarded and the godless to be punished in the future world, but now you know it. But as long as you will have a feeling of shame, you will not lightly commit sins. Hereupon the people withdrew twelve miles from Mount Sinai, while Moses stepped quite close before the Lord. In the immediate proximity of God are the souls of the pious, a little farther mercy and justice, and close to these was the position Moses was allowed to occupy. The vision of Moses, owing to his nearness to God, was clear and distinct, unlike that of the other prophets, who saw but dimly. He is furthermore distinguished from all the other prophets, that he was conscious of his prophetic revelations, while they were unconscious in the moments of prophecy. A third distinction of Moses, which he indeed shared with Aaron and Samuel, was that God revealed himself to him in a pillar of cloud. In spite of these great marks of favor to Moses, the people still perceive the difference between the first two commandments, which they heard directly from God, and those that they learned through Moses' intercession. For when they heard the words, I am the Eternal, thy Lord, the understanding of the Torah became deep-rooted in their hearts, 
so that they never forgot what they thus learned. But they forgot some of the things Moses taught, for as man is a being of flesh and blood, and hence ephemeral, so are his teachings ephemeral. They hereupon came to Moses, saying, Oh, if he would only reveal himself once more! Oh that once more he would kiss us with the kisses of his mouth! Oh that understanding of the Torah might remain firm in our hearts as before! Moses answered, It is no longer possible now, but it will come to pass in the future world, when he will put his law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts. Israel had another reason for regretting the choice of an intermediator between themselves and God. When they heard the second commandment, Thou shalt have no strange gods beside me, the evil impulse was torn out from their hearts. But as soon as they requested Moses to intercede for them, the evil impulse set in once more in its old place. In vain, however, did they plead with Moses to restore the former direct communication between them and God, so that the evil impulse might be taken from them. For he said, It is no longer possible now, but in the future world he will take out of your flesh the stony heart. Although Israel had now heard only the first two commandments directly from God, still the divine apparition had an enormous influence upon this generation. Never in the course of their lives was any physical impurity heard of among them, nor did any vermin succeed in infesting their bodies, and when they died, their corpses remained free from worms and insects. Moses and the angels strive for the Torah. The day on which God revealed himself on Mount Sinai was twice as long as ordinary days. For on that day the sun did not set, a miracle that was four times more repeated for Moses' sake. When this long day had drawn to its close, Moses ascended the holy mountain, where he spent a week to rid himself of all mortal impurity, so that he might be ticked himself to God into heaven. At the end of his preparations, God called him to come to him. Then a cloud appeared and lay down before him, but he knew not whether to write upon it or merely to hold fast to it. Then suddenly the mouth of the cloud flew open, and he entered into it, and walked about in the firmament as a man walks about on earth. Then he met Camuel, the porter, the angel who is in charge of twelve thousand angels of destruction, who are posted at the portals of the firmament. He spoke harshly to Moses, saying, What dost thou hear, son of Amram, on this spot, belonging to the angels of fire? Moses answered, Not of my own impulse do I come here, but with the permission of the Holy One, to receive the Torah and bear it down to Israel. As Camuel did not want to let him pass, Moses struck him and destroyed him out of the world, whereupon he went on his way until the angel Hadarniel came along. This angel is sixty myriads of parasangs taller than his fellows, and at every word that passes out of his mouth, issue twelve thousand fiery lightning flashes. When he beheld Moses he roared at him, What dost thou hear, son of Amram, here on the spot of the holy and high? When Moses heard his voice, he grew exceedingly frightened, his eyes shed tears, and soon he would have fallen from the cloud. But instantly the pity of God for Moses was awakened, and he said to Hadarniel, You angels have been quarrelsome since the day I created you. In the beginning, when I wanted to create Adam, you raised complaint before me and said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And my wrath was kindled against you and I burned scores of you with my little finger. Now again ye commence strife with the faithful one of my house, whom I have bidden to come up here to receive the Torah and carry it down to my chosen children Israel, although you know that if Israel did not receive the Torah, you would no longer be permitted to dwell in heaven. When Hadarniel heard this, he said quickly to the Lord, O Lord of the world! It is manifest and clear to thee, that I was not aware he came hither with thy permission, but since I now know it, I will be his messenger and go before him as a disciple before his master. Hadarniel hereupon, in a humble attitude, ran before Moses as a disciple before his master, until he reached the fire of Sandalphon, when he spoke to Moses, saying, Go, turn about, for I may not stay in this spot, or the fire of Sandalphon will scorch me. This angel towers above his fellows by so great height, that it would take five hundred years to cross over it. He stands behind the divine throne and binds garlands for his Lord. Sandolphin does not know the abiding spot of the Lord either, so that he might set the crown on his head, but he charms the crown, 
so that it rises of its own accord until it reposes on the head of the Lord. As soon as Sandalphon bids the crown rise, the hosts on high tremble and shake, the holy animals burst into paeans, the holy seraphim roar like lions and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. When the crown has reached the throne of glory, the wheels of the throne are instantly set in motion, the foundations of its footstool tremble, and all the heavens are seized with trembling and horror. As soon as the crown now passes the throne of glory, to settle upon its place, all the heavenly hosts open their mouths, saying, Praised be the glory of the Eternal from His place. And when the crown has reached its destination, all the holy animals, the seraphim, the wheels of the throne, and the hosts on high, the Kerubim and the Hashmalim speak with one accord, The Eternal is King, the Eternal was King, the Eternal will be King in all eternity. Now when Moses beheld Sandalphon, he was frightened, and in his alarm came near to falling out of the cloud. In tears he imploringly begged God for mercy, and was answered. In his bountiful love of Israel, he himself descended from the throne of his glory and stood before Moses, until he had passed the flames of Sandalphon. After Moses had passed Sandalphon, he ran across Rigeon, the stream of fire, the coals of which burn the angels, who dip into them every morning, are burned, and then arise anew. This stream with the coals of fire is generated beneath the throne of glory out of the perspiration of the holy Hayot, who perspire fire out of fear of God. God, however, quickly drew Moses past right Gion without his suffering any injury. As he passed on he met the angel Gelizer, also called Raziel. He it is who reveals the teachings to his Maker, and makes known in the world what is decreed by God. For he stands behind the curtains that are drawn before the throne of God and sees and hears everything. Elijah on Horeb hears that which Raziel calls down into the world, and passes his knowledge on. This angel performs other functions in heaven. He stands before the throne with outspread wings, and in this way arrests the breath of the Hayot, the heat of which would otherwise scorch all the angels. He furthermore puts the coals of Rigeon into a glowing brazier, which he holds up to kings, lords, and princes, and from which their faces receive a radiance that makes men fear them. When Moses beheld him, he trembled, but God led him past unhurt. He then came to a host of angels of terror that surround the throne of glory, and are the strongest and mightiest among the angels. These now wish to scorch Moses with their fiery breath, but God spread his radiance of splendor over Moses, and said to him, Hold on tight to the throne of my glory, and answer them. For as soon as the angels became aware of Moses in heaven, they said to God, What does he who is born of woman hear? And God's answer was as follows, He has come to receive the Torah. They furthermore said, O Lord, content thyself with the celestial beings, let them have the Torah, what wouldst thou with the dwellers of the dust? Moses hereupon answered the angels, It is written in the Torah, I am the Eternal, thy Lord that have led thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Were ye perchance enslaved in Egypt and then delivered, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is further written in the Torah, Thou shalt have no other gods. Are there perchance idolaters among ye, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, Thou shalt not utter the name of the Eternal, thy God, in vain, are there perchance business negotiations among ye? that ye are in need of the Torah to teach you the proper form of invocation? It is written, Remember to keep the Sabbath holy. Is there perchance any work among you, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, Honor thy father and thy mother. Have ye perchance parents, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, Thou shalt not kill. Are there perchance murderers among ye, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Are there perchance women among ye, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, Thou shalt not steal. Is there perchance money in heaven, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Is there perchance any false witness among ye, that ye are in need of the Torah? It is written, Covet not the house of thy neighbor. Are there perchance houses, fields, or vineyards among ye, that ye are in need of the Torah? The angels hereupon relinquished their opposition to the delivering of the Torah into the hands of Israel, 
and acknowledged that God was right to reveal it to mankind, saying, Eternal, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth! Who hast set thy glory upon the heavens? Moses now stayed forty days in heaven to learn the Torah from God. But when he started to descend and beheld the hosts of the angels of terror, angels of trembling, angels of quaking, and angels of horror, then through his fear he forgot all he had learned. For this reason God called the angel Ephephiah, the prince of the Torah, who handed over to Moses the Torah, ordered in all things and sure. All the other angels, too, became his friends, and each bestowed upon him a remedy as well as the secret of the holy names, as they are contained in the Torah, and as they are applied. Even the angel of death gave him a remedy against death. The applications of the holy names, which the angels through Ephephiah, the prince of the Torah, and Metatron, the prince of the face, taught him, Moses passed on to the high priest Eliezer, who passed them to his son Phinehas, also known as Elijah. Moses receives the Torah. When Moses reached heaven, he found God occupied ornamenting the letters in which the Torah was written, with little crown-like decorations, and he looked on without saying a word. God then said to him, In thy home, do not people know the greeting of peace? Moses, does it behoove a servant to address his master? God, thou mightest at least have wished me success in my labors. Moses hereupon said, Let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken. Then Moses inquired as the significance of the crowns upon the letter, and was answered, Hereafter there shall live a man called Akiba, son of Joseph, who will base in interpretation a gigantic mountain of Halakot upon every dot of these letters. Moses said to God, Show me this man. God, go back eighteen ranks. Moses went where he was bidden, and could hear the discussions of the teacher sitting with his disciples in the eighteenth rank, but was not able to follow these discussions, which greatly grieved him. But just then he heard the disciples questioning their master in regard to a certain subject, Whence dost thou know this? And he answered, This is a haloka given to Moses on Mount Sinai and not Moses was content. Moses returned to God and said to him, Thou has a man like Akiba, and yet dost thou give the Torah to Israel through me. But God answered, Be silent, so has it been decreed by me. Moses then said, O Lord of the world! Thou hast permitted me to behold this man's learning, let see also the reward which will be meted out to him. God said, Go, return and see. Moses saw them sell the flesh of the martyr Akiba at the meat market. He said to God, Is this the reward for such erudition? But God replied, Be silent, thus have I decreed. Moses then saw how God wrote the word long-suffering in the Torah, and asked, Does this mean that thou hast patience with the pious? But God answered, Nay, with sinners also am I long-suffering. What? exclaimed Moses, Let the sinners perish. God said no more, but when Moses implored God's mercy, begging him to forgive the sin of the people of Israel, God answered him, Thou thyself didst advise me to have no patience with sinners and to destroy them. Yea, said Moses, but thou didst declare that thou art long-suffering with sinners also, let now the patience of the Lord be great according as thou hast spoken. The forty days that Moses spent in heaven were entirely devoted to the study of the Torah, he learned the written as well as the oral teaching, yea, even the doctrines that an able scholar would some day propound were revealed to him. He took an especial delight in hearing the teachings of the Tanner Rabbi Eliezer, and received the joyful message that this great scholar would be one of his descendants. The study of Moses was so planned for the forty days, that by day God studied with him the written teachings, and by night the oral. In this way was he enabled to distinguish between night and day for in heaven the night shineth as the day. There were other signs also by which he could distinguish night from day. For if you heard the angels praise God with holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts, he knew that it was day. But if they praised him with blessed be the Lord to whom blessing is due, he knew it was night. Then, too, if he saw the sun appear before God and cast itself down before him, he knew that it was night. If, however, the moon and the stars cast themselves at his feet, he knew that it was day. He could also tell time by the occupation of the angels, for by day they prepared manna for Israel, 
and by night they sent it down to earth. The prayers he heard in heaven served him as another token whereby he might know the time, for if he heard the recitation of the Shema precede prayer, he knew that it was day, but if the prayer preceded the recitation of the Shema, then it was night. During his stay with him, God showed Moses all the seven heavens, and the celestial temple, and the four colors that he was to employ to fit up the tabernacle. Moses found it difficult to retain the color, whereupon God said to him, Turn to the right, and as he turned, he saw a host of angels in garments that had the color of the sea. This, said God, is violet. Then he bade Moses turn to the left, and there he saw angels dressed in red, and God said, This is royal purple. Moses hereupon turned around to the rear, and saw angels robed in a color that was neither purple nor violet, and God said to him, This color is crimson. Moses then turned about and saw angels robed in white, and God said to him, This is the color of twisted linen. Although Moses now devoted both night and day to the study of the Torah, he still learned nothing, for hardly had he learned something from God when he forgot it again. Moses thereupon said to God, O Lord of the world! Forty days have I devoted to studying the Torah, without having profited anything by it. God therefore bestowed the Torah upon Moses, and now he could descend to Israel, for now he remembered all that he had learned. Hardly had Moses descended from heaven with the Torah, when Satan appeared before the Lord and said, Where, forsooth, is the place where the Torah is kept? For Satan knew nothing of the revelation of God on Sinai, as God had employed him elsewhere on purposes, that he might not appear before him as an accuser, saying, Wilt thou give the Torah to a people that forty days later will worship the golden calf? In answer to Satan's question regarding the whereabouts of the Torah, God said, I gave the Torah to earth. To earth, then, Satan betook himself with his query, Where is the Torah? Earth said, God knows of its course, he knoweth its abiding place, for he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth unto the whole heaven. Satan now passed on to the sea to seek for the Torah, but the sea also says, It is not with me, and the abyss said, It is not in me. Destruction and death said, We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. Satan now returned to God and said, O Lord of the world! Everywhere have I sought the Torah, but I found it not. God replied, Go! Seek the son of Amram. Satan now hastened to Moses and asked him, Where is the Torah that God hath given thee? Whereupon Moses answered, Who am I, that the Holy One, blessed be he, should have given me the Torah? God hereupon spoke to Moses, O Moses, thou utterest a falsehood. But Moses answered, O Lord of the world! Thou hast in thy possession a hidden treasure that daily delights thee. Dare I presume to declare it my possession? Then God said, As a reward for thy humility, the Torah shall be named for thee, and it shall henceforth be known as the Torah of Moses. Moses departed from the heavens with the two tables on which the Ten Commandments were engraved, and just the words of it are by nature divine, so too are the tables on which they are engraved. These were created by God's own hand in the dusk of the first Sabbath at the close of the creation, and were made of a sapphire-like stone. On each of the two tables are the Ten Commandments, four times repeated, and in such wise were they engraved that the letters were legible on both sides, for, like the tables, the writing and the pencils for inscription, too, were of heavenly origin. Between the separate commandments were noted down all the precepts of the Torah in all their particulars, although the tables were not more than six hands in length and as much in width. It is another of the attributes of the tables, that although they are fashioned out of the hardest stone, they can still be rolled up like a scroll. When God handed the tables to Moses, he seized them by the top third, whereas Moses took hold of the bottom third, but on third remained open, and it was in this way that the divine radiance was shed upon Moses' face. The Golden Calf When God revealed himself upon Mount Sinai, all Israel sang a song of jubilation to the Lord for their faith in God was on this occasion without bounds and unexampled, except possibly at the time of the Messiah, when they likewise will cherish this firm faith. The angels, too, rejoiced with Israel, only God was downcast on this day and sent his voice out of thickest darkness, in token of his sorrow. The angels hereupon said to God, 
is not the joy that thou hast created thine? But God replied, You do not know what the future will bring. He knew that forty days later Israel would give the lie to the words of God, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and would adore the golden calf. And truly, God had sufficient cause to grow sad at this thought, for the worship of the golden calf had more disastrous consequences for Israel than any other of their sins. God had resolved to give life everlasting to the nation that would accept the Torah, hence Israel upon accepting the Torah gained supremacy over the angel of death. But they lost this power when they worshipped the golden calf. As a punishment for this, their sin, they were doomed to study the Torah in suffering and bondage, in exile and unrest, amid cares of life and burdens, until, in the messianic time and in the future world, God will compensate them for all their sufferings. But until that time there is no sorrow that falls to Israel's lot that is not in part a punishment for their worship of the golden calf. Strange as it may seem that Israel should set out to worship this idol at the very time when God was busied with the preparation of the two tables of the law, still the following circumstances are to be considered. When Moses departed from the people to hasten to God to receive the Torah, he said to them, Forty days from today I will bring you the Torah. But at noon on the fortieth day Satan came, and with a wizard's trick conjured up for the people a vision of Moses lying stretched out dead on a bier that floated midway between earth and heaven. Pointing to it with their fingers, they cried, This is the man Moses that bought us up out of the land of Egypt. Under the leadership of the magicians Jans and Jammers, they appeared before Aaron, saying, The Egyptians were wont to carry the gods about with them, to dance and play before them, that each might be able to behold his gods. And now we desire that thou shouldst make us a god such as the Egyptians had. When Hur, the son of Miriam, whom Moses during his absence had appointed joint leader of the people with Aaron, owing to his birth which placed him among the notables of highest rank, beheld this, he said to them, O ye frivolous ones, you are no longer mindful of the many miracles God wrought for you. In their wrath, the people slew this pious and noble man. And, pointing out his dead body to Aaron, they said to him threateningly, If thou wilt make us a god, it is well, if not we will dispose of thee as of him. Aaron had no fear for his life, but he thought, if Israel were to commit so terrible a sin as to slay their priest and prophet, God would never forgive them. He was willing rather to take a sin upon himself than to cast the burden of so wicked a deed upon the people. He therefore granted them their wish to make them a god but he did it in such a way that he still cherished the hope that this thing might not come to pass. Hence he demanded from them not their own ornaments for the fashioning of the idol, but the ornaments of their wives, their sons, and their daughters, thinking, if I were to tell them to bring me gold and silver, they would immediately do so, hence I will demand the earrings of their wives, their sons, and their daughters, that through their refusal to give up their ornaments, the matter might come to naught. But Aaron's assumption was only in part true. The women indeed did firmly refuse to give up their jewels for the making of a monster that is of no assistance to his worshippers. As a reward for this, God gave the new moons as holidays to women, and in the future world too they will be rewarded for their firm faith in God, in that, like the new moons, they too, may monthly be rejuvenated. But when the men saw that no gold or silver for the idol was forthcoming from the women, they drew off their own earrings that they wore in Arab fashion, and brought these to Aaron. No living calf would have shaped itself out of the gold of these earrings, if a disaster had not occurred through an oversight of Aaron. For when Moses at the exodus of Israel from Egypt set himself to lifting the coffin of Joseph out of the depths of the Nile, he employed the following means, he took four leaves of silver, and engraved on each the image of one of the beings represented at the celestial throne, dashed the lion, the man, the eagle, and the bull. He then cast on the river the leaf with the image of the lion, and the waters of the river became tumultuous, and roared like a lion. He then threw down the leaf with the image of man, and the scattered bones of Joseph united themselves into an entire body. And when he cast in the third leaf with the image of the eagle, the coffin floated up to the top. As he had no use for the fourth leaf of silver with the image of the bull, he asked a woman to store it away for him, while he was occupied with the transportation of the coffin, and later forgot to reclaim the leaf of silver. This was now among the ornaments that the people brought to Aaron, 
and it was exclusively owing to this bull's image of magical virtues, that a golden bull arose out of the fire into which Aaron put the gold and silver. When the mixed multitude that had joined Israel in their exodus from Egypt saw this idol conducting itself like a living being, they said to Israel, This is thy God, O Israel. The people then betook themselves to the seventy members of the Sanhedrin and demanded that they worship the bull that had led Israel out of Egypt. God, said they, had not delivered us out of Egypt, but only himself, who had in Egypt been in captivity. The members of the Sanhedrin remained loyal to their God, and were hence cut down by the rabble. The twelve heads of the tribes did not answer the summons of the people any more than the members of the Sanhedrin, and were therefore rewarded by being found worthy of beholding the divine vision. But the people worshipped not only the golden calf, they made thirteen such idols, one each for the twelve tribes, and one for all Israel. More than this, they employed manna, which God in his kindness did not deny them even on this day, as an offering to their idols. The devotion of Israel to this worship of the bull is in part explained by the circumstance that while passing through the Red Sea, they beheld the celestial throne, and most distinctly of the four creatures about the throne, they saw the ox. It was for this reason that they hit upon the notion that the ox had helped God in the exodus from Egypt, and for this reason did they wish to worship the ox beside God. The people then wanted to erect an altar for their idol, but Aaron tried to prevent this by saying to the people, it will be more reverential to your God if I build the altar in person, for he hoped that Moses might appear in the meantime. His expectation, however, was disappointed, for on the morning of the following day, when Aaron had at length completed the altar, Moses was not yet at hand, and the people began to offer sacrifices to their idol, and to indulge in lewdness. Moses blamed for Israel's sin. When the people turned from their God, he said to Moses, who is still in heaven, Go, get thee down. For thy people, which thou broofedest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Moses, who until then had been superior to the angels, now, owing to the sins of Israel, feared them greatly. The angels, hearing that God meant to send him from his presence, wanted to kill him, and only by clinging to the throne of God, who covered him with his mantle, did he escape from the hands of the angels, that they might do him no harm. He had particularly hard struggle with the five angels of destruction, Kiev, Af, Hema, Mashhit, and Haran, whom God had sent to annihilate Israel. Moses then hastened to the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and said to them, If ye are men who are participators of the future life, stand by me in this hour, for your children are as a sheep that is led to the slaughter. The three patriarchs united their prayers with those of Moses, who said to God, Hast thou not made a vow to these three to multiply their seed as the stars, and are they now to be destroyed? In recognition of the merits of these three pious men, God called away three of the angels of destruction, leaving only two, whereupon Moses further importuned God, for the vow thou madest to Israel, take from them the angel Mashiach. And God granted his prayer. Moses continued, For the vow thou madest me, take from them also the angel Haran. God now stood by Moses, so that he was able to conquer this angel, and he thrust him down deep into the earth in a spot that is possession of the tribe of Gad, and there held him captive. So long as Moses lived this angel was held in check by him, and if he tried, even when Israel sinned, to rise out of the depths, open wide his mouth, and destroy Israel with his panting, all Moses had to do was to utter the name of God, and Haran, or as he is sometimes called, Peor was drawn once more into the depths of the earth. At Moses' death, God buried him opposite the spot where Peor is bound. For should Peor, if Israel sinned, reach the upper world and open his mouth to destroy Israel with his panting, he would, upon seeing Moses' grave, be so terror-stricken, that he would fall back into the depths once more. Moses did indeed manage the angels of destruction, but it was a more difficult matter to appease God in his wrath. He addressed Moses harshly, crying, The grievous sins of men had once caused me to go down from heaven to see their doings. Do thou likewise go down from heaven now. It is fitting that the servant be treated as his master. Do thou now go down. Only for Israel's sake have I caused this honor to fall to thy lot, but now that Israel has become disloyal to me, 
I have not for the reason thus to distinguish thee. Moses hereupon answered, O Lord of the world! Not long since didst thou say to me, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee that thou mayest bring forth my people out of Egypt. And now thou callest them my people. Nay, whether pious or sinful, they are thy people still. Moses continued, What wilt thou now do with them? God answered, I will consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. O Lord of the world! replied Moses, If the three-legged bench has no stability, how then shall the one-legged stand? Fulfill not, I implore thee, the prophecies of the Egyptian magicians, who predicted to their king that the star Ram would move as a harbinger of blood and death before the Israelites. Then he began to implore mercy for Israel, consider their readiness to accept the Torah, whereas the sons of Esau rejected it. God, but they transgressed the precepts of the Torah. One day were they loyal to me, then instantly set to work to make themselves the golden calf. Moses, consider that when in thy name I came to Egypt and announced to them thy name, they at once believed in me, and bowed down their heads and worshipped thee. God, but they now bow down their heads before their idol. Moses, consider that they sent thee their young men to offer thee burnt offerings. God, they now offered sacrifices to the golden calf. Moses, consider that on Sinai they acknowledge that thou art their God. God, they now acknowledge that the idol is their God. All these arguments with God did not help Moses. He even had to put up with having the blame for the golden calf laid on his shoulders. Moses, said God, when Israel was still in Egypt, I gave thee the commission to lead them out of the land, but not take with thee the mixed multitude that wanted to join them. But thou in thy clemency and humility didst persuade me to accept the penitent that do penance, and didst take with thee the mixed multitude. I did as thou didst beg me, although I knew what the consequences would be, and it is now these people, thy people, that have seduced Israel to idolatry. Moses now thought it would be useless to try to secure God's forgiveness for Israel, and was ready to give up his intercession, when God, who in reality meant to preserve Israel, but only liked to hear Moses pray, now spoke kindly to Moses to let him see that he was not quite inaccessible to his exhortations, saying, Even in Egypt did I foresee what this people would do after their deliverance. Thou for us west only the receiving of the Torah on Sinai, but I foresaw the worship of the calf as well. With these words, God let Moses perceive that the defection of Israel was no surprise to him, as he had considered it even before the exodus from Egypt. Hence Moses now gathered new courage to intercede for Israel. He said, O Lord of the world! Israel has indeed created a rival for thee in their idol, that thou art angry with them. The calf, I supposed, shall bid stars and moon to appear, while thou makest the sun to rise. Thou shalt send the dew and he will cause the wind to blow. Thou shalt send down the rain, and he shall bid the plants to grow. God, Moses, Thou art mistaken, like them, and knowest not that the idol is absolutely nothing. If so, said Moses, why art thou angry with thy people for that which is nothing? Besides, he continued, thou didst say thyself that it was chiefly my people, the mixed multitude, that was to blame for the sin, why then art thou angry with thy people? If thou art angry with them only because they have not observed the Torah, then let me vouch for the observance of it on the part of my companions, such as Aaron and his sons, Joshua and Caleb, Jerem Machir, as well as many pious men among them, and myself. But God said, I have vowed that he that sacrificeth unto any god, save unto the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed, and a vow that has once passé my lips, I cannot retract. Moses replied, O Lord of the world! Has not thou given us the law of absolution from a vow, whereby power is given to a learned man to absolve anyone from his vows? But every judge who desires to have his decisions accounted valid, must subject himself to the law, and thou who has prescribed the law of absolution from vows through a learned man, must subject thyself to this law, and through me be absolved from thy vow. Moses thereupon wrapped his robe about him, seated himself, and bade God let him absolve him from his vow, bidding him say, I repent of the evil that I had determined to bring upon my people. Moses then cried out to him, 
thou art absolved from thine oath and vow. The Punishment of the Sinners When Moses descended from Sinai, he there found his true servant Joshua, who had awaited him on the slope of the mountain throughout all the forty days during which Moses stayed in heaven, and together they repaired to the encampment. On approaching it, they heard cries of the people, and Joshua remarked to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp, but Moses replied, Is it possible that thou, Joshua, who art one day destined to be the leader of sixty myriads of people, canst not distinguish among the different kinds of dens? This is no cry of Israel conquering, nor of their defeated foe, but their adoration of an idol. When Moses had now come close enough to the camp to see what was going on there, he thought to himself, How now shall I give to them the tables and enjoin upon them the prohibition of idolatry, for the very trespassing of which, heaven will inflict capital punishment upon them. Hence, instead of delivering to them the tables, he tried to turn back, but the seventy elders pursued him and tried to wrest the tables from Moses. But his strength excelled that of the seventy others, and he kept the tables in his hands, although these were seventy c in weight. All at once, however, he saw the writing vanish from the tables, and at the same time became aware of their enormous weight. For while the celestial writing was upon them, they carried their own weight and did not burden Moses, but with the disappearance of the writing all this changes. Now all the more did Moses feel loath to give the tables without their contents to Israel, and besides he thought, if God prohibited one idolatrous Israelite from partaking of the Passover feast, how much more would he be angry if I were now to give all the Torah to an idolatrous people? Hence, without consulting God, he broke the tables. God, however, thanked Moses for breaking the tables. Hardly had Moses broken the tables, when the ocean wanted to leave its bed to flood the world. Moses now took the calf which they had made, and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strewed it upon the water, saying to the waters, What would ye upon the dry land? And the waters said, The world stands only through the observance of the Torah, but Israel has not been faithful to it. Moses hereupon said to the water All that have committed idolatry shall be yours. Are you now satisfied with these thousands? But the waters were not to be appeased by the sinners that Moses cast into them, and the ocean would not retreat to its bed until Moses made the children of Israel drink of it. The drinking of these waters was one of the forms of capital punishment that he inflicted upon the sinners. When, in answer to Moses' call, who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me, all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him, they who had not taken part in the adoration of the golden calf. Dash Moses appointed these Levites as judges, whose immediate duty it was to inflict the lawful punishment of decapitation upon all those who had been seen by witnesses to be seduced to idolatry after they had been warned not to do so. Moses gave the command as though he had been commissioned to do so by God. This was not actually so, but he did it in order to enable the judges appointed by him to punish all the guilty in the course of one day, which otherwise, owing to the procedure of Jewish jurisprudence, could not well have been possible. Those who, according to the testimony of witnesses, had been seduced to idolatry, but who could not be proven to have been warned beforehand, were not punished by temporal justice, they died of the water that Moses forced them to drink. For this water had upon them the same effect as the curse bringing water upon the adulterous woman. But those sinners, too, against whom no witnesses appeared, did not escape their fate, for upon them God sent the plague to carry them off. Moses intercedes for the people. Those who were executed by these judgments numbered three thousand, so that Moses said to God, O Lord of the world! Just and merciful art thou, and all thy deeds are deeds of integrity. Shall six hundred thousand people, not to mention all who are below twenty years of age, and all the many proselytes and slaves, perish for the sake of three thousand sinners? God could no longer withhold his mercy, and determined to forgive Israel their sins. It was only after long and fervent prayers that Moses succeeded in quite propitiating God, and hardly had he returned from heaven, when he again repaired thither to advance before God his intercession for Israel. He was ready to sacrifice himself for the sake of Israel, and as soon as punishment had been visited on the sinners, he turned to God with the words, O Lord of the world! 
I have now destroyed both the golden calf and its idolaters, what cause for ill feeling against Israel can now remain. The sins these committed came to pass because thou hadst heaped gold and silver upon them, so that the blames is not wholly theirs. Yet now, if thou wilt, forgive their sin. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou has written. These bold words of Moses were not without consequences for him, for although God thereupon replied, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my blood, still it was on account of this that his name was omitted from one section of the Pentateuch. But for Israel his words created an instant revulsion of feeling in God, who now addressed him kindly, and promised that he would send his angel, who would lead the people into the promised land. These words indicated to Moses that God was not yet entirely appeased, and he could further see this in the punishment that fell upon Israel on that day. Their weapons, which every man among them had received at the revelation on Sinai, and which had miraculous virtues, having the name of God engraved upon them, were taken from them by the angels, and their robes of purple likewise. When Moses saw from this that God's wrath was still upon Israel, and that he desired to have nothing further to do with them, he removed his tent a mile away from the camp, saying to himself, The disciple may not have intercourse with people whom the master has excommunicated. Not only the people went out o' oh, this tent whenever they sought the Lord, but the angels also, the seraphim, and the heavenly hosts repaired thither, the sun, the moon, and the other heavenly bodies, all of whom knew that God was to be found there, and that the tent of Moses was the spot where they were to appear before their Creator. God, however, was not at all pleased to see Moses keep himself aloof from the people, and said to him, According to our agreement, I was to propitiate thee every time thou wert angry with the people, and thou wert to propitiate me when my wrath was kindled against them. What is now to become of these poor people, if we be both angry with them? Return, therefore, into the camp to the people. But if thou wilt not obey, remember that Joshua is in the camp at the sanctuary, and he can well fill thy place. Moses replied, It is for thy sake that I am angry with them, and now I see that still thou canst not forsake them. I have, said God, already told thee, that I shall send an angel before them. But Moses, by no means content with this assurance, continued to importune God not to entrust Israel to an angel but to conduct and guide them in person. Forty days and forty nights, from the eighteenth day of Tammuz to the twenty-eighth day of Ab, did Moses stay in heaven, beseeching and imploring God to restore Israel once more entirely into his favor. But all his prayers and exhortations were in vain, until at the end of forty days he implored God to set the pious deeds of the three patriarchs and of the twelve sons of Jacob to the account of their descendants. And only then was his prayer answered. H said, If thou art angry with Israel because they transgress the Ten Commandments, be mindful for their sake of the ten tests to which thou didst subject Abraham, and through which he nobly passed. If Israel deserves at thy hands punishment by fire for their sin, remember the fire of the lime kiln into which Abraham let himself be cast for the glory of thy name. If Israel deserves death by sword, remember the readiness with which Isaac laid down his neck upon the altar to be sacrificed to thee. If they deserve punishment by exile, remember for their sake how their father Jacob wandered into exile from his paternal home to Haran. Moses furthermore said to God, Will the dead ever be restored to life? God in surprise retorted, Hast thou become a heretic, Moses, that thou dost doubt the resurrection? If, said Moses, the dead never awaken to life, then truly thou art right to wreak vengeance upon Israel. But if the dead are to be restored to life hereafter, what wilt thou then say to the fathers of this nation, if they ask thee what has become of the promise thou hadst made to them? I demand nothing more for Israel, Moses continued, than what thou were willing to grant Abraham when he pleaded for Sodom. Thou wert willing to let Sodom survive if there were only ten just men therein, and I am now about to enumerate to thee ten just men among the Israelites, myself, Aaron, Eliezer, Ithamar. Phinehas, Joshua, and Caleb. But that is only seven, objected God. Moses, not at all abashed, replied, But thou hast said that the dead will hereafter be restored to life, 
so count with these the three patriarchs to make the number ten complete. Moses' mention of the names of the three patriarchs was of more avail than all else, and God granted his prayer, forgave Israel their transgression, and promised to lead the people in person. The inscrutable ways oweth the Lord. Moses still cherished three other wishes, that the Shekinah might dwell with Israel, that the Shekinah might not dwell with other nations, and lastly, that he might learn to know the ways of the Lord whereby he ordained good and evil in the world, sometimes causing suffering to the just and letting the unjust enjoy happiness, whereas at other times both were happy, or both were destined to suffer. Moses laid these wishes before God in the moment of his wrath, hence God bade Moses wait until his wrath should have blown over, and then he granted him his first two wishes in full, but his third in part only. God showed him the great treasure troves in which are stored up the various rewards for the pious and the just, explaining each separated one to him in detail, in this one were the rewards of those who give alms. In that one, of those who bring up orphans. In this way he showed him the destination of each one of the treasures, until at length they came to one of gigantic size. For whom is this treasure? Asked Moses, and God answered. Out of the treasures that I have shown thee I give rewards to those who have deserved them by their deeds. But out of this treasure do I give to those who are not deserving, for I am gracious to those also who may lay no claim to my graciousness, and I am bountiful to those who are not deserving of my bounty. Moses now had to content himself with the certainty that the pious were sure of their deserts. Without, however, learning from God, how it sometimes comes to pass that evil doers, too are happy. For God merely stated that he also shows himself kind to those who do not deserve it, but without further assigning the why and the wherefore. But the reward to the pious, too, was only in part revealed to him, for he beheld the joys of paradise of which they were to partake, but not the real reward that is to follow the feast in paradise. For truly I have not seen, beside the Lord, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. By means of the following incident God showed Moses how little man is able to fathom the inscrutable ways of the Lord. When Moses was on Sinai, he saw from that station a man who betook himself to a river, stooped down to drink, lost his purse, and without noticing it went his way. Shortly after, another man came, found the money, pocketed it, and took to his heels. When the owner of the purse became aware of his loss, he returned to the river where he did not find his money, but saw a man, who came there by chance to fetch water. To him he said, Restore to me the money that a little while ago I left here, for none can have taken it if not thou. When the man declared that he had found none of the money nor seen any of it, the owner slew him. Looking with horror and amazement on this injustice on earth, Moses said to God, I beseech thee, show my thy ways. Why has this man, who is quite innocent, been slain, and why hath the true thief gone unpunished? God replied, The man who found the money and kept it merely recovered his own possession, for he who had lost the purse by the river, had formerly stolen it from him. But the one who seemed to be innocently slain is only making atonement for having at one time murdered the father of his slayer. In this way, God granted the request of Moses, to show him his ways, in part only. He let him look into the future and let him see every generation and its ages, every generation and its prophets, every generation and its expounders of the scriptures, every generation and its leaders, every generation and its pious men. But when Moses said, O Lord of the world, let me see by what law thou dost govern the world. For I see that many a just man is lucky, but many a one is not. Many a wicked man is lucky, but many a one is not. Many a rich man is happy, but many a one is not. Many a poor man is happy, but many a one is not. Then God answered, Thou canst not grasp all the principles which I apply to the government of the world, but some of them shall I impart to thee. When I see human beings who have no claim to expectations from me either for their own deeds or for those of their fathers, but who pray to me and implore me, then do I grant their prayers and give them what they require from subsistence. Although God had now granted all of his wishes, still Moses received the following answer to his prayer, I beseech thee, show me thy glory thou mayest not behold my glory, or else thou wouldst perish, 
but in consideration of my vow to grant thee all thy wishes, and in view of the fact that thou art in possession of the secret of my name, I will meet thee so far as to satisfy thy desire in part. Lift the opening of the cave, and I will bid all the angels that serve me pass in review before thee. But as soon as thou hearest the name, which I have revealed to thee, know then that I am there, and bear thyself bravely and without fear. God has a reason for not showing his glory to Moses. He said to him, When I revealed myself to thee in the burning bush, thou didst not want to look upon me. Now thou art willing, but I am not. The Thirteen Attributes of God The cave in which Moses concealed himself while God passed in review before him with his celestial retinue, was the same in which Elijah lodged when God revealed himself to him on Horeb. If there had been in it an opening even as tiny as a needle's point, both Moses and Elijah would have been consumed by the passing divine light, which was of an intensity so great that Moses, although quite shut off in the cave, nevertheless caught the reflection of it, so that from its radiance his face began to shine. Not without great danger, however, did Moses earn this distinction. For as soon as the angels heard Moses request God to show him his glory, they were greatly incensed against him and said to God, We, who serve thee night and day, may not see thy glory, and he, who is born of woman, asks to see it. In their anger they made ready to kill Moses, who would certainly have perished, had not God's hand protected him from the angels. Then God appeared in the cloud. It was the seventh time that he appeared on earth, and taking the guise of a presenter of a congregation, he said to Moses, Whenever Israel hath sinned, and calleth me by the following thirteen attributes, I will forgive them their sins. I am the Almighty God who provides for all creatures. I am the merciful one who restrains evil from humankind. I am the gracious one who helps in time of need. I am the long-suffering to the upright as well as to the wicked. I am bountiful to those whose own deed do not entitle them to lay claim to rewards. I am faithful to those who have a right to expect good from me and preserve graciousness unto the two thousandth generation. I forgive misdeeds and even atrocious actions, in forgiving those who repent. When Moses heard this, and particularly that God is long-suffering with sinners, he prayed, O oh forgive, then, Israel's sin which they committed in worshipping the golden calf. Had Moses now prayed, Forgive the sins of Israel unto the end of all time, God would have granted that too, as it was a time of mercy. But as Moses asked forgiveness for this one sin only, this one only was pardoned, and God said, I have pardoned according to thy word. The day on which God showed himself merciful to Moses and to his people, was the tenth day of Tishri, the day on which Moses was to receive the tables of the law from God for the second time, and all Israel spent it amid prayer and fasting, that the evil spirit might not again lead them astray. Their ardent tears and exhortations, joined with those of Moses, reached heaven, so that God took pity upon them and said to them, My children, I swear by my lofty name that these your tears shall be tears of rejoicing for you. That this day shall be a day of pardon, of forgiveness, and of the cancelling of sins for you, for your children, and your children's children to the end of all generations. This day was not set for the annual day of atonement, without which the world could not exist and which will continue even in the future world when all other holy days will cease to be. The Day of Atonement, however, is not only a reminiscence of the day on which God was reconciled to Israel and forgave them their sins, but it is also the day on which Israel finally received the Torah. For after Moses has spent forty days in prayer, until God finally forgave Israel their sins, he began to reproach himself for having broken the tables of the law saying Israel asked me to intercede for them before God, but who will, on account of my sin, intercede before God for my sake? Then God said to him, Grieve not for the loss of the first two tables, which contained only the Ten Commandments. The second tables that I am now ready to give thee, shall contain Halakot, Midrash, and Haggadot. At the new moon of the month Elul, Moses had the trumpet sounded throughout the camp, announcing to the people that he would once more be ticked himself to God for forty days to receive the second tables from him, so that they might be alarmed by his absence. And he stayed in heaven until the tenth day of Tishri, on which day he returned with the Torah and delivered it to Israel. The Second Tables 
whereas the first tables had been given on Mount Sinai amid great ceremonies, the presentation of the second tables took place quietly, for God said, there is nothing lovelier than quiet humility. The great ceremonies on the occasion of presenting the first tables had the evil effect of directing an evil eye toward them, so that they were finally broken. In this also were the second tables differentiated from the first, that the former were the work of God, and the latter, the work of man. God dealt with Israel like the king who took to himself to wife and drew up the marriage contract with his own hand. One day the king noticed his wife engaged in very intimate conversation with the slave. And enraged at her unworthy conduct, he turned her out of his house. Then he who had given the bride away at the wedding came before the king and said to him, O sire, dost thou not know whence thou didst take thy bride? She had been brought up among the slaves, and hence is intimate with them. The king allowed himself to be appeased, saying to the other, Take paper and let a scribe draw up a new marriage contract, and here take my authorization, signed in my own hand. Just so did Israel fare with a God when Moses offered the following excuse for their worship of the golden calf, O Lord, dost thou not know whence thou hast brought Israel, out of a land of idolaters? God replied, Thou desirest me to forgive them. Well, then, I shall do so. Now fetch me other tables on which I may write the words that were written on the first. But to reward thee for offering up thy life for their sake, I shall in the future send thee along with Elijah, that both of you together may prepare Israel for the final deliverance. Moses fetched the tables out of a diamond quarry which God pointed out to him, and the chips that fell, during the hewing, from the precious stone made a rich man of Moses, so that he now possessed all the qualifications of a prophet, wealth strength, humility, and wisdom. In regard to the last name to be had said, that God given in Moses